This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Loftus at Lee Summit, Missouri. www.voice123.com slash Michael Loftus. THE LAST OF THE MOHICANS by James Fenimore Cooper CHAPTER Twenty Three. It is unusual to find an encampment of the natives, like those of the more instructed whites, guarded by the presence of armed men. Well informed of the approach of every danger, while it is yet at a distance, the Indian generally rests secure under his knowledge of the signs of the forest, and the long and difficult paths that separate him from those he has most reason to dread. But the enemy who, by any lucky concurrence of accidents, has found means to elude the vigilance of the scouts, will seldom meet with sentinels nearer home to sound the alarm. In addition to this general usage, the tribes friendly to the French knew too well the weight of the blow that had just been struck, to apprehend any immediate danger from the hostile nations that were tributary to the crown of Britain. When Duncan and David, therefore, found themselves in the center of the children, who played the antics already mentioned, it was without the least previous intimation of their approach. But so soon as they were observed, the whole of the juvenile pack raised, by common consent, a shrill and warning whoop, and then sank, as it were, by magic, from before the sight of their visitors. The naked, tawny bodies of the crouching urchins blended so nicely at that hour with the withered herbage that at first it seemed as if the earth had, in truth, swallowed up their forms. Though when surprise permitted Duncan to bend his look more curiously about the spot, he found it everywhere met by dark, quick, and rolling eyeballs. Gathering no encouragement from this startling presage of the nature of the scrutiny he was likely to undergo from the more mature judgments of the men, there was an instant when the young soldier would have retreated. It was, however, too late to appear to hesitate. The cry of the children had drawn a dozen warriors to the door of the nearest lodge, where they stood clustered in a dark and savage group, gravely awaiting the nearer approach of those who had unexpectedly come among them. David, in some measure familiarized to the scene, led the way with a steadiness that no slight obstacle was likely to disconcert into this very building. It was the principal edifice of the village, though roughly constructed of the bark and branches of trees being the lodge in which the tribe held its councils and public meetings during their temporary residence on the borders of the English province. Duncan found it difficult to assume the necessary appearance of unconcern as he brushed the dark and powerful frames of the savages who thronged his threshold. But, conscious that his existence depended on the presence of mind, he trusted to the discretion of his companion, whose footsteps he closely followed, endeavoring, as he proceeded, to rally his thoughts for the occasion. His blood curdled when he found himself in absolute contact with such fierce and implacable enemies. But he so far mastered his feelings as to pursue his way into the center of the lodge, with an exterior that did not betray the weakness. Imitating the example of the deliberate gamut, he drew a bundle of fragrant brush from beneath a pile that filled the corner of the hut and seated himself in silence. So soon as their visitor had passed, the observant warriors fell back from the entrance and arranging themselves about him, they seemed patiently to await the moment when it might comport with the dignity of the stranger to speak. By far the greater number stood leaning, in lazy, lounging attitudes, against the upright post that supported the crazy building, while three or four of the oldest and most distinguished of the chiefs placed themselves on the earth a little more in advance. A flaring torch was burning in the place, and set its red glare from face to face and figure to figure, as it waved in the currents of air. Duncan profited by its light to read the probable character of his reception in the countenance of his hosts, but his ingenuity availed him little against the cold artifices of the people he had encountered. The chiefs in front scarce cast a glance at his person, keeping their eyes on the ground, with an air that might have been intended for respect, but which it was quite easy to construe into distrust. The men in the shadows were less reserved. Duncan soon detected their searching but stolen looks, which, in truth, scanned his person and attire inch by inch, leaving no emotion of the countenance, no gesture, 
no line of the paint, nor even the fashion of a garment unheeded and without comment. At length, one whose hair was beginning to be sprinkled with gray, but whose sinewy limbs and firm tread announced that he was still equal to the duties of manhood, advanced out of the gloom of a corner whither he had probably posted himself to make his observations unseen, and spoke. He used the language of the Wyandots or Hurons. His words were, consequently, unintelligible to Hayward, though they seemed, by the gestures that accompanied them, to be uttered more in courtesy than anger. The latter shook his head, and made a gesture indicative of his inability to reply. "'Do none of my brothers speak the French or the English?' he said in the former language, looking about him from countenance to countenance, in hopes of finding a nod of assent. Though more than one had turned, as if to catch the meaning of his words, they remained unanswered. "'I should be grieved to think,' continued Duncan, speaking slowly, and using the simplest French of which he was the master, "'to believe that none of this wise and brave nation understand the language that the Grand Monarch uses when he talks to his children. His heart would be heavy did he believe his red warriors paid him so little respect.' A long and grave pause succeeded during which no movement of a limb nor any expression of an eye betrayed the expression produced by his remark. Duncan, who knew that silence was a virtue among his hosts, gladly had recourse to the custom in order to arrange his ideas. At length the same warrior who had before addressed him replied by dryly demanding in the language of the Canadas, When our great father speaks to his people, is it with the tongue of a Huron? He knows no difference in his children, whether the color of the skin be red or black or white, returned Duncan evasively, though chiefly is he satisfied with the brave Hurons. In what manner will he speak? demanded the wary chief, when the runners count to him the scalps which five nights ago grew on the heads of the Yengeese. They were his enemies, said Duncan, shuddering involuntarily. And doubtless he will say, it is good. My Hurons are very gallant. Our Canada father does not think it. Instead of looking forward to reward his Indians, his eyes are turned backward. He sees the dead Yangees, but no Huron. What can this mean? A great chief like him has more thoughts than tongues. He looks to see that no enemies are on his trail. The canoe of a dead warrior will not float on the Horicon, returned the savage gloomily. His ears are open to the Delawares, who are not our friends, and they fill them with lies. It cannot be. See, he has bid me who am a man that knows the art of healing, to go to his children, the red Hurons of the Great Lakes, and ask if any are sick. Another silence succeeded this enunciation of the character Duncan had assumed. Every eye was simultaneously bent on his person, as if to inquire into the truth or falsehood of the declaration, with an intelligence and keenness that caused the subject of their scrutiny to tremble for the result. He was, however, relieved again by the former speaker. Do the cunning men of the Canadas paint their skins? The Huron coldly continued. We have heard them boast that their faces were pale. When an Indian chief comes among his white fathers, returned Duncan with great steadiness. He lays aside his buffalo robe to carry the shirt that is offered him. My brothers have given me paint, and I wear it. A low murmur of applause announced that the compliment of the tribe was favorably received. The elderly chief made a gesture of commendation, which was answered by most of his companions, who each threw forth a hand and uttered a brief exclamation of pleasure. Duncan began to breathe more freely, believing that the weight of his examination was past, and, as he had already prepared a simple and probable tale to support his pretended occupation, his hopes of ultimate success grew brighter. After a silence of a few moments, 
as if adjusting his thoughts in order to make a suitable answer to the declaration their guest had just given another warrior arose and placed himself in an attitude to speak while his lips were yet in the act of parting a low but fearful sound arose from the forest and was immediately succeeded by a high shrill yell that was drawn out until it equaled the longest and most plaintive howl of the wolf the sudden and terrible interruption caused duncan to start from his seat unconscious of everything but the effect produced by so frightful a cry at the same moment the warriors glided in a body from the lodge and the outer air was filled with loud shouts loud shouts that nearly drowned those awful sounds which were still ringing beneath the arches of the woods unable to command himself any longer the youth broke from the place and presently stood in the center of a disorderly throng that included nearly everything having life within the limits of the encampment men women and children the aged the infirm the active and the strong were alike abroad some exclaiming aloud others clapping their hands with a joy that seemed frantic and all expressing their savage pleasure in some expected event though astounded at first by the uproar hayward was soon enabled to find its solution by the scene that followed there yet lingered sufficient light in the heavens to exhibit those bright openings among the treetops where different paths left the clearing to enter the depths of the wilderness beneath one of them a line of warriors issued from the woods and advanced slowly toward the dwellings one in front bore a short pole on which as it afterwards appeared were suspended several human scalps the startling sounds that duncan had heard were what the whites have not inappropriately called the death hallow and each repetition of the cry was intended to announce to the tribe the fate of an enemy thus far the knowledge of hayward assisted him in the explanation and as he now knew that the interruptions were caused by the unlooked-for return of a successful war party every disagreeable sensation was quieted in inward congratulation for the opportune relief and insignificance it conferred on himself when at the distance of a few hundred feet from the lodges the newly arrived warriors halted their plaintive and terrific cry which was intended to represent equally the wailings of the dead and the triumph to the victors had entirely ceased one of their numbers now called aloud in words that were far from appalling though not more intelligible to those for whose ears they were intended than their expressive yells it would be difficult to convey a suitable idea of the savage ecstasy with which the news thus imparted was received the whole encampment in a moment became a scene of the most violent bustle and commotion the warriors drew their knives and flourishing them they arranged themselves in two lines forming a lane that extended from the war party to the lodges the squaws seized clubs axes or whatever weapon of offense first offered itself to their hands and rushed eagerly to act their part in the cruel game that was at hand even the children would not be excluded but boys little able to wield the instruments tore the tomahawks from the belts of their fathers and stole into the ranks apt imitators of the savage traits exhibited by their parents large piles of brush lay scattered about the clearing and a wary and aged squaw was occupied in firing as many as might serve to light the coming exhibition as the flame arose its power exceeded that of the parting day and assisted to render objects at the same time more distinct and more hideous the whole scene formed a striking picture whose frame was composed of the dark and tall border of pines the warriors just arrived were the most distant figures a little in advance stood two men who were apparently selected from the rest as the principal actors in what was to follow the light was not yet strong enough to render their features distinct though it was quite evident that they were governed by very different emotions while one stood erect and firm prepared to meet his fate like a hero the other bowed his head as if palsied by terror or stricken with shame the high-spirited duncan felt a powerful impulse of admiration and pity toward the former though no opportunity could afford to exhibit his generous emotions he watched his slightest movement however with eager eyes 
and as he traced the fine outline of his admirably proportioned and active frame, he endeavored to persuade himself that, if the powers of man, seconded by such noble resolution, could bear one harmless through so severe a trial, the youthful captive before him might hope for success in the hazardous race he was about to run. Insensibly, the young man drew nigher to the swarthy lines of the Hurons, and scarcely breathed. So intense became his interest in the spectacle. Just then the signal yell was given, and the momentary quiet which had preceded it was broken by a burst of cries that far exceeded any before heard. The more abject of the two victims continued motionless, but the other bounded from the place at the cry with the activity and swiftness of a deer. Instead of rushing through the hostile lines, as had been expected, he just entered the dangerous defile, and before time was given for a single blow, turned short, and leaping the heads of a row of children, he gained at once the exterior and safer side of the formidable array. The artifice was answered by a hundred voices raised in imprecations, and the whole of the excited multitude broke from their order and spread themselves about the place in wild confusion. A dozen blazing piles now shed their lurid brightness on the place, which resembled some unhallowed and supernatural arena in which malicious demons had assembled to act their bloody and lawless rites. The forms in the background looked like unearthly beings, gliding before the eye and cleaving the air with frantic and unmeaning gestures, while the savage passions of such as passed the flames were rendered fearfully distinct by the gleams that shot athwart their inflamed visages. It will easily be understood that, amid such a concourse of vindictive enemies, no breathing time was allowed the fugitive. There was a single moment when it seemed as if he would have reached the forest, but the whole body of his captors threw themselves before him and drove him back into the center of his relentless persecutors. Turning like a headed deer, he shot with the swiftness of an arrow, through a pillar of forked flame, and passing the whole multitude harmless, he appeared on the opposite side of the clearing. Here, too, he was met and turned by a few of the older and more subtle of the Hurons. Once more he tried the throng, as if seeking safety in its blindness, and then several moments succeeded, during which Duncan believed the active and courageous young stranger was lost. Nothing could be distinguished but a dark mass of human forms tossed and involved in explicable confusion. Arms, gleaming knives, and formidable clubs appeared above them, but the blows were evidently given at random. The awful effect was heightened by the piercing shrieks of the women and the fierce yells of the warriors. Now and then Duncan caught a glimpse of a light form cleaving the air in some desperate bound, and he rather hoped than believed that the captive yet retained the command of his astonishing powers of activity. Suddenly the multitude rolled backward, and approached the spot where he himself stood. The heavy body in the rear pressed upon the women and children in front, and bore them to the earth. The stranger reappeared in the confusion. Human power could not, however, much longer endure so severe a trial. Of this the captive seemed conscious. Profiting by the momentary opening, he darted from among the warriors and made a desperate, and what seemed to Duncan, a final effort to gain the wood. As if aware that no danger was to be apprehended from the young soldier, the fugitive nearly brushed his person in his flight. A tall and powerful Huron, who had husbanded his forces, pressed close upon his heels, and with an uplifted arm menaced a fatal blow. Duncan thrust forth a foot, and the shock precipitated the eager savage headlong, many feet in advance of his intended victim. Thought itself is not quicker than was the motion with which the latter profited by the advantage. He turned, gleamed like a meteor again before the eyes of Duncan, and, at the next moment, when the latter recovered his recollection and gazed around in quest of the captive, he saw him quietly leaning against a small painted post, which stood before the door of the principal lodge. Apprehensive that the part he had taken in the escape might prove fatal to himself, Duncan left the place without delay. He followed the crowd, which drew nigh the lodges, gloomy and sullen, like any other multitude that had been disappointed in an execution. Curiosity, or perhaps a better feeling, induced him to approach the stranger. He found him, standing with one arm cast about the protecting post, 
and breathing thick and hard after his exertions, but disdaining to permit a single sign of suffering to escape. His person was now protected by immemorial and sacred usage, until the tribe and council had deliberated and determined on his fate. It was not difficult, however, to foretell the result, if any presage could be drawn from the feelings of those who crowded the place. There was no term of abuse known to the Huron vocabulary that the disappointed women did not lavishly expend on the successful stranger. They flouted at his efforts and told him with bitter scoffs that his feet were better than his hands and that he merited wings while he knew not the use of an arrow or a knife. To all this the captive made no reply, but was content to preserve an attitude in which dignity was singularly blended with disdain. Exasperated as much by his composure as by his good fortune, their words became unintelligible, and were succeeded by shrill, piercing yells. Just then the crafty squaw, who had taken the necessary precaution to fire the piles, made her way through the thong, and cleared a place for herself in front of the captive. The squalid and withered person of this hag might well have obtained for her the character of possessing more than human cunning. Throwing back her light vestment, she stretched forth her long skinny arm in derision, and using the language of the Lenape as more intelligible to the subject of her jibes, she commenced aloud. Look, you Delaware, she said, snapping her fingers in his face. Your nation is a race of women and the hoe is better fitted to your hands than the gun. Your squaws are the mothers of deer. But if a bear or a wild cat or a serpent were born among you, ye would flee. The Huron girls shall make you petticoats, and we will find you a husband. A burst of savage laughter succeeded this attack, during which the soft and musical merriment of the younger females strangely chimed with the cracked voice of their older and more malignant companion. But the stranger was superior to all their efforts. His head was immovable, nor did he betray the slightest consciousness that any were present, except when his haughty eye rolled toward the dusky forms of the warriors, who stalked in the background silent and sullen observers of the scene. Infuriated at the self-command of the captive, the woman placed her arms akimbo, and throwing herself into a posture of defiance, she broke out anew in a torrent of words that no art of ours could commit successfully to paper. Her breath was, however, expended in vain, for although distinguished in her nation as a proficient in the art of abuse, she was permitted to work herself into such a fury as actually to foam at the mouth, without causing a muscle to vibrate in the motionless figure of the stranger. The effect of his indifference began to extend itself to the other spectators, and a youngster, who was just quitting the condition of a boy to enter the state of manhood, attempted to assist the termagant by flourishing his tomahawk before their victim and adding his empty boast to the taunts of the women. Then, indeed, the captive turned his face toward the light and looked down on the stripling with an expression that was superior to contempt. At the next moment he resumed his quiet and reclining attitude against the post. But the change of posture had permitted Duncan to exchange glances with the firm and piercing eyes of Uncas. Breathless with amazement, and heavily oppressed with the critical situation of his friend, Hayward recoiled before the look, trembling lest its meaning might, in some unknown manner, hasten the prisoner's fate. There was not, however, any instant cause for such an apprehension. Just then a warrior forced his way into the exasperated crowd. Motioning the women and children aside with a stern gesture, he took Uncas by the arm and led him toward the door of the council lodge. Thither all the chiefs and most of the distinguished warriors followed, among whom the anxious Hayward found means to enter without attracting any dangerous attention to himself. A few minutes were consumed in disposing of those present in a manner suitable to their rank and influence in the tribe. An order very similar to that adopted in the preceding interview was observed, the aged and superior chiefs occupying the area of the spacious apartment within the powerful light of a glaring torch, while their juniors and inferiors were arranged in the background, presenting a dark outline of swarthy and marked visages. In the very center of the lodge, immediately under an opening that admitted the twinkling light of one or two stars, stood Uncas, calm, elevated, and collected. 
His high and haughty carriage was not lost on his captors, who often bent their looks on his person, with eyes which, while they lost none of their inflexibility of purpose, plainly betrayed their admiration of the stranger's daring. The case was different with the individual whom Duncan had observed to stand forth with his friend, previously to the desperate trial of speed, and who, instead of joining in the chase, had remained, throughout his turbulent uproar, like a cringing statue, expressive of shame and disgrace. Though not a hand had been extended to greet him, nor yet an eye had condescended to watch his movements, he had also entered the lodge, as though impelled by a fate to whose decrees he submitted, seemingly without a struggle. Hayward profited by the first opportunity to gaze in his face, secretly apprehensive he might find the features of another acquaintance. But they proved to be those of a stranger, and, what was still more inexplicable, of one who bore all the distinctive marks of a Huron warrior. Instead of mingling with his tribe, however, he sat apart, a solitary being in a multitude, his form shrinking into a crouching and abject attitude, as if anxious to fill as little space as possible. When each individual had taken his proper station, and silence reigned in the place, the gray-haired chief already introduced to the reader spoke aloud in the language of the Lenni Lenape. Delaware, he said, though one of a nation of women, you have proved yourself a man. I would give you food, but he who eats with the Huron should become his friend. Rest in peace till the morning sun, when our last words shall be spoken. Seven nights and as many summer days have I fasted on the trail of the Hurons, Uncas coldly replied. The children of the Lenape know how to travel the path of the just without lingering to eat. Two of my young men are in pursuit of your companion, resumed the other, without appearing to regard the boast of his captive. When they get back, then will our wise man say to you, Live or die. Has the Huron no ears? scornfully exclaimed Uncas. Twice, since he has been your prisoner, has the Delaware heard a gun that he knows. Your young men will never come back. A short and sullen pause succeeded this bold assertion. Duncan, who understood the Mohican to allude to the fatal rifle of the scout, bent forward in earnest observation of the effect it might produce on the conquerors. But the chief was content with simply retorting, if the Lenape are so skillful, why is one of their bravest warriors here? He followed in the steps of a flying coward and fell into a snare. The cunning beaver may be caught. As Uncas thus replied, he pointed with his finger toward the solitary Huron. But without deigning to bestow any other notice on so unworthy an object, the words of the answer and the air of the speaker produced a strong sensation among his auditors. Every eye rolled sullenly toward the individual indicated by the simple gesture, and a low, threatening murmur passed through the crowd. The ominous sounds reached the outer door, and the women and children pressing into the throng, no gap had been left between shoulder and shoulder that was not now filled with the dark lineaments of some eager and curious human countenance. In the meantime, the more aged chiefs in the center communed with each other in short and broken sentences. Not a word was uttered that did not convey the meaning of the speaker in the simplest and most energetic form. Again, a long and deeply solemn pause took place. It was known by all present to be the brave precursor of a weighty and important judgment. They who composed the outer circle of faces were on tiptoe to gaze, and even the culprit for an instant forgot his shame in a deeper emotion and exposed his abject features in order to cast an anxious and troubled glance at the dark assemblage of chiefs. The silence was finally broken by the aged warrior so often named. He arose from the earth, and moving past the immovable form of Uncas, placed himself in a dignified attitude before the offender. At that moment, the withered squaw already mentioned moved into the circle in a slow, sidling sort of a dance, holding the torch and muttering the indistinct words of what might have been a species of incantation. Though her presence was altogether an intrusion, it was unheeded. Approaching Uncas, she held the blazing brand in such a manner as to cast its red glare on his person and to expose the slightest emotion of his countenance. 
The Mohican maintained his firm and haughty attitude, and his eyes, so far from deigning to meet her inquisitive look, dwelt steadily on the distance, as though it penetrated the obstacles which impeded the view and looked into futurity. Satisfied with her examination, she left him, with a slight expression of pleasure, and proceeded to practice the same trying experiment on her delinquent countrymen. The young Huron was in his war-paint, and very little of a finely moulded form was concealed by his attire. The light rendered every limb and joint discernible, and Duncan turned away in horror when he saw they were writhing in irrepressible agony. The woman was commencing a low and plaintive howl at the sad and shameful spectacle when the chief put forth his hand and gently pushed her aside. "'Read that bends,' he said, addressing the young culprit by name, and in his proper language. "'Though the great spirit has made you pleasant to the eyes, it would have been better that you had not been born. Your tongue is loud in the village, but in battle it is still. None of my young men strike the tomahawk deeper into the war-post, none of them so lightly on the Yangees. The enemy know the shape of your back, but they have never seen the color of your eyes. Three times have they called on you to come, and as often did you forget to answer. Your name will never be mentioned again in your tribe. It is already forgotten. As the chief slowly uttered these words, pausing impressively between each sentence, the culprit raised his face, in deference to the other's rank and years. Shame, horror, and pride struggled in its lineaments. His eye, which was contracted with inward anguish, gleamed on the persons of those whose breath was his fame, and the latter emotion for an instant predominated. He arose to his feet, and bearing his bosom, looked steadily on the keen, glittering knife that was already upheld by his inexorable judge. As the weapon passed slowly into his heart, he even smiled, as if in joy at having found death less dreadful than he had anticipated, and fell heavily on his face at the feet of the rigid and unyielding form of Uncas. The squaw gave a loud and plaintive yell, dashed the torch to the earth, and buried everything in darkness. The whole shuddering group of spectators glided from the lodge like troubled sprites, and Duncan thought that he and the yet throbbing body of the victim of an Indian judgment had now become its only tenants. End of chapter 23This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boyer The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 24 Thus spoke the sage. The kings, without delay, dissolve the council, and their chief obey. Pope's Iliad a single moment served to convince the youth that he was mistaken. A hand was laid with a powerful pressure on his arm, and the low voice of Uncas muttered in his ear, The Hurons are dogs. The sight of a coward's blood can never make a warrior tremble. The gray head and the sagamore are safe, and the rifle Hawkeye is not asleep. Go. Uncas and the open hand are now strangers. It is enough. Hayward would have gladly have heard more, but a gentle push from his friend urged him toward the door, and admonished him of the danger that might attend the discovery of their intercourse. Slowly and reluctantly yielding to the necessity, he quitted the place, and mingled with the throng that hovered nigh. The dying fires in the clearing cast a dim and uncertain light on the dusky figures that were silently stalking to and fro and occasionally a brighter gleam than common glanced to the lodge, and exhibited the figure of Uncas, still maintaining its upright attitude near the dead body of the Huron. A knot of warriors soon entered the place again, and reissuing, they bore the senseless remains into the adjacent woods. After this termination of the scene, Duncan wandered among the lodges, unquestioned and unnoticed endeavoring to find some trace of her in whose behalf he incurred the risk he ran. In the present temper of the tribe it would have been easy to have fled and rejoined his companions, 
had such a wish crossed his mind. But, in addition to the never-ceasing anxiety on account of Alice, a fresher though feebler interest in the fate of Uncas assisted to chain him to the spot. He continued, therefore, to stray from hut to hut, looking into each only to encounter additional disappointment, until he had made the entire circuit of the village. Abandoning a species of inquiry that proved so fruitless, he retraced his steps to the council lodge, resolved to seek and question David, in order to put an end to his doubts. On reaching the building, which had proved alike the seat of judgment and the place of execution, the young man found that the excitement had already subsided. The warriors had reassembled, and were now calmly smoking, while they conversed gravely on the chief incidents of their recent expedition to the head of the Horican. Though the return of Duncan was likely to remind them of his character, and the suspicious circumstances of his visit, it produced no visible sensation. So far, the terrible scene that had just occurred proved favorable to his views, and he required no other prompter than his own feelings to convince him of the expediency of profiting by so unexpected an advantage. Without seeming to hesitate, he walked into the lodge, and took his seat with a gravity that accorded admirably with the deportment of his hosts. A hasty but searching glance sufficed to tell him that, though Uncas still remained where he had left him, David had not reappeared. No other restraint was imposed on the former than the watchful looks of a young Huron, who had placed himself at hand, though an armed warrior leaned against the post that formed one side of the narrow doorway. In every other respect the captive seemed at liberty. Still he was excluded from all participation in the discourse and possessed much more of the air of some finely moulded statue than a man having life and volition. Haywood, too, had recently witnessed a frightful instance of the prompt punishments of the people, into whose hands he had fallen to hazard an exposure by officious boldness. He would greatly have preferred silence and meditation to speech, when a discovery of his real condition might prove so instantly fatal. Unfortunately, for this prudent resolution, his entertainers appeared otherwise disposed. He had not long occupied the seat wisely taken a little in the shade, when another of the elder warriors, who spoke the French language, addressed him. "'My Canada father does not forget his children,' said the chief. "'I thank him. An evil spirit lives in the wife of one of my young men. Can the cunning stranger frighten him away?' Hayward possessed some knowledge in the mummery practiced among the Indians, in the cases of such supposed visitations. He saw, at a glance, that the circumstance might possibly be improved to further his own ends. It would therefore have been difficult, just then, to have uttered a proposal that would have given him more satisfaction. Aware of the necessity of preserving the dignity of his imaginary character, however, he repressed his feelings and answered with suitable mystery. Spirits differ. Some yield to the power of wisdom, while others are too strong. My brother is a great medicine, said the cunning savage. He will try. A gesture of assent was the answer. The Huron was content with the assurance, and resuming his pipe, he awaited the proper moment to move. The impatient Hayward, inwardly execrating the cold customs of the savages, which required such sacrifices in appearance, was fain to assume an air of difference, equal to that maintained by the chief, who was, in truth, a near relative of the afflicted woman. The minutes lingered, and the delay had seemed an hour to the adventurer in empiricism. When the Huron laid aside his pipe, and drew his robe across his breast, as if about to lead the way to the lodge of the invalid. Just then, a warrior of powerful frame darkened the door, and stalking silently among the attentive group, he seated himself on one end of the low pile of brush which sustained Duncan. The latter cast an impatient look at his neighbor, and felt his flesh creep with uncontrollable horror when he found himself in actual contact with Magua. 
the sudden return of this artful and dreadful chief caused a delay in the departure of the Huron. Several pipes that had been extinguished were lighted again, and while the newcomer, without speaking a word, drew his tomahawk from his girdle, and filling the bowl on its head, began to inhale the vapors of the weed through the hollow handle, with as much indifference as if he had not been absent two weary days on a long and toilsome hunt. Ten minutes, which appeared so many ages to Duncan, might have passed in this manner, and the warriors were fairly enveloped in a cloud of white smoke before any of them spoke. Welcome, one length uttered. Has my friend found the moose? The young men stagger under their burdens, returned Magua. Let Reed the Bins go on the hunting path. He will meet them. A deep and awful silence succeeded the utterance of the forbidden name. Each pipe dropped from the lips of its owner, as though all had inhaled an impurity at the same instant. The smoke wreathed above their heads in little eddies, and curling in a spiral form it ascended swiftly through the opening in the roof of the lodge, leaving the place beneath clear of its fumes and each dark visage distinctly visible. The looks of most of the warriors were riveted on the earth, though a few of the younger and less gifted of the party suffered their wild and glaring eyeballs to roll in the direction of a white-headed savage, who sat between two of the most venerated chiefs of the tribe. There was nothing in the air or attire of this Indian that would seem to entitle him to such a distinction. The former was rather depressed than remarkable for the bearing of the natives, and the latter was such as was commonly worn by the ordinary men of the nation. Like most around him for more than a minute, his look, too, was on the ground, but trusting his eyes at length to steal a glance aside, he perceived that he was becoming an object of general attention. Then he arose and lifted his voice in the general silence. "'It was a lie!' he said, I had no son. He who was called by that name is forgotten. His blood was pale, and it came not from the veins of a Huron. The wicked Chippewas cheated by squaw. The great spirit has said, the family of Wishintosh should end. He is happy who knows that the evil of his race dies with himself. I have done." The speaker, who was the father of the young Creant young Indian, looked round and about him, as if seeking commendation of his stoicism in the eyes of the auditors. But the stern customs of his people had made too severe an exaction of the feeble old man. The expression of his eye contradicted his figurative and boastful language, while every muscle in his wrinkled visage was working with anguish. Standing a single minute to enjoy his bitter triumph, he turned away, as if sickening at the gaze of men. And veiling his face in his blanket, he walked from the lodge with the noiseless step of an Indian seeking, in the privacy of his own abode, the sympathy of one like himself, aged, forlorn, and childless. The Indians, who believe in the hereditary transmission of virtues and defects and character, suffered him to depart in silence. Then, with an elevation of breeding that many in a more cultivated state of society might profitably emulate, one of the chiefs drew the attention of the young men from the weakness they had just witnessed, by saying in a cheerful voice, addressing himself in courtesy to Magua as the newest comer, the Delawares have been like bears after the honey-pots, prowling around my village. But who has ever found a Huron asleep? The darkness of the impending cloud which precedes a burst of thunder was not blacker than the brow of Magua, as he exclaimed, The Delawares of the lakes? Not so. They who wear the petticoats of squaws on their own river. One of them has been passing the tribe. Did my young men take his scalp? His legs were good, though his arm is better for the hoe than the tomahawk, returned the other, pointing to the immovable form of Uncas. Instead of manifesting any womanish curiosity to feast his eyes with the sight of a captive from a people he was known to have so much reason to hate, Magua continued to smoke, 
with a meditative air that he usually maintained, when there was no immediate call on his cunning or his eloquence. Although secretly amazed at the facts communicated by the speech of the aged father, he permitted himself to ask no questions, reserving his inquiries for a more suitable moment. It was only after a sufficient interval that he shook the ashes from his pipe, replaced the tomahawk, tightened his girdle, and arose, casting for the first time a glance in the direction of the prisoner, who stood a little behind him. The wary, though seemingly abstracted Uncas, caught a glimpse of the movement, and turning suddenly to the light, their looks met. Near a minute these two bold and untamed spirits stood regarding one another steadily in the eye, neither quailing in the least before the fierce gaze he encountered. The form of Uncas dilated, and his nostrils opened like those of a tiger at bay. But so rigid and unyielding was his posture, that he might easily have been converted by the imagination into an exquisite and flawless representation of the warlike deity of his tribe. The lineaments of the quivering features of Magua proved more ductile. His countenance gradually lost its character of defiance, an expression of ferocious joy, and heaving a breath from the very bottom of his chest, he pronounced aloud the formidable name of Le Cerf Agile. Each warrior sprang upon his feet at the utterance of the well-known appellation, and there was a short period during which the stoical constancy of the natives was completely conquered by surprise. The hated and yet respected name was repeated as by one voice carrying the sound even beyond the limits of the lodge. The women and children, who lingered around the entrance, took up the words in an echo, which was succeeded by another shrill and plaintive howl. The latter was not yet ended, when the sensation among the men had entirely abated. Each one in presence seated himself, as though ashamed of his precipitation, but it was many minutes before their meaning eyes ceased to roll toward their captive, in curious examination of a warrior who had so often proved his prowess on the best and proudest of their nation. Uncas enjoyed his victory, but was content with merely exhibiting his triumph by a quiet smile, an emblem of scorn which belongs to all time and every nation. Magua caught the expression, and raising his arm, he shook it at the captive, the light silver ornaments attached to his bracelet rattling with the trembling agitation of the limb. As, in a tone of vengeance, he exclaimed in English, Mohican, you die! The healing waters will never bring the dead Hurons to life, returned Uncas, in the music of the Delawares. The tumbling river washes their bones. Their men are squaws. Their women, owls. Go, call together the Huron dogs, that they may look upon a warrior. My nostrils are offended. They scent the blood of a coward. The latter allusion struck deep, and the injury rankled. Many of the Hurons understood the strange tongue in which the captive spoke, among which number was Magua. This cunning savage beheld, and instantly profited by his advantage. Dropping the light robe of skin from his shoulder, he stretched forth his arm, and commenced a burst of his dangerous and artful eloquence. However much his influence among his people had been impaired by his occasional and besetting weakness, as well as by his desertion of the tribe, his courage and his fame as an orator were undeniable. He never spoke without orators, and rarely without making converts to his opinions. On the present occasion, his native powers were stimulated by the thirst of revenge. He again recounted the events of the attack on the island at Glens, the death of his associates, and the escape of their most formidable enemies. Then he described the nature and position of the mount, whether he had led such captives as had been fallen into their hands. Of his own bloody intentions toward the maidens, and of his baffled malice he made no mention, but passed rapidly on to the surprise of the party by La Longue Carabine and his fatal termination. 
Here he paused and looked about him, in affected veneration for the departed, but in truth to note the effect of his opening narrative. As usual, every eye was riveted on his face. Each dusky figure seemed a breathing statue, so motionless was the posture, so intense the attention of the individual. Then Magua dropped his voice, which had hitherto been clear, strong, and elevated, and touched upon the merits of the dead. No quality that was likely to command the sympathy of an Indian escaped his notice. One had never been known to follow the chase in vain. Another had been undefatigable on the trail of their enemies. This was brave, that generous. In short, he so managed his illusions that in a nation which was composed of so few families, he contrived to strike every chord that might find, in its turn, some breast in which to vibrate. Are the bones of my young men, he concluded, in the burial place of the Hurons? You know they are not. Their spirits are gone toward the setting sun, and are already crossing the great waters to the happy hunting grounds. But they departed without food, without guns or knives, without moccasins, naked and poor as they were born. Shall this be? Are their souls to enter the land of the just, like hungry Iroquois, or unmanly Delawares? Or shall they meet their friends with arms in their hands and robes on their backs? What will our fathers think the tribes of the Wyandots have become? They will look on their children with a dark eye and say, Go! A Chippewa has come hither with the name of a Huron. Brothers, we must not forget the dead. A redskin never ceases to remember. We will load the back of this Mohican until he staggers under our bounty, and dispatch him after my young men. They call to us for aid, though our ears are not open. They say, Forget us not. When they see the spirit of this Mohican toiling after them with his burden, they will know we are of that mind. Then will they go on happy, and our children will say, So did our fathers to their friends, so must we do to them. What is a Yengi? We have slain many, but the earth is still pale. A stain on the name of Huron can only be hid by blood that comes from the veins of an Indian. Let this Delaware die. The effect of such a harangue, delivered in the nervous language, and with the emphatic manner of a Huron orator, could scarcely be mistaken. Magua had so artfully blended the natural sympathies with the religious superstition of his auditors, that their minds, already prepared by custom to sacrifice a victim to the manes of their countrymen, lost every visage of humanity in a wish for revenge. One warrior in particular, a man of wild and ferocious mien, had been conspicuous for the attention he had given to the words of the speaker. His countenance had changed with each passing emotion, until it settled into a look of deadly malice. As Magua ended, he arose, and uttering the yell of a demon, his polished little axe was seen glancing in the torchlight as he whirled it above his head. The motion and the cry were too sudden for words to interrupt his bloody intention. It appeared as if a bright gleam shot from his hand, which was crossed at the same moment by a dark and powerful line. The former was the tomahawk in its passage, the latter the arm that Magua darted forth to divert its aim. The quick and ready motion of the chief was not entirely too late. The keen weapon cut the war plume from the scalping tuft of Uncas, and passed through the frail wall of the lodge, as though it was whirled from some formidable engine. Duncan had seen the threatening action and sprang upon his feet, with a heart which, while it leaped into his throat, swelled with the most generous resolution in behalf of his friend. A glance told him that the blow had failed, and terror changed to admiration. Uncas stood still, looking his enemy in the eye with features that seemed superior to emotion. Marble could not be colder, calmer, or steadier, than the countenance he put upon this sudden and vindictive attack. Then, as if pitying a want of skill which had proved so fortunate to himself, he smiled, and muttered a few words of contempt in his own tongue. No, said Magua, 
after satisfying himself of the safety of the captive. The sun must shine on his shame. The squaws must see his flesh tremble, or our revenge will be like the play of boys. Go, take him where there is silence. Let us see if a Delaware can sleep at night and in the morning die. The young men whose duty it was to guard the prisoner instantly passed their ligaments of bark across his arms, and led him from the lodge, amid a profound and ominous silence. It was only as the figure of Unca stood in the opening of the door that his firm step hesitated. There he turned, and in the sweeping and haughty glance that he threw around a circle of his enemies, Duncan caught a look which he was glad to construe into an expression that he was not entirely deserted by hope. Magua was content with his success, or too much occupied with his secret purposes to push his inquiries any further. Shaking his mantle, and folding it on his bosom, he also quitted the place, without pursuing a subject which might have proved so fatal to the individual at his elbow. Notwithstanding his rising resentment, his natural firmness, and his anxiety on behalf of Uncas, Hayward felt sensibly relieved by the absence of so dangerous and so subtle a foe. The excitement produced by the speech gradually subsided. The warriors resumed their seats, and clouds of smoke once more filled the lodge. For nearly half an hour not a syllable was uttered, or scarcely a look cast aside, a grave and meditative silence being the ordinary succession to every scene of violence and commotion among these beings, who were alike so impetuous and yet so self-restrained. When the chief who had solicited the aid of Duncan finished his pipe, he made a final and successful movement toward departing. A motion of a finger was the intimation he gave to the supposed physician to follow. And passing through the clouds of smoke, Duncan was glad, on more accounts than one, to be able at last to breathe the pure air of a cool and refreshing summer evening. Instead of pursuing his way among those lodges where Hayward had already made his unsuccessful search, his companion turned aside, and proceeded directly toward the base of an adjacent mountain, which overhung the temporary village. A thicket of brush skirted its foot, and it became necessary to proceed through a crooked and narrow path. The boys had resumed their sports in the clearing, and were enacting a mimic chase to the post among themselves. In order to render their games as like the reality as possible, one of the boldest of their number had conveyed a few brands into some piles of treetops that had hitherto escaped the burning. The blaze of one of these fires lighted the way of the chief and Duncan, and gave a character of additional wildness to the rude scenery. At a little distance from a bald rock, and directly in its front, they entered a grassy opening, which they prepared to cross. Just then fresh fuel was added to the fire, and a powerful light penetrated even to that distant spot. It fell upon the white surface of the mountain, and was reflected downward upon a dark and mysterious-looking being that arose unexpectedly in their path. The Indian paused as if doubtful whether to proceed, and permitted his companion to approach his side. A large black ball which at first seemed stationary, now began to move in a manner that to the latter was inexplicable. Again the fire brightened, and its glare fell more distinctly on the object. Then even Duncan knew it, by its restless and sidling attitudes, which kept the upper part of its form in constant motion, while the animal itself appeared seated, to be a bear. Though it growled loudly and fiercely, and there were instants when its glistening eyeballs might be seen. It gave no other indications of hostility. The Huron, at least, seemed assured that the intentions of this singular intruder were peaceable, for after giving it an attentive examination, he quietly pursued his course. Duncan, who knew that the animal was often domesticated among the Indians, followed the example of his companion believing that some favorite of the tribe had found its way into the thicket in search of food. They passed it unmolested. Though obliged to come nearly in contact with a monster, the Huron, who at first so warily determined the character of his strange visitor, 
was now content with proceeding without wasting a moment in further examination. But Hayward was unable to prevent his eyes from looking backward, in solitary watchfulness against attacks in the rear. His uneasiness was in no degree diminished when he perceived the beast rolling along their path and following their footsteps. He would have spoken, but the Indian at that moment shoved aside a door of bark and entered a cavern in the bosom of the mountain. Profiting by so easily a method of retreat, Duncan stepped after him, and was gladly closing the slight cover to the opening, when he felt a draw from his hand by the beast, whose shaggy form immediately darkened the passage. They were now in a straight and long gallery, in a chasm of the rocks, where retreat without encountering the animal was impossible. Making the best of the circumstances, the young man pressed forward, keeping as close as possible to his conductor. The bear growled frequently at his heels, and once or twice its enormous paws were laid on his person, as if disposed to prevent his further passage into the den. How long the nerves of Hayward would have sustained him in this extraordinary situation, it might be difficult to decide, for happily he soon found relief. A glimmer of light had constantly been in their front, and they now arrived at the place whence it proceeded. A large cavity in the rock had been rudely fitted to answer the purposes of many apartments. The subdivisions were simple but ingenious, being composed of stone, sticks, and bark, intermingled. Openings above emitted the light by day, and at night fires and torches supplied the place of the sun. Hither the Hurons had brought most of their valuables, especially those which more particularly pertained to the nation. And hither, as it now appeared, the sick woman, who was believed to be the victim of supernatural power, had been transported also, under an impression that her tormentor would find more difficulty in making his assaults through walls of stone than through the leafy coverings of the lodges. The apartment into which Duncan, his guide, first entered, had been exclusively devoted to her accommodation. The latter approached her bedside, which was surrounded by females, in the center of whom Hayward was surprised to find his missing friend David. A single look was sufficient to apprise the pretended leech that the invalid was far beyond his powers of healing. She lay in a sort of paralysis, indifferent to the objects which crowded before her sight, and happily unconscious of suffering. Hayward was far from regretting that his mummeries were to be performed on one who was much too ill to take an interest in their failure or success. The slight qualm of conscience, which had been excited by the intended deception, was instantly appeased, and he began to collect his thoughts in order to enact his part with suitable spirit. When he found he was about to be anticipated in his skill by an attempt to prove the power of music. Gamut, who had stood prepared to pour forth his spirit and song when the visitors entered, after delaying a moment, drew a strain from his pipe, and commenced a hymn that might have worked a miracle, had faith in his efficacy been of much avail. He was allowed to proceed to the close, the Indians respecting his imaginary infirmity. He started aside at hearing them repeated behind them, in a voice half-human and half-sepulchral. Looking around, he beheld the shaggy monster seated on end in the shadow of the cavern, where, while his restless body swung in the uneasy manner of the animal, he repeated in a sort of low growl sounds, if not words, which bore some slight resemblance to the melody of the singer. The effect of so strange an echo on David might better be imagined than described. His eyes opened as if he doubted their truth and his voice became instantly mute in excess of wonder. A deep-laid scheme of communicating some important intelligence to Hayward was driven from his recollection by an emotion which very nearly resembled fear, but which he was fain to believe was admiration. Under its influence he exclaimed aloud, She expects you, and is at hand, and precipitately left the cavern. End of chapter 24
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric Wisdall, Gainesville, Florida. The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter 25 Snug, have you the lion's part written? Pray you, if it be, give it to me, for I am slow of study. Quincy, you may do it extempore, for it is nothing but roaring. Midsummer Night's Dream There was a strange blending of the ridiculous with that which was solemn in this scene. The beast still continued its rolling and apparently untiring movements though its ludicrous attempt to imitate the melody of David ceased the instant the latter abandoned the field. The words of Gamut were, as has been seen, in his native tongue, and, to Duncan, they seemed pregnant with some hidden meaning, though nothing present assisted him in discovering the object of their allusion. A speedy end was, however, put to every conjecture on the subject, by the manner of the chief who advanced to the bedside of the invalid, and— beckoned away the whole group of female attendants that had clustered there to witness the skill of the stranger. He was implicitly, though reluctantly, obeyed, and when the low echo which rang along the hollow natural gallery from the distant closing door had ceased, pointing towards his insensible daughter, he said, Now let my brother show his power. Thus, unequivocally called on to exercise the functions of his assumed character, Hayward was apprehensive that the smallest delay might prove dangerous. Endeavoring then to collect his ideas, he prepared to perform the species of incantation and those uncouth rites under which the Indian conjurers are accustomed to conceal their ignorance and impotency. It is more than probable that, in the disordered state of his thoughts, he would soon have fallen into some suspicious, if not fatal, error, had not his incipient attempts been interrupted by a fierce growl from the quadruped. Three several times did he renew his efforts to proceed, and as often was he met by the same unaccountable position. Each interruption seemed more savage and threatening than the preceding. "'The cunning ones are jealous,' said the Huron. "'I go.' Brother, the woman is the wife of one of my bravest young men. Deal justly by her. Peace, he added, beckoning to the discontented beast to be quiet. I go. The chief was as good as his word, and Duncan now found himself alone in that wild and desolate abode with the helpless invalid and the fierce and dangerous brute. The latter listened to the movements of the Indian with the air of sagacity that a bear is known to possess until another echo announced that he had also left the cavern, when it turned and came waddling up to Duncan, before whom it seated itself in its natural attitude, erect like a man. The youth looked anxiously about him for some weapon, with which he might make a resistance against the attack he knew now seriously expected. It seemed, however, as if the humor of the animal had suddenly changed, Instead of continuing its discontented growls, or manifesting any further signs of anger, the whole of its shaggy body shook violently, as if agitated by some strange internal convulsion. The huge and unwieldy talons pawed stupidly about the grinning muzzle, and while Hayward kept his eyes riveted on its movement with jealous watchfulness, the gridden head fell on one side, and in its place appeared the honest, sturdy, countenance of the scout, who was indulging from the bottom of his soul in his own peculiar expression of merriment. Hist! said the wary woodsman, interrupting Hayward's exclamation of surprise. The varlets are about the place, and any sound that are not natural to witchcraft would bring them back upon us in a body. Tell me the meaning of this masquerade, and why you have attempted so desperate an adventure. Ah, reason and calculation are often outdone by accident, returned the scout. But, as a story should always commence at the beginning, I will tell you the whole in order. After we parted, I placed the commandment and the sagamore in an old beaver lodge, 
or they are safer from the Hurons than they would be in the garrison of Edward. For your high northwest Indians, not having as yet got the traitors among them, continued to venerate the beaver, after which Uncas and I pushed for the other encampment as was agreed. Have you seen the lad? To my great grief, he is captive, and condemned to die at the rising of the sun. I had misgivings that such would be his fate, resumed the scout in a less confident and joyous tone. But soon regaining his naturally firm voice, he continued, His bad fortune is the true reason of my being here, for it would never do to abandon such a boy to the Hurons. A rare time the knaves would have of it. Could they tie the bounding elk and the long carabine, as they call me, to the same stake? Though why they have given me such a name I never knew, there being as little likeness between the gifts of Kildeer and the performance of one of your real Canada carabines, as there is between the nature of a pipestone and a flint. "'Keep to your tale,' said the impatient Hayward. "'We know not at what moment the Hurons may return. "'No fear of them. "'A conjurer must have his time like a straggling priest in the settlements. "'We are as safe from interruption as a missionary would be at the beginning of two hours' discourse. "'Well, Uncas and I fell in with a return party of the varlets. "'The lad was much too forward for a scout. "'Nay, for that matter, being of hot blood, he was not so much to blame.' and, after all, one of the Hurons proved a coward, and in fleeing led him into an ambushment. And dearly has he paid for the weakness. The scout significantly passed his hand across his own throat, and nodded as if he said, I comprehend your meaning. After which he continued in a more audible, though scarcely more intelligible language. After the loss of the boy I turned upon the Hurons, as you may judge, there have been scrimmages between one or two of their outliers and myself, but that is neither here nor there. So, after I had shot the imps, I got in pretty nigh to lodges without further commotion. Then what should luck do in my favor but lead me to the very spot where one of the most famous conjurers of the tribe was dressing himself, as I well knew for some great battle was Satan. Though why should I call that luck, which it now seems was an especial ordering of providence? So a judgmatical rap over the head stiffened the lying impostor for a time, and leaving him with a bit of walnut for his supper to prevent an uproar, and stringing him up between two saplings, I made free with his finery and took the part of the bear on myself, in order that the operations might proceed. And admirably did you enact the character. The animal itself might have been shamed by the representation. Lord Major! returned the flattered woodsman. I should be but a poor scholar for one who has studied so long in the wilderness. Did I not know how to set forth the movements of nature of such a beast? Had it been now a catamount, or even a full-sized panther, I would have embellished a performance for you worth regarding. But it is no such marvelous feat to exhibit the feats of so dull a beast. Though, for that matter, too, a bear may be overacted. Yes, yes. It is not every imitator that knows nature may be outdone easier than she is equaled. But all of our work is yet before us. Where is the gentle one? Heaven knows. I have examined every lodge in the village, without discovering the slightest trace of her presence in the tribe. You heard what the singer said, as he left us? She is at hand, and expects you. I have been compelled to believe he alluded to this unhappy woman. The simpleton was frightened and blundered through his message, but he had a deeper meaning. Here are walls enough to separate the whole settlement. A bear ought to climb. Therefore will I take a look above them. There may be honey-pots hid in these rocks, and I am a beast, you know, that has a hankering for sweets. The scout looked behind him, laughing at his own conceit, while he clambered up the partition, imitating as he went the clumsy motions of the beast he represented. But the instant the summit was gained, he made a gesture for silence, and slid down with the utmost precipitation. "'She is here,' he whispered, "'and by that door you will find her. 
I would have spoken a word of comfort to the afflicted soul, but the sight of such a monster might upset her reason. Though, for that matter, Major, you are none of the most inviting yourself in your paint. Duncan, who had already swung eagerly forward, drew instantly back on hearing these discouraging words. Am I, then, so very revolting? he demanded with an air of chagrin. You might not startle a wolf, or turn the Royal Americans from a discharge. But I have seen the time when you had a better favored look. Your street countenance are not ill-judged of by the squaws, but young women of white blood give the preference to their own color. See, he added, pointing to a place where the water trickled from a rock, forming a little crystal spring before it found an issue through the adjacent crevices. You may easily get rid of the Sagamore's daub, and when you come back I will try my hand at a new embellishment. It's as common for a conjurer to alter his paint as for a buck in the settlements to change his finery. The deliberate woodsman had little occasion to hunt for arguments to enforce his advice. He was yet speaking when Duncan availed himself of the water. In a moment every frightful or offensive mark was obliterated and the youth appeared again in the lineaments with which he had been gifted by nature. Thus prepared for an interview with his mistress, he took a hasty leave of his companion and disappeared through the indicated passage. The scout witnessed his departure with complacency, nodding his head after him and muttering his good wishes, after which he very coolly set about an examination of the state of the larder among the Hurons, the cavern, among other purposes being used as a receptacle for the fruits of their hunts. Duncan had no other guide than a distant glimmering light, which served, however, the office of a polar star to the lover. By its aid he was enabled to enter the haven of his hopes, which was merely another apartment of the cavern that had been solely ap appropriated to the safekeeping of so important a prisoner as a daughter of the commandment of William Henry. It was profusely strewed with the plunder of that unlucky fortress. In the midst of this confusion he found her he sought, pale, anxious, and terrified, but lovely. David had prepared her for such a visit. "'Duncan!' she exclaimed, in a voice that seemed to tremble at the sounds created by itself. "'Alice!' he answered leaping carelessly among trunks, boxes, arms, and furniture until he stood at her side. "'I knew that you would never desert me,' she said, looking up with a momentary glow on her otherwise dejected countenance. "'But you are alone. Grateful as it is to be thus remembered, I could wish to think you are not entirely alone.' Duncan, observing that she trembled in a manner which betrayed her inability to stand, gently induced her to be seated while he recounted those leading incidents which it has been our task to accord. Alice listened with breathless interest, and though the young man touched lightly on the sorrows of the stricken father, taking care, however, not to wound the self-love of his auditor, the tears ran as freely down the cheeks of the daughter as though she had never wept before. The soothing tenderness of Duncan, however, soon quieted the first burst of her emotions, and she then heard him to the close with undivided attention, if not with composure. And now, Alice, he added, you will see how much is still expected of you. By the assistance of our experienced and invaluable friend, the scout, we may find our way from this savage people, but you will have to exert your utmost fortitude Remember that you fly to the arms of your venerable parent, and how much his happiness, as well as your own, depends on these exertions. Can I do otherwise, for a father has done so much for me? And for me, too, continued the youth, gently pressing the hand he held in both his own. The look of innocence and surprise which he received in return convinced Duncan of the necessity of being more explicit. This is neither the place nor the occasion to detain you with selfish wishes, he added. But what heart loaded like mine would not wish to cast its burden? They say misery is the closest of all ties. 
our common suffering in your behalf left but little to be explained between your father and myself. And, dearest Cora, Duncan? Surely Cora was not forgotten? Not forgotten? No! Regretted as woman was seldom mourned before. Your venerable father knew no difference between his children. But I, Alice, you will not be offended when I say that to me her worth was in a degree obscured. Then you knew not the merit of my sister, said Alice, withdrawing her hand. Of you she ever speaks as of one who is her dearest friend. I would gladly believe her such, returned Duncan hastily. I could wish her to be even more. But with you, Alice, I have the permission of your father to aspire to a still nearer and dearer tie. Alice trembled violently, and there was an instant during which she bent her face aside, yielding to the emotions common to her sex. But they quickly passed away, leaving her mistress of her deportment, if not of her affections. Hayward, she said, looking him full in the face with a touching expression of innocence and dependency, give me the sacred presence and the holy sanction of that parent before you urge me further. Though more I should not, less I could not say. The youth was about to answer when he was interrupted by a light tap on his shoulder. Starting to his feet, he turned, and confronting the intruder, his looks fell on the dark form and malignant visage of Magua. The deep, guttural laugh of the savage sounded at such a moment to Duncan, like the hellish taunt of a demon. Had he pursued the sudden and fierce impulse of that instant, he would have cast himself on the hero and committed their fortunes to the issue of a deadly struggle. But, without arms of any description, ignorant of what succor his subtle enemy could command, and charged with the safety of one who was just then dearer than ever to his heart, he no sooner entertained than he abandoned the desperate intention. "'What is your purpose?' said Alice, meekly folding her arms on her bosom and struggling to conceal an agony of apprehension in behalf of Hayward in the usual cold and distant manner with which she received the visits of her captor. The exulting Indian had resumed his austere countenance, though he drew warily back before the menacing glance of the young man's fiery eye. He regarded both his captives for a moment with a steady look, and then, stepping aside, he dropped a log of wood across a door different from that by which Duncan had entered. The latter now comprehended the manner of his surprise, and— Believing himself irretrievably lost, he drew Alice to his bosom, and stood prepared to meet a fate which he hardly regretted, since it was to be suffered in such company. But Magua meditated no immediate violence. His first measures were very evidently taken to secure his new captive, nor did he even bestow a second glance at the motionless forms in the center of the cavern, until he had completely cut off every hope of retreat through the private outlet he had himself used. He was watched in all his movements by Hayward, who, however, remained firm, still folding the fragile form of Alice to his heart, at once too proud and too hopeless to ask favor of an enemy so often foiled. When Magua had effected his object, he approached his prisoners and said in English, The pale faces trapped the cunning beavers but the redskins know how to take the young geese. "'Huron, do your worst!' exclaimed the excited Hayward, forgetful that a double stake was involved in his life. "'You and your vengeance are alike despised.' "'Will the white man speak these words at the stake?' asked Magua, manifesting at the same time how little faith he had in the other's resolution by the sneer that accompanied his words. Here, singly to your face, or in the presence of your nation. Le Renard Subdo is a great chief, returned the enemy. He will go and bring his young men, to see how bravely a pale face can laugh at tortures. He turned away while speaking, and was about to leave the place through the avenue by which Duncan had approached, when a growl caught his ear and caused him to hesitate. The figure of the bear appeared in the door, where it sat, rolling from side to side in its customary restlessness. Magua, like the father of the sick woman, 
eyed it keenly for a moment, as if to ascertain its character. He was far above the more vulgar superstitions of his tribe, and so soon as he recognized the well-known attire of the conjurer, he prepared to pass it in a cool contempt. But a louder and more threatening growl caused him again to pause. Then he seemed as if suddenly resolved to trifle no longer, and moved resolutely forward. The mimic animal, which had advanced a little, retired slowly in front, until it arrived again at the path. When, rearing on his hind legs, it beat the air with its paws, in the manner practiced by its brutal prototype. Fool! exclaimed the chief in Huron. Go play with the children and squaws. Leave men to their wisdom. He once more endeavored to pass the supposed empiric, scorning even the parade of threatening to use the knife or tomahawk that was pendant from his belt. Suddenly the beast extended its arms, or rather legs, and enclosed him in a grass that might have vied with the far-famed power of the bear's hug itself. Hayward had watched the whole procedure on the part of Hawkeye with breathless interest. At first he relinquished his hold of Alice. Then he caught her up a thong of buckskin, which had been used around some bundle, and when he beheld his enemy with his two arms pinned to his side by the iron muscles of the scout, he rushed upon him, and effectively secured them there. Arms, legs, and feet were encircled in twenty folds of the thong, in less time than we have taken to record the circumstance. When the formidable Huron was completely pinioned, the scout released his hold, and Duncan laid his enemy on his back, utterly helpless. Throughout the whole of this sudden and extraordinary operation, Magua, though he had struggled violently, until assured he was in the hands of one whose nerves were far better strung than his own, had not uttered the slightest exclamation. But when Hawkeye, by way of making a summary explanation of his conduct, removed the shaggy jaws of the beast and exposed his own rugged and earnest countenance to the gaze of the Huron, the philosophy of the latter was so far mastered as to permit him to utter the never-failing, Hill! Ah, you found your tongue, said his undisputed conqueror. Now, in order that you shall not use it to our ruin, I must make free to stop your mouth. As there was no time to be lost, the scout immediately set about effective so necessary a precaution, and when he had gagged the Indian, his enemy might safely have been considered a uh, hors de combat. "'By what place did the imp enter?' said the industrious scout, when his work was ended. "'Not a soul passed my way since you left me.' Duncan pointed out the door by which Magua had come, and was now presented too many obstacles to a quick retreat. "'Bring on the gentle one, then,' continued his friend. "'We must make a push for the woods by our out other outlet.' "'Tis impossible,' said Duncan. "'Fear has overcome her, and she is helpless. "'Alice, my sweet, my own Alice, arouse yourself. "'Now is the moment to fly. "'Tis in vain. "'She hears, but is unable to follow.' Go, noble and worthy friend, save yourself and leave me to my fate. Every trail has its end, and every calamity brings its lessons, returned the scout. There, wrap her in them Indian clothes. Conceal all of her little form. Nay, that foot has no fellow in the wilderness. It will betray her. All, every part. Now take her in your arms and follow. Leave the rest to me. Duncan as may have been gathered from the words of his companion, was eagerly obeying, and, as the other finished speaking, he took the light person of Alice in his arms, and followed in the footsteps of the scout. They found the sick woman as they had left her, still alone, and passed swiftly on by the natural gallery to the place of entrance. As they approached the little door of bark, a murmur of voices, without announce, that the friends and relatives of the invalid were gathered about the place, patiently awaiting a summons to re-enter. "'If I open my lips to speak,' Hawkeye whispered, "'my English, which is the genuine tongue of white skin, will tell the varlets that an enemy is among them. You must give them your jargon, Major, and say we have shut the evil spirit in the cave, and are taking the woman to the woods in order to find strengthening roots. Practice all your cunning, for it is a lawful undertaking.' The door opened a little, as if one without was listening to the proceedings within, and compelled the scout to cease his directions. 
a fierce growl repelled the eavesdropper, and then the scout boldly threw open the covering of bark and left the place, enacting the character of a bear as he proceeded. Duncan kept close at his heels, and soon found himself in the center of a cluster of twenty anxious relatives and friends. The crowd fell back a little, and permitted the father, and one who appeared to be the husband of the woman, to approach. "'Has my brother driven away the evil spirit?' demanded the former. "'What has he in his arms?' "'Thy child,' returned Duncan gravely. "'The disease has gone out of her. It is shut up in the rocks. I take the woman to a distance, where I will strengthen her against any further attacks. She will be in the wigwam of the young man when the sun comes again. When the father had translated the meaning of the stranger's words into the Huron language, a suppressed murmur announced the satisfaction with which his intelligence was received. The chief himself waved his hand for Duncan to proceed, saying aloud in a firm voice and with a lofty manner, Go! I am a man, and I will enter the rock and fight the wicked one. Hayward had gladly obeyed and was already past the little group when these startling words arrested him. "'Is my brother mad?' he exclaimed. "'Is he cruel? He will meet the disease, and it will enter him. Or he will drive out the disease, and it will chase his daughter into the woods. No. Let my children wait without, and if the spirit appears, beat him down with clubs. He is cunning, and will bury himself in the mountain, when he sees how many are ready to fight him. This singular warning had the desired effect. Instead of entering the cavern, the father and husband drew their tomahawks and posted themselves in readiness to deal their vengeance on the imaginary tormentor of their sick relative, while the woman and children broke branches from the bushes, or seized fragments of the rock with a similar intention. At this favorable moment the counterfeit conjurers disappeared. Hawkeye, at the same time that he had presumed so far in the nature of the Indian superstitions, was not ignorant that they were rather tolerated than relied on by the wisest of the chiefs. He well knew that the value of time in the present emergency, whatever might be the extent of the self-delusion of his enemies, and however it had tended to assist his schemes, the slightest cause of suspicion, acting on the subtle nature of an Indian, would be likely to prove fatal. Taking the path, therefore, this was most likely to avoid observation, he rather skirted than entered the village. The warriors were still to be seen in the distance, by the fading light of the fires, stalking from lodge to lodge. But the children had abandoned their sports for the beds and skins, and the quiet of night was already beginning to prevail over the turbulence and excitement of so busy and important an evening. Alice revived under the renovating influence of the open air, and, as her physical rather than her mental powers had been the subject of weakness, she stood in no need of an, any explanation of that which had occurred. "'Now let me make an effort to walk,' she said, when they had entered the forest, blushing, though unseen, that she had not been sooner able to quit the arms of Duncan. "'I am indeed restored.' Nay, Alice, you are yet too weak. The maiden struggled gently to release herself, and Hayward was compelled to part with his precious burden. The representative of the bear had certainly been an entire stranger to the delicious emotions of the lover while his arms encircled his mistress, and he was, perhaps, a stranger also to the nature of that feeling of ingenuous shame that oppressed the trembling Alice. But when he found himself at a suitable distance from the lodge, he made a halt, and spoke on a subject of which he was thoroughly the master. "'This path will lead you to the brook,' he said. "'Follow its northern bank until you come to a fall. Mount the hill on your right, and you will see the fires of the other people. There you must go and demand protection. If they are true Delawares, you will be safe. A distant flight with that gentle one, just now, is impossible.' The Hurons would follow up our trail and master our scalps before we had got a dozen miles. Go, and Providence be with you. And you, demanded Hayward in surprise. Surely, we part not here. The Hurons hold the pride of the Delawares. The last of the high blood of the Mohicans is in their power, returned the scout. 
I go to see what can be done in his favor. Had they mastered your scalp, Major, a knave should have fallen for every hair it held, as I had promised. But if the young Sagamore is to be led to the stake, the Indians shall see also how a man without a cross can die. Not in the least offended with the decided preference that the sturdy woodsman gave to one who might, in some degree, be called the child of his adoption, Duncan still continued to urge such reasons against so desperate an effort as presented themselves. He was aided by Alice, who mingled her entreaties with those of Hayward, that he would abandon a resolution that promised so much danger, with so little hope of success. Their eloquence and ingenuity were expended in vain. The scout heard them attentively, but impatiently, and finally closed the discussion by answering in a tone that instantly silenced Alice while it told Hayward how fruitless any further remonstrances would be. "'I have heard,' he said, "'that there is a feeling in youth which binds man to a woman closer than the father is tied to the son. It may be so. I have seldom been where women of my color dwell, but such may be the gifts of nature in the settlements. You have risked life, and all that is dear to you, to bring off this gentle one, and I suppose that some such disposition is at the bottom of it all. As for me, I taught the lad the real character of a rifle, and while he has paid me for it, I have felt at his side in many a bloody scrimmage, in so long as I could hear the crack of his piece in one ear, and that of the sagamore in the other, I knew no enemy was at my back. Winters and summers, nights and days, have we roved the wilderness in company, eating of the same dish, one sleeping while the other watched. And afore it shall be said that Uncas was taken to the torment, and I at hand, there is a single ruler of us all, whatever may the color of the skin, and him I call to witness, that before the Mohican boy shall perish for the want of a friend, good faith shall depart the earth, and kill deer, become as harmless as the tooting weapon of the singer. Duncan released his hold on the arm of the scout, who turned, and steadily retraced his steps towards the lodges. After pausing a moment to gaze at his retiring form, the successful and yet sorrowful Hayward and Alice took their way together toward the distant village of the Delawares. End of chapter 25「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Number 6 The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 26 But let me play the lion too, Midsummer Night's Dream. Notwithstanding the high resolution of Hawkeye, he fully comprehended all the difficulties and danger he was about to incur. In his return to the camp, his acute and practiced intellects were intently engaged in devising means to counteract a watchfulness and suspicion on the part of his enemies that he knew were in no degree inferior to his own. Nothing but the color of his skin had saved the lives of Magua and the conjurer, who would have been the first victims sacrificed to his own security had not the scout believed such an act, however congenial it might be to the nature of an Indian, utterly unworthy of one who boasted a descent from men that knew no cross of blood. Accordingly, he trusted to the withs and ligaments with which he had bound his captives, and pursued his way directly toward the center of the lodges. As he approached the buildings, his steps became more deliberate, and his vigilant eye suffered no sign, whether friendly or hostile, to escape him. A neglected hut was a little in advance of the others, and appeared as if it had been deserted when half completed, most probably on account of failing in some of the more important requisites, such as wood or water. A faint light glimmered through its cracks, however, and announced that, notwithstanding its imperfect structure, it was not without a tenant. Thither then the scout proceeded, like a prudent general who was about to feel the advanced positions of his enemy before he hazarded the main attack. Throwing himself into a suitable posture for the beast he represented, Hawkeye crawled to a little opening where he might command a view of the interior. It proved to be the abiding place of David Gamut. 
hither the faithful singing-master had now brought himself together with all his sorrows his apprehensions and his meek dependence on the protection of providence at the precise moment when his ungainly person came under the observation of the scout in the manner just mentioned the woodsman himself though in his assumed character was the subject of the solitary being's profounded reflections however implicit the faith of david was in the performance of ancient miracles he eschewed the belief of any direct supernatural agency in the management of modern morality in other words while he had implicit faith in the ability of balaam's ass to speak he was somewhat sceptical on the subject of a bear's singing, and yet he had been assured of the latter on the testimony of his own exquisite organs. There was something in his air and manner that betrayed to the scout the utter confusion of the state of his mind. He was seated on a pile of brush, a few twigs from which occasionally fed his low fire, with his head leaning on his arm, in a posture of melancholy musing the costume of the votary of music had undergone no other alteration from that so lately described except that he had covered his bald head with the triangular beaver which had not proved sufficiently alluring to excite the cupidity of any of his captors the ingenious hawkeye who recalled the hasty manner in which the other had abandoned his post at the bedside of the sick woman was not without his suspicions concerning the subject of so much solemn deliberation first making the circuit of the hut and ascertaining that it stood quite alone and that the character of its inmate was likely to protect it from visitors he ventured through its low door into the very presence of gamut the position of the latter brought the fire between them and when hawkeye had seated himself on end near a minute elapsed during which the two remained regarding each other without speaking the suddenness and the nature of the surprise had nearly proved too much for we will not say the philosophy but for the pitch and resolution of david he fumbled for his pitch-pipe and arose with a confused intention of attempting a musical exorcism dark and mysterious monster he exclaimed while with trembling hands he disposed of his auxiliary eyes and sought his never-failing resource in trouble the gifted version of the psalms i know not your nature nor intents but if aught you meditate against the person and rights of one of the humblest servants of the temple listen to the inspired language of the youth of israel and repent the bear shook his shaggy sides and then a well-known voice replied put up the tooting weapon and teach your throat modesty five words of plain and comprehensible english are worth just now an hour of squalling what art thou demanded david utterly disqualified to pursue his original intention and nearly gasping for breath a man like yourself and one whose blood is as little tainted by the cross of a bear or an indian as your own have you so soon forgotten from whom you received the foolish instrument you hold in your hand can these things be returned david breathing more freely as the truth began to dawn upon him i have found many marvels during my sojourn with the heathen but surely nothing to excel this come come returned hawkeye uncasing his honest countenance the better to assure the wavering confidence of his companion you may see a skin which if it be not as white as one of the gentle ones has no tinge of red to it that the winds of the heaven and the sun have not bestowed now let us to business first tell me of the maiden and of the youth who so bravely sought her interrupted david ay they are happily freed from the tomahawks of these varlets but can you put me on the scent of uncas the young man is in bondage and much i fear his death is decreed i greatly mourn that one so well disposed should die in his ignorance and i have sought a goodly hymn can you lead me to him the task will not be difficult returned david hesitating though i greatly fear your presence would rather increase than mitigate his unhappy fortunes no more words but lead on returned hawkeye concealing his face again and setting the example in his own person by instantly quitting the lodge as they proceeded the scout ascertained that his companion found access to uncas under privilege of his imaginary infirmity aided by the favor he had acquired with one of the guards who in consequence of speaking a little english had been selected by david as the subject of a religious conversion how far the heron comprehended the intentions of his new friend may well be doubted but as exclusive attention is as flattering to a savage as to a more civilized individual it had produced the effect we have mentioned 
It is unnecessary to repeat the shrewd manner with which the scout extracted these particulars from the simple David. Neither shall we dwell in this place on the nature of the instruction he delivered when completely master of all the necessary facts, as the whole will be sufficiently explained to the reader in the course of the narrative. The lodge in which Uncas was confined was in the very centre of the village, and in a situation perhaps more difficult than any other to approach or leave without observation but it was not the policy of hawkeye to effect the least concealment presuming on his disguise and his ability to sustain the character he had assumed he took the most plain and direct route to the place the hour however afforded him some little of that protection which he appeared so much to despise the boys were already buried in sleep and all the women and most of the warriors had retired to their lodges for the night four or five of the latter only lingered about the door of the prison of uncas wary but close observers of the manner of their captive at the sight of gamut accompanied by one in the well-known masquerade of their most distinguished conjurer they readily made way for them both still they betrayed no intention to depart on the other hand they were evidently disposed to remain bound to the place by an additional interest in the mysterious mummeries that they of course expected from such a visit from the total inability of the scout to address the hurons in their own language he was compelled to trust the conversation entirely to david notwithstanding the simplicity of the latter he did ample justice to the instructions he had received more than fulfilling the strongest hopes of his teacher the delawares are women he exclaimed addressing himself to the savage who had a slight understanding of the language in which he spoke the yengeese my foolish countrymen have told them to take up the tomahawk and to strike their fathers in the canadas and they have forgotten their sex does my brother wish to hear le cerf agile ask for his petticoats and see him weep before the hurons at the stake the exclamation huh, delivered in a strong tone of assent announced the gratification the savage would receive in witnessing such an exhibition of weakness in an enemy so long hated and so much feared then let him step aside and the cunning man will blow upon the dog tell it to my brothers the Huron explained the meaning of David to his fellows, who in their turn listened to the project with that sort of satisfaction that their untamed spirits might be expected to find in such refinement and cruelty. They drew back a little from the entrance, and motioned to the supposed conjurer to enter, but the bear, instead of obeying, maintained the seat it had taken, and growled. "'The cunning man is afraid that his breath will blow upon his brothers and take away their courage too,' continued David." improving the hint he received, they must stand further off. The Hurons, who would have deemed such a misfortune the heaviest calamity that could befall them, fell back in a body, taking a position where they were out of earshot, though at the same time they could command a view of the entrance to the lodge. Then, as if satisfied of their safety, the scout left his position and slowly entered the place. It was silent and gloomy, being tenanted solely by the captive, and lighted by the dying embers of a fire which had been used for the purpose of cookery. Uncas occupied a distant corner in a reclining attitude, being rigidly bound both hands and feet by strong and painful withs. When the frightful object first presented itself to the young Mohican, he did not deign to bestow a single glance on the animal. The scout, who had left David at the door to ascertain they were not observed, thought it prudent to preserve his disguise until assured of their privacy. Instead of speaking, therefore, he exerted himself to enact one of the antics of the animal he represented. The young Mohican, who at first believed his enemies had sent in a real beast to torment him and try his nerves, detected in those performances that to Hayward had appeared so accurate certain blemishes that at once betrayed the counterfeit had hawkeye been aware of the low estimation in which the skilful uncas held his representations he would probably have prolonged the entertainment a little in pique but the scornful expression of the young man's eye admitted of so many constructions that the worthy scout was spared the mortification of such a discovery as soon therefore as david gave the preconcerted signal a low hissing sound was heard in the lodge in place of the fierce growlings of the bear Uncas had cast his body back against the wall of the hut and closed his eyes, as if willing to exclude so contemptible and disagreeable an object from his sight. But the moment the noise of the serpent was heard, he arose and cast his looks on each side of him, bending his head low and turning it inquiringly in every direction, until his keen eye rested on the shaggy monster, where it remained riveted as though fixed by the power of a charm. 
Again the same sounds were repeated, evidently proceeding from the mouth of the beast. Once more the eyes of the youth roamed over the interior of the lodge, and returning to the former resting place, he uttered in a deep, suppressed voice, Hawkeye. Cut his band, said Hawkeye to David, who just then approached them. The singer did as he was ordered, and Uncas found his limbs released. At the same moment the dried skin of the animal rattled, and presently the scout arose to his feet in proper person. The Mohican appeared to comprehend the nature of the attempt his friend had made intuitively, neither tongue nor feature betraying another symptom of surprise. When Hawkeye had cast his shaggy vestment, which was done by simply loosing certain thongs of skin, he drew a long glittering knife and put it in the hands of Uncas. The red herons are without, he said. Let us be ready. At the same time he laid his finger significantly on another similar weapon, both being the fruits of his prowess among their enemies during the evening. We will go, said Uncas. Whither? To the tortoises. They are the children of my grandfathers. Ay, lad, said the scout in English, a language he was apt to use when a little abstracted in mind. The same blood runs in your veins, I believe. But time and distance has a little changed its color. What shall we do with the mingos at the door? They count six, and the singer is as good as nothing. The herons are boasters, said Uncas scornfully. Their totem is a moose, and they run like snails. The Delawares are children of the tortoise, and they outstrip the deer. Ay, lad, there is truth in what you say, and I doubt not, on a rush, you would pass the whole nation, and, in a straight race of two miles, would be in and get your breath again, a foreign knave of them all was within hearing of the other village. But the gift of a white man lies more in his arms than in his legs. As for myself, I can brain a Huron as well as a better man, but when it comes to a race the knaves would prove too much for me. Uncas, who had already approached the door in readiness to lead the way, now recoiled and placed himself once more in the bottom of the lodge. But Hawkeye, who was too much occupied with his own thoughts to note the movement, continued speaking more to himself than to his companion. After all, he said, it is unreasonable to keep one man in bondage to the gifts of another. So, Uncas, you had better take the lead, while I will put on the skin again and trust to cunning for want of speed. The young Mohican made no reply, but quietly folded his arms, and leaned his body against one of the upright posts that supported the wall of the hut. Well, said the scout, looking up at him, why do you tarry? There will be time enough for me, as the knaves will give chase to you at first. Uncas will stay, was the calm reply. For what? To fight with his father's brother, and die with a friend of the Delawares. Aye, lad, returned Hawkeye, squeezing the hand of Uncas between his own iron fingers. "'Twould have been more like a Mingo than a Mohican had you left me. But I thought I would make the offer, seeing that youth commonly loves life. Well, what can't be done by main courage in war must be done by circumvention. Put on the skin. I doubt not you can play the bear nearly as well as myself.' Whatever might have been the private opinion of Uncas of their respective abilities in this particular, his grave countenance manifested no opinion of his superiority. He silently and expeditiously encased himself in the covering of the beast, and then awaited such other movements as his more aged companion saw fit to dictate. "'Now, friend,' said Hawkeye, addressing David, "'an exchange of garments will be a great convenience to you, "'inasmuch as you are but little accustomed to the makeshifts of the wilderness. "'Here, take my hunting shirt and cap, and give me your blanket and hat. "'You must trust me with the book and spectacles, as well as the tutor, too. "'If we ever meet again in better times, you shall have all back again, "'with many thanks into the bargain.' David parted with the several articles named with a readiness that would have done great credit to his liberality had he not certainly profited in many particulars by the exchange. Hawkeye was not long in assuming his borrowed garments, and when his restless eyes were hid behind the glasses, and his head was surmounted by the triangular beaver, as their statures were not dissimilar, he might readily have passed for the singer by starlight. As soon as these dispositions were made, the scout turned to David and gave him his parting instructions. "'Are you much given to cowardice?' he bluntly asked, by way of obtaining a suitable understanding of the whole case before he ventured a prescription. "'My pursuits are peaceful, and my temper, I humbly trust, is greatly given to mercy and love,' returned David, a little nettled at so direct an attack on his manhood. "'But there are none who can say that I have ever forgotten my faith in the Lord, even in the greatest straits.' "'Your chiefest danger will be at the moment when the savages find out that they have been deceived.' If you are not then knocked on the head, your being a non-composser will protect you. 
and you'll then have a good reason to expect to die in your bed. If you stay, it must be to sit down here in the shadow and take the part of Uncas until such times as the cunning of the Indians discover the cheat, when, as I've already said, your times of trial will come. So choose for yourself to make a rush or tarry here. Even so, said David firmly, I will abide in the place of the Delaware. Bravely and generously has he battled in my behalf, and this and more will I dare in his service. You have spoken as a man, and like one who under wiser schooling would have been brought to better things. Hold your head down and draw in your legs. Their formation might tell the truth too early. Keep silent as long as may be, and it would be wise when you do speak to break out suddenly in one of your shoutings, which will serve to remind the Indians that you are not altogether as responsible as men should be. If, however, they take your scalp, as I trust and believe they will not, depend on it, Uncas and I will not forget the deed, but revenge it as becomes true warriors and trusty friends. Hold, said David, perceiving that with this assurance they were about to leave him. I am an unworthy and humble follower of one who taught not the damnable principle of revenge. Should I fall, therefore, seek no victims to my manes, but rather forgive my destroyers, and if you remember them at all, let it be in prayers for the enlightening of their minds and for their eternal welfare. The scout hesitated and appeared to muse. There is a principle in that, he said, different from the law of the woods, and yet it is fair and noble to reflect upon. Then, heaving a heavy sigh, probably among the last he ever drew in pining for a condition he had so long abandoned, he added, It is what I would wish to practice myself, as one without a cross of blood, though it is not always easy to deal with an Indian as you would with a fellow Christian. God bless you, friend. I do believe your scent is not greatly wrong, when the matter is duly considered, and keeping eternity before the eyes, though much depends on the natural gifts and the force of temptation. So saying, the scout returned and shook David cordially by the hand, after which act of friendship he immediately left the lodge, attended by the new representative of the beast. The instant Hawkeye found himself under the observation of the Hurons, he drew up his tall form in the rigid manner of David, threw out his arm in the act of keeping time, and commenced what he intended for an imitation of his psalmody. Happily for the success of this delicate adventure, he had to deal with ears but little practiced in the concord of sweet sounds, or the miserable effort would infallibly have been detected. It was necessary to pass within dangerous proximity of the dark group of the savages, and the voice of the scout grew louder as they drew nigher. When at the nearest point the Huron who spoke the English thrust out an arm and stopped the supposed singing master. The Delaware dog, he said, leaning forward and peering through the dim light to catch the expression of the other's features. Is he afraid? Will the Hurons hear his groans? A growl so exceedingly fierce and natural proceeded from the beast that the young Indian released his hold and started aside, as if to assure himself that it was not a veritable bear and no counterfeit that was rolling before him. Hawkeye, who feared his voice would betray him to his subtle enemies, gladly profited by the interruption to break out anew in such a burst of musical expression as would probably in a more refined state of society have been termed a grand crash. Among his actual auditors, however, it merely gave him an additional claim to that respect which they never withhold from such as are believed to be the subjects of mental alienation. The little knot of Indians drew back in a body, and suffered, as they thought, the conjurer and his inspired assistant to proceed. It required no common exercise of fortitude in Uncas and the scout to continue the dignified and deliberate pace they had assumed in passing the lodge, especially as they immediately perceived that curiosity had so far mastered fear as to induce the watchers to approach the hut in order to witness the effect of the incantations. The least injudicious or impatient movement on the part of David might betray them, and time was absolutely necessary to ensure the safety of the scout. The loud noise... The latter conceived it politic to continue, drew many curious gazers to the doors of the different huts as they passed, and once or twice a dark-looking warrior stepped across their path, led to the act by superstition and watchfulness. They were not, however, interrupted, the darkness of the hour and the boldness of the attempt proving their principal friends. The adventurers had got clear of the village, and were now swiftly approaching the shelter of the woods, when a loud and long cry arose from the lodge where Uncas had been confined. 
The Mohican started on his feet and shook his shaggy covering as though the animal he counterfeited was about to make some desperate effort. Hold, said the scout, grasping his friend by the shoulder. Let them yell again. Twas nothing but wonderment. He had no occasion to delay, for at the next instant a burst of cries filled the outer air and ran along the whole extent of the village. Uncas cast his skin and stepped forth in his own beautiful proportions. Hawkeye tapped him lightly on the shoulder and glided ahead. "'Now let the devil strike our scent,' said the scout, tearing two rifles with all their attendant accoutrements from beneath a bush, and flourishing Kildeer as he handed Uncas his weapon. Two at least will find it to their deaths.' Then, throwing their pieces to a low trail, like sportsmen in readiness for their game, they dashed forward and were soon buried in the somber darkness of the forest. End chapter 26This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Igor T. Foray and Magdeburg, Germany. The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter 27. Antonius. I shall remember, when Caesar says, do this, it is performed. Julius Caesar The impatience of the savages who lingered about the prison of Uncas, as has been seen, had overcome their dread of the conjurer's breath. They stole cautiously and with beating hearts to a crevice through which the faint light of the fire was glimmering. For several minutes they mistook the form of David for that of the prisoner, but the very accident which Hawkeye had foreseen occurred. Tired of keeping the extremities of his long person so near together, the singer gradually suffered the lower limbs to extend themselves, until one of his misshapen feet actually came in contact with, unshoved aside, the embers of the fire. At first the Hurons believed the Delaware had thus been deformed by witchcraft. But when David, unconscious of being observed, turned his head and exposed his simple, mild countenance in place of the haughty lineaments of their prisoner, it would have exceeded the credulity of even a native to have doubted any longer. They rushed together into the lodge, and laying their hands with but little ceremony on their captive, immediately detected the imposition. Then arose the cry, first heard by the fugitives. It was succeeded by the most frantic and angry demonstrations of vengeance. David, however, firm in his determination to cover the retreat of his friends, was compelled to believe that his own final hour had come. Deprived of his book and his pipe, he was fain to trust to a memory that rarely failed him on such subjects, and breaking forth in a loud and impassioned strain, he endeavored to smooth his passage into the other world by singing the opening verse of a funeral anthem. The Indians were seasonably reminded of his infirmity, and rushing into the open air, they aroused the village in the manner described. A native warrior fights as he sleeps, without the protection of anything defensive. The sounds of the alarm were, therefore, hardly uttered before two hundred men were afoot and ready for the battle or the chase, as either might be required. The escape was soon known, and the whole tribe crowded in a body around the council lodge, impatiently awaiting the instruction of their chiefs. In such sudden demand on their wisdom, the presence of the cunning Magua could scarcely fail of being needed. His name was mentioned, and all looked round in wonder that he did not appear. Messengers were then dispatched to his lodge, requiring his presence. In the meantime, some of the swiftest and most discreet of the young men were ordered to make the circuit of the clearing under cover of the woods, in order to ascertain that their suspected neighbors, the Delawares, designed no mischief. 
women and children ran to and fro and in short the whole encampment exhibited another scene of wild and savage confusion gradually however these symptoms of disorder diminished and in a few minutes the oldest and most distinguished chiefs were assembled in the lodge in grave consultation the clamour of many voices soon announced that a party approached who might be expected to communicate some intelligence that would explain the mystery of the novel surprise the crowd without gave way and several warriors entered the place bringing with them the hapless conjurer who had been left so long by the scout in duress notwithstanding that this man was held in very unequal estimation among the hurons some believing implicitly in his power and others deeming him an impostor he was now listened to by all with the deepest attention when his brief story was ended the father of the sick woman stepped forth and in a few pithy expression related in his turn what he knew these two narratives gave a proper direction to the subsequent inquiries which were now made with the characteristic cunning of savages instead of rushing in a confused and disorderly throng to the cavern ten of the wisest and firmest among the chiefs were selected to prosecute the investigation as no time was to be lost the instant the choice was made the individuals appointed rose in a body and left the place without speaking on reaching the entrance the younger men in advance made way for their seniors and the whole proceeded along the low dark gallery with a firmness of warriors ready to devote themselves to the public good though at the same time secretly doubting the nature of the power with which they were about to contend the outer apartment of the cavern was silent and gloomy the woman lay in her usual place and posture though there were those present who affirmed that they had seen her borne to the woods by the supposed medicine of the white man such a direct and palpable contradiction of the tale related by the father caused all eyes to be turned on him chaffed by the silent imputation and inwardly troubled by so unaccountable a circumstance the chief advanced to the side of the bed and stooping cast an incredulous look at the features as if distrusting their reality his daughter was dead the unerring feeling of nature for a moment prevailed and the old warrior hid his eyes in sorrow then recovering his self-possession he faced his companions and pointing toward the corpse he said in the language of his people the wife of my young man has left us the great spirit is angry with his children the mournful intelligence was received in solemn silence after a short pause one of the elder indians was about to speak when a dark-looking object was seen rolling out of an adjoining apartment into the very center of the room where they stood ignorant of the nature of the beings they had to deal with the whole party drew back a little and rising on end exhibited the distorted but still fierce and sullen features of magua the discovery was succeeded by a general exclamation of amazement as soon however as the true situation of the chief was understood several knives appeared and his limbs and tongue were quickly released the huron arose and shook himself like a lion quitting his lair not a word escaped him though his hand played convulsively with the handle of his knife while his lowering eyes scanned the whole party as if they sought an object suited for the first burst of his vengeance it was happy for uncas and the scout and even david that they were all beyond the reach of his arm at such a moment for assuredly no refinement and cruelty would then have deferred their deaths in opposition to the promptings of the fierce temper that nearly choked him meeting everywhere faces that he knew as friends the savage grated his teeth together like rasps of iron and swallowed his passion for want of a victim on whom to vent it 
this exhibition of anger was noted by all present, and from an apprehension of exasperating a temper that was already chaffed nearly to madness, several minutes were suffered to pass before another word was uttered. When, however, suitable time had elapsed, the oldest of the party spoke. "'My friend has found an enemy,' he said. "'Is he nigh that the Hurons might take revenge?' "'Let the Delaware die!' exclaimed Magua in a voice of thunder. Another longer and expressive silence was observed, and was broken, as before, with due precaution by the same individual. "'The Mohican is swift of foot and leaps far,' he said. "'But my young men are on his trail.' "'Is he gone?' demanded Magua, in tones so deep and guttural that they seemed to proceed from his inmost chest. "'An evil spirit has been among us, and the Delaware has blinded our eyes.' "'An evil spirit!' repeated the other, mockingly. "'Tis the spirit that has taken the lives of so many Hurons, the spirit that slew my young man at the tumbling river, that took their scalps at the healing spring, and who has now bound the arms of Le Renard Sutil. "'Of whom does my friend speak?' "'Of the dog who carries the heart and the cunning of a Huron under a pale skin, La Longue Carabine.' The pronunciation of so terrible a name produced the usual effect among his auditors. But when time was given for reflection, and the warriors remembered that their formidable and daring enemy had been in the bosom of their encampment working injury, fearful rage took place of wonder, and all those fierce passions with which the bosom of Magua had just been struggling were suddenly transferred to his companions. Some among them gnashed their teeth in anger, others vented their feelings in yells, and some again beat the air as frantically as if the object of their resentment were suffering under their blows. But this sudden outbreaking of temper, as quickly subsided in the still and sullen restraint, they most affected in their moments of inaction. Magua who had in his turn found leisure for reflection, now changed his manner and assumed the air of one who knew how to think and act with a dignity worthy of so grave a subject. "'Let us go to my people,' he said. "'They wait for us.' His companions consented in silence, and the whole of the savage party left the cavern and returned to the council lodge. When they were seated, all eyes turned on Magua, who understood, from such an indication, that, by common consent, they had devolved the duty of relating what had passed on him. He arose and told the tale without duplicity or reservation. The whole deception practiced by both Duncan and Hawkeye was, of course, laid naked, and no room was found, even for the most superstitious of the tribe, any longer to affix a doubt on the character of the occurrences. It was but too apparent that they had been insultingly, shamefully, disgracefully deceived. When he had ended and resumed his seat, the collected tribe, for his auditors in substance included all the fighting men of the party, sat regarding each other like men astonished equally at the audacity and the success of their enemies. The next consideration, however, was the means and opportunities for revenge. Additional pursuers were sent on the trail of the fugitives, and then the chiefs applied themselves in earnest to the business of consultation. Many different expedients were proposed by the elder warriors in succession, to all of which Magua was a silent and respectful listener. That subtle savage had recovered his artifice and self-command, and now proceeded toward his object with his customary caution and skill. It was only when each one, disposed to speak, had uttered his sentiments, that he prepared to advance his own opinions. They were given with additional weight from the circumstance that some of the runners had already returned, and reported 
that their enemies had been traced so far as to leave no doubt of their having sought safety in the neighboring camp of their suspected allies, the Delawares. With the advantage of possessing this important intelligence, the chief warily laid his plans before his fellows, and, as might have been anticipated from his eloquence and cunning, they were adopted without a dissenting voice. They were briefly as follows, both in opinions and in motives. It has already been stated that, in obedience to a policy rarely departed from, the sisters were separated so soon as they reached the Huron village. Magua had early discovered that in retaining the person of Alice he possessed the most effectual check on Cora. When they parted, therefore, he kept the former within reach of his hand, consigning the one he most valued to the keeping of their allies. The arrangement was understood to be merely temporary, and was made as much with a view to flatter his neighbors as in obedience to the invariable rule of Indian policy. While goaded incessantly by these revengeful impulses that in a savage seldom slumber, the chief was still attentive to his more permanent personal interests. The follies and disloyalty committed in his youth were to be expiated by a long and painful penance, ere he could be restored to the full enjoyment of the confidence of his ancient people, and without confidence there could be no authority in an Indian tribe. In this delicate and arduous situation, the crafty native had neglected no means of increasing his influence, and one of the happiest of his expedients had been the success with which he had cultivated the favor of their powerful and dangerous neighbors. The result of his experiment had answered all the expectations of his policy, for the Hurons were in no degree exempt from that governing principle of nature which induces man to value his gifts precisely in the degree that they are appreciated by others. But while he was making this ostensible sacrifice to general considerations, Magua never lost sight of his individual motives. The latter had been frustrated by the unlooked-for events which had placed all the prisoners beyond his control, and now he found himself reduced to the necessity of suing for favors to those whom it had so lately been his policy to oblige. Several of the chiefs had proposed deep and treacherous schemes to surprise the Delawares, and, by gaining possession of their camp, to recover their prisoners by the same blow, for all agreed that their honor, their interests, and the peace and happiness of their dead countrymen imperiously required them speedily to immolate some victims to their revenge. But plans so dangerous to attempt, and of such doubtful issue, Magua found little difficulty in defeating. He exposed their risk and fallacy with his usual skill and it was only after he had removed every impediment in the shape of opposing advice that he ventured to propose his own projects. He commenced by flattering the self-love of his auditors, a never-failing method of commanding attention. When he had enumerated the many different occasions on which the Hurons had exhibited their courage and prowess, in the punishment of insults, he digressed in a high encomium on the virtue of wisdom. He painted the quality as forming the great point of difference between the beaver and other brutes, between the brutes and men, and finally between the Hurons in particular and the rest of the human race. After he had sufficiently extolled the property of discretion, he undertook to exhibit in what manner its use was applicable to the present situation of their tribe. On the one hand, he said, was their great pale father, the governor of the Canadas, who had looked upon his children with a hard eye since their tomahawks had been so red. On the other, a people as numerous as themselves, who spoke a different language, possessed different interests, and loved them not, 
and who would be glad of any pretense to bring them in disgrace with the great white chief? Then he spoke of their necessities, of the gifts they had the right to expect for their past services, of their distance from their proper hunting grounds and native villages, and of the necessity of consulting prudence more and inclination less in so critical circumstances. When he perceived that, while the old man applauded his moderation, many of the fiercest and most distinguished of the warriors listened to these politic plans with lowering looks, he cunningly led them back to the subject which they most loved. He spoke openly of the fruits of their wisdom, which he boldly pronounced would be a complete and final triumph over their enemies. He even darkly hinted that their success might be extended, with proper caution, in such a manner as to include the destruction of all whom they had reason to hate. In short, he so blended the warlike with the artful, the obvious with the obscure, as to flatter the propensities of both parties, and to leave to each subject of hope, while neither could say it, clearly comprehended his intentions. The orator, or the politician, who can produce such a state of things, is commonly popular with his contemporaries, however he may be treated by posterity. All perceived that more was meant than was uttered, and each one believed that the hidden meaning was precisely such as his own faculties enabled him to understand, or his own wishes led him to anticipate. In this happy state of things, it is not surprising that the management of Magua prevailed. The tribe consented to act with deliberation, and with one voice they committed the direction of the whole affair to the government of the chief, who had suggested such wise and intelligible expedients. Magua had now attained one great object of all his cunning and enterprise. The ground he had lost in the favor of his people was completely regained, and he found himself even placed at the head of affairs. He was, in truth, their ruler, and so long as he could maintain his popularity, no monarch could be more despotic, especially while the tribe continued in a hostile country. Throwing off, therefore, the appearance of consultation, he assumed the grave air of authority necessary to support the dignity of his office. Runners were dispatched for intelligence in different directions. Spies were ordered to approach and feel the encampment of the Delawares. The warriors were dismissed to their lodges with an intimation that their services would soon be needed, and the women and children were ordered to retire with a warning that it was their province to be silent. When these several arrangements were made, Magba passed through the village, stopping here and there to pay a visit where he thought his presence might be flattering to the individual. He confirmed his friends in their confidence, fixed the wavering, and gratified all. Then he sought his own lodge. The wife the Huron chief had abandoned when he was chased from among his people was dead. Children he had none, and he now occupied a hut without companion of any sort. It was, in fact, the dilapidated and solitary structure in which David had been discovered, and whom he had tolerated in his presence on those few occasions when they met with the contemptuous indifference of a haughty superiority. Hither, then, Magua retired when his labors of policy were ended. While others slept, however, he neither knew or sought repose. Had there been one sufficiently curious to have watched the movements of the newly elected chief, he would have seen him seated in a corner of his lodge, musing on the subject of his future plans from the hour of his retirement to the time he had appointed for the warriors to assemble again. Occasionally the air breathed through the crevices of the hut, and the low flame that fluttered about the embers of the fire 
threw their wavering light on the person of the sullen recluse. At such moments it would not have been difficult to have fancied the dusky savage, the prince of darkness, brooding on his own fancied wrongs and plotting evil. Long before the day dawned, however, warrior after warrior entered the solitary hut of Magua until they had collected to the number of twenty. Each bore his rifle and all the other accoutrements of war. Though the paint was uniformly peaceful, the entrance of these fierce-looking beings was unnoticed, some seating themselves in the shadows of the place and others standing like motionless statues until the whole of the designated band was collected. Then Magua arose and gave the signal to proceed, marching himself in advance. They followed their leader singly, and in that well-known order which has obtained the distinguishing appellation of Indian File. Unlike other men engaged in the spirit-steering business of war, they stole from their camp unostentatiously and unobserved, resembling a band of gliding specters, more than warriors seeking the bubble reputation by deeds of desperate daring. Instead of taking the path which led directly toward the camp of the Delawares, Magua led his party for some distance down the winding of the stream and along the little artificial lake of the beavers. The day began to dawn as they entered the clearing, which had been formed by those sagacious and industrious animals. Though Magua, who had resumed his ancient garb, bore the outline of a fox on the dressed skin which formed his robe, there was one chief of his party who carried the beaver as his peculiar symbol or totem. There would have been a species of profanity in the omission had this man passed so powerful a community of his fancied kindred without bestowing some evidence of his regard. Accordingly, he paused and spoke in words as kind and friendly as if he were addressing more intelligent beings. He called the animals his cousins and reminded them that his protecting influence was the reason they remained unharmed, while many avaricious traders were prompting the Indians to take their lives. He promised a continuance of his favors and admonished them to be grateful. After which he spoke of the expedition in which he was himself engaged and intimated, though with sufficient delicacy and circumlocution, the expediency of bestowing on their relative a portion of that wisdom for which they were so renowned. Note. These harangues of beasts were frequent among the Indians. They often addressed their victims in this way, reproaching them for cowardice or commending their resolution as they may happen to exhibit fortitude or the reverse in suffering. During the utterance of this extraordinary address, the companions of the speaker were as grave and as attentive to his language as though they were all equally impressed with its propriety. Once or twice black objects were seen rising to the surface of the water, and the Huron expressed pleasure, conceiving that his words were not bestowed in vain. Just as he ended his address, the head of a large beaver was thrust from the door of a lodge, whose earthen walls had been much injured, and which the party had believed, from its situation, to be uninhabited. Such an extraordinary sign of confidence was received by the orator as a highly favorable omen, and though the animal retreated a little precipitately, he was lavish of his thanks and commendations. When Magua thought sufficient time had been lost in gratifying the family affection of the warrior, he again made the signal to proceed. As the Indians moved away in a body, and with a step that would have been inaudible to the ears of any common man, the same venerable-looking beaver once more ventured his head from its cover. Had any of the Hurons turned to look behind them, 
they would have seen the animal watching their movements with an interest and sagacity that might easily have been mistaken for reason. Indeed, so very distinct and intelligible were the devices of the quadruped, that even the most experienced observer would have been at a loss to account for its actions until the moment when the party entered the forest, when the whole would have been explained by seeing the entire animal issue from the lodge uncasing by the act, the grave features of Chingachgook from his mask of fur. End of chapter 27This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boyer. The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter 28. Brief, I pray for you, for you see, tis a busy time with me. Much ado about nothing. The tribe or rather half-tribe of Delawares, which has been so often mentioned, and whose present place of encampment was so nigh the temporary village of the Hurons, could assemble about an equal number of warriors with the latter people. Like their neighbors, they had followed Montcalm into the territories of the English crown, and were making heavy and serious inroads on the hunting-grounds of the Mohawks, though they had seen fit with a mysterious reserve so common among the natives, to withhold their assistance at the moment when it was most required. The French had accounted for this unexpected defection on the part of the ally in various ways. It was a prevalent opinion, however, that they had been influenced by a veneration for the ancient treaty, that had once made them dependent on the Six Nations for military protection and now rendered them reluctant to encounter their former masters. As for the tribe itself, it had been content to announce to Montcalm, through his emissaries, with Indian brevity, that their hatchets were dull, and time was necessary to sharpen them. The politic captain of the Canadas had deemed it wiser to submit to entertain a passive friend than by any acts of ill-judged severity to convert him into an open enemy. On that morning, when Magua led his silent party from the settlement of the beavers into the forests, in the manner described, the sun rose upon the Delaware encampment as if it had suddenly burst upon a busy people, actively employing avocations of high noon. The women ran from lodge to lodge, some engaged in preparing their morning's meal, a few earnestly bent on seeking the comforts necessary to their habits but more pausing to exchange hasty and whispered sentences with their friends. The warriors were lounging in groups, musing more than they conversed, and when a few words were uttered, speaking like men who deeply weighed their opinions. The instruments of the chase were to be seen in abundance among the lodges, but none departed. Here and there a warrior was examining his arms, with an attention that is rarely bestowed on the implements when no other enemy than the beasts of the forest is expected to be encountered. And occasionally the eyes of a whole group were turned simultaneously toward a large and silent lodge in the center of the village, as if it contained the subject of their common thoughts. During the existence of this scene, a man suddenly appeared at the furthest extremity of a platform of rock which formed the level of the village, he was without arms, and his paint tended rather to soften than increase the natural sternness of his austere countenance. When in full view of the Delawares he stopped, and made a gesture of amnity, by throwing his arm upward toward heaven, and then letting it fall impressively on his breast. The inhabitants of the village answered his salute by a low murmur of welcome, and encouraged him to advance by similar indications of friendship. Fortified by these assurances, the dark figure left the brow of the natural rocky terrace, where it had stood a moment, drawn in a long, strong outline against the blushing morning sky, 
and moved with dignity into the very centre of the huts. As he approached, nothing was audible but the rattling of the light silver ornaments that loaded his arms and neck, and the tinkling of little bells that fringed his deerskin moccasins. He made, as he advanced, many courteous signs of greeting to the men he passed, neglecting to notice the women, however, like one who deemed their favor, in the present enterprise, of no importance. When he had reached the group in which it was evident by the haughtiness of their common men that the principal chiefs were collected, the stranger paused, and then the Delawares saw that the active and erect form that stood before them was that of the well-known Huron chief, Le Renaud Subtil. His reception was grave, silent, and wary. The warriors in front stepped aside, opening the way to their most approved orator by the action one who spoke all those languages that were cultivated among the northern aborigines. "'The wise Huron is welcome,' said the Delaware, in the language of the Maquas. "'He has come to eat his succotash with the brothers of the lakes.'" Footnote. Composed of cracked corn and beans, it is much used also by the whites. By corn is meant maize. End footnote. "'He has come,' repeated Magua bending his head with the dignity of an eastern prince. The chief extended his arm, and taking the other by the wrist, they once more exchanged friendly salutations. Then the Delaware invited his guest to enter his own lodge, and share his morning meal. The invitation was accepted, and the two warriors, attended by three or four of the old men, walked calmly away, leaving the rest of the tribe devoured by a desire to understand the reasons of so unusual a visit, and yet not betraying the least impatience by sign or word. During the short and frugal repast that followed, the conversation was extremely circumspect, and related entirely to the events of the hunt, in which Magua had so lately been engaged. It would have been impossible for the most finished breeding to wear more of the appearance of considering the visit as a thing of course than did his hosts notwithstanding every individual present was perfectly aware that it must be connected with some secret object, and that probably of importance to themselves. When the appetites of the whole were appeased, the squaws removed the trenchers and gourds, and the two parties began to prepare themselves for a subtle trial of their wits. "'Is the face of my great Canada father turned again toward his Huron children?' demanded the orator of the Delawares. When was it ever otherwise? returned Magua. He calls my people most beloved. The Delaware gravely bowed his acquiescence to what he knew to be false, and continued, The tomahawks of your young men have been very red. It is so, but they are now bright and dull, for the Yankees are dead, and the Delawares are our neighbors. The other acknowledged the pacific compliment by a gesture of the hand, and remained silent. Then Magua, as if recalled to such a recollection by the allusion to the massacre, demanded, Does my prisoner give trouble to my brothers? She is welcome. The path between the Hurons and the Delawares is short, and it is open. Let her be sent to my squaws, if she gives trouble to my brother. She is welcome, returned the chief of the latter nation, still more emphatically. The baffled Magua continued silent several minutes, apparently indifferent, however, to the repulse he had received in this his opening effort to regain possession of Cora. "'Do my young men leave the Delaware's room on the mountains for their hunts?' he at length continued. "'The Lenape are rulers of their own hills,' returned the other a little haughtily. "'It is well. Justice is the master of a redskin.' Why should they brighten their tomahawks and sharpen their knives against each other? Are not the pale faces thicker than the swallows in the season of flowers? Good, exclaimed two or three of his auditors at the same time. Magua waited a little, to permit his words to soften the feelings of the Delawares, before he added, Have there not been strange moccasins in the woods? Have not my brothers scented the feet of white men? Let my Canada father come, returned the other evasively, 
his children are ready to see him. When the great chief comes, it is to smoke with the Indians of their wigwams. The Hurons say, too, he is welcome. But the Yankees have long arms, and legs that never tire. My young men dreamed they had seen the trail of the Yankees nigh the village of the Delawares. They will not find the Lenape asleep. It is well. The warrior whose eye is open can see his enemy, said Magua, once more shifting his ground, when he found himself unable to penetrate the caution of his companion. I have brought gifts to my brother. His nation would not go on the war-path, because they did not think it well, but their friends have remembered where they lived. When he had thus announced his liberal intention, the crafty chief arose, and gravely spread his presence before the dazzled eyes of his hosts. They consisted principally of trinkets of little value, plundered from the slaughtered females of William Henry. In the division of the baubles the cunning Huron discovered no less art than in their selection, while he bestowed those of greater value on the two most distinguished warriors, one of whom was his host, he seasoned his offerings to their inferiors with such well-timed and apposite compliments as left them no ground of complaint. In short, the whole ceremony contained such a happy blending of the profitable with the flattering, that it was not difficult for the donor immediately to read the effect of a generosity so aptly mingled with praise in the eyes of those he addressed. This well-judged and polite stroke on the part of Magua was not without instantaneous results. The Delawares lost their gravity in a much more cordial expression, and the host in particular, after contemplating his own liberal share of the spoil, for some moments with peculiar gratification, repeated with strong emphasis the words, My brother is a wise chief, he is welcome. The Hurons love their friends, the Delawares, returned Magua. Why should they not? They are colored by the same sun, and their just men will hunt in the same grounds after death. The redskins should be friends, and look with open eyes on the white men. Has not my brother scented spies in the woods? The Delaware, whose name in English signified hard heart, an appellation that the French had translated into le coeur dur, forgot that obduracy of purpose, which had probably obtained them so insignificant a title. His countenance grew very sensibly less stern, and he now deigned to answer more directly. There have been strange moccasins about my camp. They have been tracked into my lodges. Did my brother beat out the dogs? asked Magua, without averting in any manner to the former equivocation of the chief. It would not do. The stranger is always welcome to the children of the Lenape. The stranger, not the spy. Would the Yankees send their women as spies? Did not the Huron chief say he took women in the battle? He told no lie. The Yankees have sent out their scouts. They have been in my wigwams, but they found no one to say welcome. Then they fled to the Delawares, for, say they, the Delawares are our friends. Their minds are turned from their Canada father. This insinuation was a home thrust, and one that in a more advanced state of society would have entitled Magua to the reputation of a skillful diplomatist. The recent defection of the tribe had, as they well knew themselves, subjected the Delawares to much reproach among their French allies, and they were now made to feel that their future actions were to be regarded with jealousy and distrust. There was no deep insight into causes and effects necessary to foresee that such a situation of things was likely to prove highly prejudicial to their future movements. Their distant villages, their hunting grounds, and hundreds of their women and children, together with the material part of their physical force, were actually within the limits of the French territory. Accordingly, this alarming annunciation was received, as Magua intended, with manifest disappropriation, if not with alarm. Let my father look in my face, said Le Cordure. He will see no change. It is true, my young men did not go out on the warpath. They had dreams for not doing so. But they love and venerate the great white chief. Will he think so when he hears that his greatest enemy is fed in the camp of his children? 
when he is told a bloody Yankee smokes at your fire, that the pale face who has slain so many of his friends goes in and out among the Delawares. Go, my great Canada father is not a fool. Where is the Yankee that the Delawares fear returned the other? Who has slain my young men? Who is the mortal enemy of my great father? La Longue Carabine. The Delaware warriors started at the well-known name, betraying by their amazement that they now learned for the first time one so famous among the Indian allies of France was within their power. What does my brother mean? demanded Le Cordure, in a tone that, by its wonder, far exceeded the usual apathy of his race. A Huron never lies, returned Magua coldly, leaning his head against the side of the lodge and drawing a slight robe across his tawny breast. Let the Delawares count their prisoners. They will find one whose skin is neither red nor pale. A long and musing pause succeeded. The chief consulted apart with his companions, and messengers dispatched to collect certain others of the most distinguished men of the tribe. As warrior after warrior dropped in, they were each made acquainted in turn with the important intelligence that Magua had just communicated. The air of surprise, and the usual low, deep, guttural exclamation, were common to them all. The news spread from mouth to mouth, until the whole encampment became powerfully agitated. The women suspended their labors to catch such syllables as unguardedly fell from the lips of the consulting warriors. The boys deserted their sports, and walking fearlessly among their fathers, looked up in curious admiration. As they heard the brief exclamations of wonder, they so freely expressed the temerity of their hated foe. In short, every occupation was abandoned for the time, and all other pursuits seemed discarded in order that the tribe might freely indulge, after their own peculiar manner, in an open expression of feeling. When the excitement had a little abated, the old men disposed themselves seriously to consider that which it became the honor and safety of their tribe to perform, under circumstances of so much delicacy and embarrassment. During all these movements, and in the midst of the great commotion, Magua had not only maintained his seat, but the very attitude he had originally taken against the side of the lodge, for he continued as immovable, and apparently as unconcerned, as if he had no interest in the result. Not a single indication of the future intentions of his host, however, escaped his vigilant eyes. With his consummate knowledge of the nature of the people with whom he had to deal, he anticipated every measure on which they decided, and it might almost be said that in many instances he knew their intentions even before they became known to themselves. The council of the Delawares was short. When it was ended, a general bustle announced that it was to be immediately succeeded by a solemn and formal assemblage of the nation. As such meetings were rare and only called on occasions of the last importance, the subtle Huron, who still sat apart, a wily and dark observer of the proceedings, now knew that all his projects must be brought to their final issue. He therefore left the lodge and walked silently forth to the place, in front of the encampment, whither the warriors were already beginning to collect. It might have been half an hour before each individual, including even the women and children, was in his plates. The delay had been created by the grave preparations that were deemed necessary to so solemn and unusual a conference. But when the sun was seen climbing above the tops of that mountain, against whose bosoms the Delawares had constructed their encampment, most were seated, and as its bright rays darted from behind the outlines of trees that fringed the eminence, they fell upon as grave, as attentive, and as deeply interested a multitude and was probably ever before lighted by his morning beams. His number somewhat exceeded a thousand souls. In a collection of so serious savages, there is never to be found any impatient aspirant after premature distinction, standing ready to move his auditors to some hasty and perhaps injudicious discussion, in order that his own reputation might be the gainer. An act of so much precipitancy and presumption would seal the downfall of precocious intellect forever. 
it rested solely with the oldest and most experienced of the men to lay the subject of the conference before the people. Until such a one chose to make some movement, no deeds in arms, no natural gifts, nor any renown as an orator, would have justified the slightest interruption. On the present occasion the aged warrior, whose privilege it was to speak, was silent, seemingly oppressed with the magnitude of his subject. The delay had already continued long beyond the usual deliberative pause that always preceded a conference, but no sign of impatience or surprise escaped even the youngest boy. Occasionally an eye was raised from the earth, where the looks of most were riveted, and strayed toward a particular lodge, that was, however, in no manner distinguished from those around it, except in the peculiar care that had been taken to protect it against the assaults of the weather. At length, one of those low murmurs that are so apt to disturb a multitude was heard, and the whole nation arose to their feet by common impulse. At that instant, the door of the lodge in question opened, and three men, issuing from it, slowly approached the place of consultation. They were all aged, even beyond that period to which the oldest present had reached. But one in the center, who leaned on his companions for support, had numbered an amount of years to which the human race is seldom permitted to attain. His frame, which had once been tall and erect like the cedar, was now bending under the pressure of more than a century. The elastic, light step of an Indian was gone, and in its place he was compelled to toil his tardy way over the ground, inch by inch. His dark, wrinkled countenance was in singular and wild contrast with the long white locks which floated on his shoulders, in such thickness as is to announce that generations had probably passed away since they had last been shorn. The dress of this patriarch, for such, considering his vast age, in conjunction with his affinity and affluence with his people, he might very properly be termed, was rich and imposing, though strictly after the simple fashions of the tribe. His robe was of the finest skins, which had been deprived of their fur, in order to admit of a hieroglyphical representation of various deeds and arms done in former ages. His bosom was loaded with metals, some in massive silver, and one or two even in gold, the gifts of various Christian potentates during the long period of his life. He also wore armlets and cinctures above the ankles of the latter precious metal, his head on the whole of which the hair had been permitted to grow, the pursuits of war having so long been abandoned, was encircled by a sort of plated diadem, which in its turn bore lesser and more glittering ornaments, that sparkled amid the glossy hues of three drooping ostrich feathers, dyed a deep black, in touching contrast to the color of his snow-white locks. His tomahawk was nearly hid in silver, and the handle of his knife shone like a horn of solid gold. So soon as the first hum of emotion and pleasure, which the sudden appearance of this venerated individual created, had a little subsided, the name of Tamanand, was whispered from mouth to mouth. Magua had often heard the fame of this wise and just Delaware, a reputation that even proceeded so far as to bestow on him the rare gift of holding secret communication with the Great Spirit, and which has since transmitted his name with some slight alteration to the white usurpers of his ancient territory, as the imaginary title or saint of a vast empire. The Huron chief, therefore, stepped eagerly out of a little from the throng, to a spot whence he might catch a nearer glimpse of the features of the man, whose decision was likely to produce so deep an influence on his own fortunes. Footnote. The Americans sometimes call their tutelar saint, Tamini, a corruption of the name of the renowned chief here introduced. There are many traditions which speak of character and power of Temenand. End footnote. The eyes of the old man were closed, as though the organs were wearied with having so long witnessed the selfish workings of the human passions. The color of his skin differed from those most around him, being richer and darker, 
the latter having been produced by certain delicate and mazy lines of complicated and yet beautiful figures, which had been traced over most of his person by the operation of tattooing. Notwithstanding the position of the Huron, he passed the observant and silent Magua without notice, and leaning on his two venerable supporters, proceeded to the high place of the multitude, where he seated himself in the center of his nation, with the dignity of a monarch and the air of a father. Nothing could surpass the reverence and affection with which this unexpected visit from one who belongs rather to another world than to this was received by his people. After a suitable and decent pause, the principal chiefs arose, and approaching the patriarch they placed his hands reverently on their heads, seeming to entreat a blessing. The younger men were content with touching his robe, or even drawing nigh his person, in order to breathe in the same atmosphere of one so aged, so just, and so valiant. None but the most distinguished among the youthful warriors even presumed so far as to perform the latter ceremony, the great mass of the multitude deeming it a sufficient happiness to look upon a form so deeply venerated and so well beloved. When these acts of affection and respect were performed, the chiefs drew back again to their several places, and silence reigned in the whole encampment. After a short delay, a few of the young men, to whom instructions had been whispered by one of the aged attendants of Tamanund, arose, left the crowd, and entered the lodge, which has already been noted as the object of so much attention throughout that morning. In a few minutes they reappeared, escorting the individuals who had caused all these solemn preparations toward the seat of judgment. The crowd opened in a lane, and when the party had re-entered, it closed again forming a large and dense belt of human bodies, arranged in an open circle. End of chapter 28 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boyer the Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 29 The assembly seated, rising o'er the rest, Achilles thus, the king of men addressed. Pope's Iliad Cora stood foremost among the prisoners, entwining her arms and those of Alice, in the tenderness of sisterly love. Notwithstanding the fearful and menacing array of savages on every side of her, no apprehension on her own account could prevent the nobler-minded maiden from keeping her eyes fastened on the pale and anxious features of the trembling Alice. Close at their side stood Hayward, with an interest in both that, at such a moment of intense uncertainty, scarcely knew a preponderance in favor of her whom he most loved. Hawkeye had placed himself a little in the rear, with a deference to the superior rank of his companions that no similarity in the state of their present fortunes could induce them to forget. Uncas was not there. When perfect silence was again restored, and after the usual long, impressive pause, one of the two aged chiefs who sat at the side of the patriarch arose, and demanded aloud in very intelligible English, Which of my prisoners is La Longue Caribbean? Neither Duncan nor the scout answered. The former, however, glanced his eyes around the dark and silent assembly, and recoiled a pace, when they fell on the malignant visage of Magua. He saw at once that this wily savage had some secret agency in their present arraignment before the nation, and determined to throw every possible impediment in the way of the execution of his sinister plans. He had witnessed one instance of the summary punishments of the Indians, and now dreaded that his companion was to be selected for a second. In this dilemma, with little or no time for reflection, he suddenly determined to cloak his invaluable friend, at any or every hazard to himself. Before he had time, however, to speak, the question was repeated in a louder voice, and with a clearer utterance. "'Give us arms,' the young man haughtily replied, "'and place us in yonder woods.' 
our deed shall speak for us. This is the warrior whose name has filled our ears, returned the chief, regarding Hayward with that sort of curious interest which seems inseparable from man, when first beholding one of his fellows, to whom merit or accident, virtue or crime, has given notoriety. What has brought the white man into the camp of the Delawares? My necessities. I come for food, shelter, and friends. It cannot be. The woods are full of game. The head of a warrior needs no other shelter than a sky without clouds. And the Delawares are the enemies, and not the friends of the Yengeese. Go, the mouth had spoken, while the heart said nothing. Duncan, a little at a loss for what manner to proceed, remained silent. But the scout, who had listened attentively to all that had passed, now advanced steadily to the front. That I did not answer to the call for La Longue Caribbean was not owing either to shame or fear, he said, for neither one nor the other is the gift of an honest man. But I do not admit the right of the Mingos to bestow a name on one whose friends have been mindful of his gifts, in this particular, especially as their title is a lie, Kildeer being a grooved bear and no carabine. I am the man, however, that got the name of Nathaniel from my kin, the compliment of Hawkeye from the Delawares, who live on their own river, and whom the Iroquois have presumed to style the Long Rifle, without any warranty from him who is most concerned in the matter. The eyes of all present, which had hitherto been gravely scanning the person of Duncan, were now turned on the instant toward the upright iron frame of this new pretender to the distinguished appellation. It was in no degree remarkable that there should be found two who were willing to claim so great an honor, for impostors, the rare, were not unknown among the natives. But it was altogether material to the just and severe intentions of the Delawares that there should be no mistake in the matter. Some of their old men consulted together in private, and then, as it would seem, they determined to interrogate their visitor on the subject. "'My brother has said that a snake crept into my camp,' said the chief to Magua. "'Which is he?' The Huron pointed to the scout. "'Will a wise Delaware believe the barking of a wolf?' exclaimed Duncan, still more confirmed in the evil intentions of his ancient enemy. "'A dog never lies, but when was a wolf known to speak the truth?' The eyes of Magua flashed fire. But suddenly, recollecting the necessity of maintaining his presence of mind, he turned away in silent disdain, well assured that the sagacity of the Indians would not fail to extract the real merits of the point in controversy. He was not deceived, for after another short consultation, the wary Delaware turned to him again, and expressed the determination of the chiefs, though in the most considerate language. "'My brother has been called a liar,' he said, "'and his friends are angry. "'They will show that he has spoken the truth. "'Give my prisoners guns, "'and let them prove which is the man.' Magua affected to consider the expedient, which he well knew proceeded from distrust of himself, as a compliment, and made a gesture of acquiescence well content that his veracity should be supported by so skilful a marksman as the scout. The weapons were instantly placed in the hands of the friendly opponents, and they were bid to fire over the heads of the seated multitude and an earthen vessel, which lay, by accident, on a stump, some fifty yards from the place where they stood. Hayward smiled on himself at the idea of a competition with the scout, though he determined to persevere in the deception until apprised of the real designs of Magua. Raising his rifle with the utmost care, and renewing his aims three several times, he fired. The bullet cut the wood within a few inches of the vessel, and a gentle exclamation of satisfaction announced that the shot was considered a proof of great skill in the use of a weapon. Even Hawkeye nodded his head, as if he would say, it was better than he expected. But instead of manifesting an intention to contend with the successful marksman, he stood leaning on his rifle for more than a minute, like a man who was completely buried in thought. 
From this reverie he was, however, awakened by one of the young Indians, who had furnished the arms, and who now touched his shoulder, saying in exceedingly broken English, "'Can the pale face beat it?' "'Yes, Huron,' exclaimed the scout, raising the short rifle in his right hand, and shaking it at Magua, with as much apparent ease as if it were a reed. "'Yes, Huron, I could strike you now, and no power on earth could prevent the deed. The soaring hawk is not more certain of the dove than I am this moment of you, did I choose to send a bullet to your heart. Why should I not? Why? Because the gifts of my color forbid it, and I might draw down evil on tender and innocent heads. If you know such a being as God, thank him, therefore, in your inward soul, for you have reason. The flushed countenance, angry eye, and swelling figure of the scout produced a sensation of secret awe in all that hurt him. The Delawares held their breath in expectation, but Magua himself, even while he distrusted the forbearance of his enemy, remained immovable and calm where he stood wedged in by the crowd, as one who grew to the spot. "'Beat it!' repeated the young Delaware at the elbow of the scout. "'Beat what, fool? What?' exclaimed Hawkeye, still flourishing the weapon angrily above his head though his eye no longer sought the person of Magua. "'If the white man is the warrior he pretends,' said the aged chief, "'let him strike nigher to the mark.' The scout laughed aloud, a noise that produced the startling effect of an unnatural sound on Hayward. Then dropping the piece heavily into his extended left hand, it was discharged, apparently by the shock, driving the fragments of the vessel into the air, and scattering them on every side. Almost at the same instant, the rattling sound of the rifle was heard, as he suffered it to fall contemptuously to the earth. The first impression of so strange a scene was engrossing admiration. Then a low, but increasing murmur ran through the multitude, and finally swelled into sounds that denoted a lively opposition in the sentiments of the spectators. While some openly testified their satisfaction, at so unexampled dexterity. By far the larger portion of the tribe were inclined to believe the success of the shot was the result of accident. Hayward was not slow to confirm an opinion that was so favorable to his own pretensions. It was chance, he exclaimed. None can shoot without an aim. Chance, echoed the excited woodsman, who was now stubbornly bent on maintaining his identity at every hazard and on whom the secret hints of Hayward to acquiesce in the deception were entirely lost. Does yonder lying Huron too think it chance? Give him another gun, and place us face to face without cover or dodge, and let Providence and our own eyes decide the matter between us. I do not make the offer to you, Major, for our blood is of a color, and we serve the same master. That the Huron is a liar is very evident, returned Hayward coolly, you have yourself heard him assert you to be La Longue Caribbean. It were impossible to say what violent assertion the stubborn Hawkeye would have next made, in his headlong wish to vindicate his identity, had not the aged Delaware once more interposed. The hawk which comes from the clouds can return when he will, he said. Give them the guns. This time the scout seized the rifle with avidity, nor had Magua, though he watched the movements of the marksman with jealous eyes, any further cause for apprehension. Now let it be proved in the face of this tribe of Delawares which is the better man, cried the scout, tapping the butt of his piece with that finger which had pulled so many fatal triggers. You see that gourd hanging against yonder tree, Major? If you are a marksman fit for the borders, let me see you break its shell. Duncan noted the object and prepared himself to renew the trial. The gourd was one of the usual little vessels used by the Indians, and it was suspended from a dead branch of a small pine by a thong of deer skin at the full distance of a hundred yards. So strangely compounded is the feeling of self love that the young soldier, while he knew the utter worthlessness of the suffrages of his savage umpires, forgot the sudden motives of the contest in a wish to excel. It had been seen already that his skill was far from being contemptible, 
and he now resolved to put forth its nicest qualities. Had his life depended on the issue, the aim of Duncan could not have been more deliberate or guarded. He fired, and three or four young Indians, who sprang forward at the report, announced with a shout that the ball was in the tree, a very little on one side of the proper object. The warriors uttered a common ejaculation of pleasure, and then turned their eyes inquiringly on the movements of his rival. "'It may do for the Royal Americans,' said Hawkeye, laughing once more in his own silent, heartfelt manner. "'But had my gun often turned so much from the true line, Minnie and Martin, whose skin is now in a lady's muff, would still be in the woods. Ay, and then Minnie Bloody Mingo, who has departed to his final account, would be acting his deviltries at this very day atween the provinces. I hope the squaw who owns the gourd has more of them in her wigwam, for this will never hold water again. The scout had shook his priming, and cocked his piece while speaking, and, as he ended, he threw back a foot, and slowly raised the muzzle from the earth. The motion was steady, uniform, and in one direction. When on a perfect level it remained for a single moment, without tremor or variation, as though both man and rifle were carved in stone. During that stationary instant, he poured forth its contents in a bright glancing sheet of flame. Again the young Indians bounded forward, but their hurried search and disappointed looks announced that no traces of the bullet were to be seen. Go, said the old chief to the scout, in a tone of strong disgust. Thou art a wolf in the skin of a dog. I will talk to the long rifle of Yengeese. Ah, had I that piece which furnished the name you see, I would obligate myself to cut the thong and drop the gourd without breaking it, returned Hawkeye, perfectly undisturbed by the other's manners. Fools, if you would find the bullet of a sharpshooter in these woods, you must look in the object and not around it. The Indian youth instantly comprehended his meaning. For this time he spoke of the Delaware tongue, and tearing the gourd from the tree they held it on high with an exulting shout, displaying a hole in its bottom, which had been cut by the bullet after passing through the usual orifice in the center of its upper side. At this unexpected exhibition a loud and vehement expression of pleasure burst from the mouth of every warrior present. It decided the question and effectually established Hawkeye in the possession of his dangerous reputation. Those curious and admiring eyes, which had been turned again on Hayward, were finally directed to the weather-beaten form of the scout, who immediately became the principal object of attention to the simple and unsophisticated beings by whom he was surrounded. When the sudden and noisy commotion had a little subsided, the aged chief resumed his examination. "'Why did you wish to stop my ears?' he said, addressing Duncan. "'Are the Delawares fools that they could not know the young panther from the cat?' "'They will yet find the Huron a singing bird,' said Duncan, endeavoring to adopt the figurative language of the natives. "'It is good. We will know who can shut the ears of men.' "'Brother,' added the chief, turning his eyes on Magua, "'the Delawares listen.' "'Thus singled,' and directly called on to declare his object, the Huron arose, and advancing with great deliberation and dignity into the very center of the circle, where he stood confronted by the prisoners. He placed himself in an attitude to speak. Before opening his mouth, however, he bent his eyes slowly along the whole living boundary of earnest faces, as if to temper his expressions to the capacities of his audience. On Hawkeye, he cast a glance of respectful enmity. On Duncan, a look of inextinguishable hatred. The shrinking figure of Alice he scarcely deigned to notice. But when his glance met the firm, commanding, and yet lovely form of Cora, his eye lingered a moment, with an expression that it might have been difficult to define. Then, filled with his own dark intentions, he spoke in the language of the Canadas a tongue that he knew well was comprehended by most of his auditors. The spirit that made men colored them differently, commenced the subtle Huron. Some are blacker than the sluggish bear. These, he said, should be slaves. And he ordered them to work forever, like the beaver. 
You may hear them groan when the south wind blows, louder than the lowing buffaloes, along the shores of the great salt lake, where the big canoes come and go with them in droves. Some he made with faces paler than the ermine of the forests, and these he ordered to be traitors, dogs to their women, and wolves to their slaves. He gave this people the nature of the pigeon, wings that never tire, young, more plentiful than the leaves on the trees, and appetites to devour the earth. He gave them tongues like the false call of the wild cat, hearts like rabbits, the cunning of the hog, but none of the fox, and arms longer than the legs of the moose. With his tongue he stops the ears of the Indians. His heart teaches him to pay warriors to fight his battles. His cunning tells him how to get together the goods of the earth, and his arms enclose the land from the shores of the salt water to the islands of the great lake. His gluttony makes him sick. God gave him enough, and yet he wants all. Such are the pale faces. Some the great spirit made with skins brighter and redder than yon sun, continued Magua, pointing impressively upward to the lurid luminary, which was struggling through the misty atmosphere of the horizon. And these did he fashion to his own mind. He gave them this island as he had made it, covered with trees and filled with game. The wind made their clearings, the sun and rain ripened their fruits, and the snows came to tell them to be thankful. What need had they of roads to journey by? They saw through the hills. When the beavers worked, they lay in the shade and looked on. The winds cooled them in summer. In winter, skins kept them warm. If they fought among themselves, it was to prove that they were men. They were brave. They were just. They were happy. Here the speaker paused and looked again around him to discover if his legend had touched the sympathies of his listeners. He met everywhere, with eyes riveted on his own, heads erect and nostrils expanded, as if each individual present felt himself able and willing, singly, to redress the wrongs of his race. If the Great Spirit gave different tongues to his red children, he continued in a low, still melancholy voice, it was all that animals might understand them. Some he placed among the snows, with her cousin the bear. Some he placed near the setting sun, on the road to the happy hunting grounds. Some on the lands around the great fresh waters. But to his greatest and most beloved, he gave the sands of the salt lake. Do my brothers know the name of this favored people? It was the Lenape, exclaimed twenty eager voices in a breath. It was the Lenny Lenape, returned Magua, affecting to bend his head in reverence to their former greatness. It was the tribes of the Lenape. The sun rose from water that was salt, and set in water that was sweet, and never hid himself from their eyes. But why should I, a Huron of the woods, tell a wise people their own traditions? Why remind them of their injuries, their ancient greatness, their deeds, their glory, their happiness, their losses, their defeats, their misery. Is there not one among them who has seen it all, and who knows it to be true? I have done. My tongue is still, for my heart is of lead. I listen. As the voice of the speaker suddenly ceased, every face and all eyes turned by a common movement toward the venerable Tamanund, from the moment that he took his seat until the present instant. The lips of the patriarch had not severed, and scarcely a sign of life had escaped him. He sat bent in feebleness, and apparently unconscious of the presence he was in, during the whole of that opening scene in which the skill of the scout had been so clearly established. At the nicely graduated sound of Magua's voice, however, he betrayed some evidence of consciousness and once or twice he even raised his head, as if to listen. But when the crafty Huron spoke of his nation by name, the eyelids of the old man raised themselves, and he looked out upon the multitude with that sort of dull, unmeaning expression which might be supposed to belong to the countenance of a specter. 
Then he made an effort to rise, and being upheld by his supporters, he gained his feet, in a posture commanding by its dignity, while he tottered with weakness. "'Who calls upon the children of the Lenape?' he said in a deep guttural voice, that was rendered awfully audible by the breathless silence of the multitude. "'Who speaks of things gone? Does not the egg become a worm, the worm a fly, and perish?' Why tell the Delawares of good that is past? Better thank the Manitou for that which remains. It is a Wyandot, said Magua, stepping nigher to the rude platform on which the other stood, a friend of Tamanund. A friend, repeated the sage, on whose brow a dark frown settled, imparting a portion of that severity which had rendered his eyes so terrible in middle age. Are the Mingos rulers of the earth? What brings a Huron in here? Justice. His prisoners are with his brothers, and he comes for his own. Tamanund turned his head toward one of his supporters, and listened to the short explanation the man gave. Then facing the applicant, he regarded him a moment with deep attention, after which he said in a low and reluctant voice, Justice is the law of the great Manitou. My children give the stranger food. Then, Huron, take thine own and depart. On the delivery of this solemn judgment, the patriarch seated himself, and closed his eyes again, as if better pleased with the images of his own ripened experience than with the visible objects of the world. Against such a decree there was no Delaware sufficiently hardy to murmur, much less oppose himself. The words were barely uttered when four or five of the younger warriors Stepping behind Hayward and the scout, passed Thong so dexterously and rapidly around their arms as to hold them both in instant bondage. The former was too much engrossed with his precious and nearly insensible burden to be aware of their intentions before they were executed, and the latter, who considered even the hostile tribes of the Delawares a superior race of beings, admitted without resistance. Perhaps, however, the manner of the scout would not have been so passive had he fully comprehended the language in which the preceding dialogue had been conducted. Magua cast a look of triumph around the whole assembly before he proceeded to the execution of his purpose. Perceiving that the men were unable to offer any resistance, he turned his looks on her he valued most. Cora met his gaze with an eye so calm and firm that his resolution wavered. Then recollecting his former artifice, he raised Alice from the arms of the warrior against whom she leaned, and beckoning Hayward to follow, he motioned for the encircling crowd to open. But Cora, instead of obeying the impulse he had expected, rushed to the feet of the patriarch, and raising her voice exclaimed aloud, Just and venerable Delaware, on thy wisdom and power we lean for mercy. Be deaf to yonder artful and remorseless monster, who poison thy ears with falsehoods to feed his thirst for blood. Thou that hast lived long, and thou that hast seen the evil of the world, should know how to temper its calamities to the miserable. The eyes of the old man opened heavily, and he once more looked upward at the multitude. As the piercing tones of the supplicant swelled on his ears, they moved slowly in the direction of her person, and finally settled there in a steady gaze. Cora had cast herself to her knees, and with hands clenched in each other and pressed upon her bosom, she remained like a beauteous and breathing model of her sex, looking up in his faded but majestic countenance, with a species of holy reverence. Gradually the expression of Tamanon's features changed, and losing their vacancy in admiration, they alighted with a portion of that intelligence which a century before had been wont to communicate his youthful fire to the extensive bands of the Delawares. Rising without assistance, and seemingly without an effort, he demanded in a voice that startled its orators by its firmness, What art thou? A woman, one of a hated race, if thou wilt, a Yingi. But one who has never harmed thee, and who cannot harm thy people if she would, who asks for succor. Tell me, my children, continued the patriarch hoarsely, motioning to those around him, though his eyes still dwelt upon the kneeling form of Cora. Where have the Delawares camped? In the mountains of the Iroquois. 
behind the clear springs of the hurricane. Many parching summers are come and gone, continued the sage, since I drank of the waters of my own rivers. The children of Minquan are the justest white men, but they were thirsty and they took it to themselves. Do they follow us so far? Footnote. William Penn was termed Minquan by the Delawares, and, as he never used violence or injustice in his dealings with them, his reputation for probity passed into a proverb. The American is justly proud of the origin of his nation, which is perhaps unequalled in the history of the world. But the Pennsylvanian and Jerseymen have more reason to value themselves in their ancestors than the natives of any other state, since no wrong was done the original owners of the soil. And footnote. We follow none, we covet nothing, answered Cora. Captives against our wills have we been brought amongst you, and we ask but permission to part to our own in peace. Art thou not Tamanund, the father, the judge, I had almost said the prophet of this people? I am Tamanund of many days. Tis now some seven years that one of my people was at the mercy of a white chief on the borders of this province. He claimed to be of the blood of the good and just Tamanund. Go, said the white man, for thy parents' sake thou art free. Dost thou remember the name of that English warrior? I remember that, when a laughing boy, returned the patriarch with a peculiar recollection of vast age, I stood upon the sands of the seashore, and saw a big canoe, with wings whiter than the swans, and whiter than many eagles, come from the rising sun. Nay, nay, I speak not of a time so very distant, but of favor shown to thy kindred by one of mine, within the memory of thy youngest warrior. Was it when the Yankees and the Dutchmen fall for the hunting grounds of the Delawares, when Tamanund was a chief and first laid aside the bow for the lightning of the pale faces? Not yet then, interrupted Cora, by many ages, I speak of a thing of yesterday. Surely, surely you forget it not. It was but yesterday, rejoined the aged man with touching pathos, that the children of the Lenape were masters of the world, the fishes of the salt lake. The birds, the beast, and the Menji of the woods owned them for sagamores. Cora bowed her head in disappointment, and for a bitter moment struggled with her chagrin. Then, elevating her rich features and beaming eyes, she continued, in tones scarcely less penetrating than the unearthly voice of the patriarch himself, Tell me, is Tamanunda father? The old man looked down upon her from his elevated stand with a benign smile on his wasted countenance, and then casting his eyes slowly over the whole assemblage, he answered, Of a nation. For myself I ask nothing, like thee and thine venerable chief, she continued, pressing her hands convulsively on her heart, and suffering her head to droop until her burning cheeks, nearly concealed in the maze of dark, glossy tresses, that fell in disorder upon her shoulders. The curse of my ancestors has fallen heavily on their child. Beyond her is one who has never known the weight of heaven's displeasure until now. She is the daughter of an old and failing man, whose days are near their clothes. She has many, very many, who do love her and delight in her, and she is too good, much too precious, to become the victim of that villain. I know that the pale faces are a proud and hungry race. I know that they claim not only to have the earth, but that the meanest of their color is better than the sachems of the red man. The dogs and crows of their tribes, continued the earnest old chieftain, without heeding the wounded spirit of his listener, whose head was nearly crushed to the earth in shame, as he proceeded, would bark and caw before they would take a woman to their wigwams, whose blood was not the color of snow. But let them not boast before the face of the Manitou too loud. They entered the land at the rising, and may yet go off at the setting sun. Often seen the locusts strip the leaves from the trees, but the season of blossoms has always come again. It is so, said Cora, drawing a long breath as if reviving from a trance, raising her face and shaking back her shining veil, with a kindling eye that contradicted the death-like paleness of her countenance. But why? It is not permitted us to acquire. 
There is yet one of thine own people who has not been brought before thee. Before thou lettest the Huron depart in triumph, hear him speak. Observing Tamanant to look about him doubtingly, one of his companions said, It is a snake, a red skin in the pay of the Yiggies. We keep him for the torture. Let him come, returned the sage. The Tamanund once more sank into his seat, and a silence so deep prevailed while the young man prepared to obey his simple mandate, that the leaves which fluttered in the draught of the light morning air were distinctly heard rustling in the surrounding forest. End of chapter 29「ジャパンスクリエイティブ・ブロードバンド」「ジャパンスクリエイティブ・ブロードバンド」「ジャパンスクリエイティブ・ブロードバンド」「ジャパンスクリエイティブ・ブロードバンド」「ジャパンスクリエイティブ・ブロードバンド」「ジャパンスクリエイティブ・ブロー The silence continued unbroken by human sounds for many anxious minutes. Then the waving multitude opened and shut again, and Uncas stood in the living circle. All those eyes which had been curiously studying the lineaments of the sage as the source of their own intelligence turned on the instant and were now bent in secret admiration on the erect, agile, and faultless person of the captive. But neither the presence in which he found himself nor the exclusive attention that he attracted. In any manner disturbed the self possession of the young Mohican. He cast a deliberate and observing look on every side of him, meeting the settled expression of hostility that lowered in the visages of the chiefs with the same calmness as the curious gaze of the attentive children. But when, last in his haughty scrutiny, the person of Tamanund came under his glance, his eye became fixed, as though all other objects were already forgotten. Then, advancing with a slow and noiseless step up to the area, He placed himself immediately before the footstool of the sage. Here he stood unnoted, though keenly observant himself, until one of the chiefs appraised the latter of his presence. With what tongue does the prisoner speak to the Manitou? demanded the patriarch without unclosing his eyes. Like his father, Uncas replied, with the tongue of a Delaware. At this sudden and unexpected annunciation, a low, fierce yell ran through the multitude. That might not inaptly be compared to the growl of the lion, as his collar is first awakened, a fearful omen of the weight of his further anger. The effect was equally strong on the sage, though differently exhibited. He passed a hand before his eyes, as if to exclude the least evidence of so shameful a spectacle, while he repeated in his low, guttural tones the words he had just heard A Delaware? I have lived to see the tribes of the Lenape driven from their council fires and scattered. Like broken herds of deer among the hills of the Iroquois, I have seen the hatchets of the strong people sweep woods from the valleys that the winds of heaven have spared. The beasts that run on the mountains and the birds that fly above the trees have I seen living in the wigwams of men, but never before have I found a Delaware so base as to creep like a poisonous serpent into the camps of his own nation. The singing birds have opened their bills, returned Uncas in the softest notes of his own musical voice. And Tamanund has heard their song. The sage started and bent his head aside as if to catch the fleeting sounds of some passing melody. Does Tamanund dream? he exclaimed. What voice is at his ear? Have the winters gone backward? Will Seltmer come again to the children of the Lenape? A solemn and respectful silence succeeded this incoherent burst from the lips of the Delaware prophet. His people readily constructed his unintelligible language into one of those. Mysterious conferences he was believed to hold so frequently with the superior intelligence, and they awaited the issue of the revelation in awe. After a patient pause, however, one of the aged men, perceiving that the sage had lost the recollection of the subject before them, ventured to remind him again of the presence of the prisoner. False Delaware trembles lest he should hear the words of Tamanund, he said. Tis a hound that howls when the Yenga Sea show him a trail. And ye, returned Uncas, Looking sternly about him, are dogs that whine when the Frenchman casts ye the offals of his deer. 
Twenty knives gleamed in the air, and as many warriors sprang to their feet at this biting and perhaps merited retort. But a motion from one of the chiefs suppressed the outbreaking of the tempers and restored the appearance of quiet. The task might probably have been more difficult, had not a movement made by Tamanund indicated that he was again about to speak. Delaware, resumed the sage, little art thou worthy of thy name. My people have not seen a bright sun in many winters, and the warrior who deserts his tribe when hid in clouds is doubly a traitor. The law of the Manitou is just. It is so, while the rivers run and the mountains stand, while the blossoms come and go on the trees, it must be so. He is thine, my children. Deal justly by him. Not a limb was moved, nor was a breath drawn louder and longer than common, until the closing syllable of this final decree had passed the lips of Tamanund. Then a cry of vengeance burst at once, as it might be, from the united lips of the nation, a frightful augury of their ruthless intentions. In the midst of these prolonged and savage yells, a chief proclaimed in a high voice that the captive was condemned to endure the dreadful trial of torture by fire. The circle broke its order, and screams of delight mingled with the bustle and tumult of preparation. Hayward struggled madly with his captors. The anxious eye of Hawkeye began to look around him with an expression of peculiar earnestness, and Cora again threw herself at the feet of the patriarch, once more a suppliant for mercy. Throughout the whole of these trying moments, Uncas had alone preserved his serenity. He looked on the preparations with a steady eye, and when the tormentors came to seize him, he met them with a firm and upright attitude. One among them, if possible more fierce and savage than his fellows, seized the hunting shirt of the young warrior, and at a single effort tore it from his body. Then, with a yell of frantic pleasure, he leaped toward his unresisting victim and prepared to lead him to the stake. But at that moment, when he appeared most a stranger to the feelings of humanity, the purpose of the savage was arrested as suddenly as if a supernatural agency had interposed on the behalf of Uncas. The eyeballs of the Delaware seemed to start from their sockets. His mouth opened, and his whole form became frozen in an attitude of amazement. Raising his hand with a slow and regulated motion, he pointed with a finger to the bosom of the captive. His companions crowded about him in wonder, and every eye was like his own, fastened intently on the figure of a small tortoise, beautifully tattooed on the breast of the prisoner, in a bright blue tint. For a single instant Uncas enjoyed his triumph, smiling calmly on the scene. Then, motioning the crowd away with a high and haughty sweep of his arm, he advanced in front of the nation with the air of a king, and spoke in a voice louder than the murmur of admiration that ran through the multitude. "'Men of the Lanai Lenape,' he said, "'my race upholds the earth. Your feeble tribe stands on a shell. What fire that a Delaware can light could burn the child of my father's?' he added, pointing proudly to the simple blazonry on his skin. "'The blood that came from such a stock would smother your flames. My race is the grandfather of nations.' "'Who art thou?' demanded Tamanund, rising at the startling tones he heard more than at any meaning conveyed by the language of the prisoner. "'Uncas, the son of Chingachgook,' answered the captive modestly, turning from the nation and bending his head in reverence to the other's character and years, a son of the great Unamis, Turtle. "'Hour of Tamanund is nigh,' exclaimed the sage. "'The day is come at last to the night. I thank the Manitou that one is here to fill my place at the council fire. Uncas, the child of Uncas, is found.' but the eyes of a dying eagle gaze on the rising sun. The youth stepped lightly but proudly on the platform, where he became visible to the whole agitated and wondering multitude. Tamanund held him long at the length of his arm, and read every turn in the fine lineaments of his countenance, with the untiring gaze of one who recalled days of happiness. "'Is Tamanund a boy?' at length the bewildered prophet exclaimed. "'Have I dreamed of so many snows?' that my people were scattered like floating sands, of Yengesi, more plenty than the leaves of the trees. The arrow of Tamanund would not frighten the fawn. His arm is withered like the branch of a dead oak. The snail would be swifter in the race. Yet as Uncas before him as they went to battle against the pale faces, Uncas, the panther of his tribe, the eldest son of the Lenape, the wisest sagamore of the Mohicans. Tell me, ye Delawares, has Tamanund been a sleeper for a hundred winters? The calm and deep silence which succeeded these words sufficiently announced the awful reverence with which his people received the communication of the patriarch. None dared to answer, 
though all listened in breathless expectation of what might follow. Uncas, however, looking in his face with the fondness and veneration of a favored child, presumed on his own high and acknowledged rank to reply. Four warriors of his race have lived and died, he said, since the friend of Tamanund led his people in battle. The blood of the turtle has been in many chiefs, but all have gone back into the earth from whence they came, save Chingachgook and his son. It is true, it is true, returned the sage, a flash of recollection destroying all his pleasing fancies and restoring him at once to a consciousness of the true history of his nation. Our wise men have often said that two warriors of the unchanged race were in the hills of the Yangesi. Why have their seats at the council fires of the Delawares been so long empty? At these words the young man raised his head, which he had still kept bowed a little in reverence, and lifting his voice so as to be heard by the multitude, as if to explain at once and forever the policy of his family, he said aloud, Once we slept where we could hear the salt lake speak in its anger. Then we were rulers and sagamores over the land. But when a pale face was seen on every brook, we followed the deer back to the river of our nation. The Delawares were gone. Few warriors of them all stayed to drink of the stream they loved. Then said my fathers, Here we will hunt. The waters of the river go into the salt lake. If we go towards the setting sun, we shall find streams that run into the great lakes of sweet water. There would a Mohican die, like fishes of the sea in the clear springs. When the man is who is ready and shall say, Come, we will follow the river to the sea and take our own again. Such, Delawares, is the belief of the children of the turtle. Our eyes are on the rising and not toward the setting sun. We know whence he comes. We know not whither he goes. It is enough. The men of the Lenape listened to his words with all the respect the superstition could lend, finding a secret charm even in the figurative language with which the young Sagamore imparted his ideas. Uncas himself watched the effect of his brief explanation with intelligent eyes, and gradually dropped the air of authority he had assumed, as he perceived that his auditors were content. Then, permitting his looks to wander over the silent throng that crowded around the elevated seat of Tamanund, he first perceived Hawkeye in his bonds. Stepping eagerly from his stand, he made way for himself to the side of his friend, and cutting his thongs with a quick and angry stroke of his own knife, he motioned to the crowd to divide. The Indians silently obeyed, and once more they stood ranged in their circle, as before his appearance among them. Uncas took the scout by the hand and led him to the feet of the patriarch. Father, he said, look at this pale face, a just man and the friend of the Delawares. Is he a son of Menquon? Not so, a warrior known to the Yengesi and feared by the Maqua. What name has he gained by his deeds? We call him Hawkeye, Uncas replied, using the Delaware phrase for his sight never fails. The Mingos know him better by the death he gives their warriors. With him, he is the long rifle. The long carabina? exclaimed Tam Anand, opening his eyes and regarding the scout sternly. My son has not done well to call him a friend. I call him so who proves himself such, returned the young chief with great calmness, but with a steady mien. If Uncas is welcome among the Delawares, then is Hawkeye with his friends. The pale face has slain my young men, his name is great for the blows he has struck the Lenape. If a Mingo has whispered that much in the ear of the Delaware, he has only shown that he is a singing bird, said the scout, who now believed that it was time to vindicate himself from such offensive charges, and who spoke as the man he addressed, modifying his Indian figures, however, with his own peculiar notions. That I have slain the Maqua, I am not the man to deny, even at their own council fires, but that knowingly my hand has ever harmed a Delaware— is opposed to the reasons of my gifts, which is friendly to them and all that belongs to their nation. A low exclamation of applause passed among the warriors who exchanged looks with each other like men that first began to perceive their error. "'Where is the Huron?' demanded Tamanund. "'Has he stopped my ears?' Magua, whose feelings during that scene in which Uncas had triumphed may be much better imagined than described, answered to the call by stepping boldly in front of the patriarch. The just Tamanund, he said, will not keep what a Huron has lent. Tell me, my brother, returned the sage, avoiding the dark countenance of Le Soutil, and turning gladly to the more ingenious features of Uncas, has the stranger a conqueror's right over you? He has none. The panther may get into snares set by the women, but he is strong and knows how to leap through them. La longue carabine laughs at the Mingos. Go, Huron, ask your squaws the color of a bear. 
the stranger and white maiden that come into my camp together, should journey on an open path, and the woman that Hurons left with my warriors? Uncas made no reply. And the woman that the Mingo has brought into my camp, repeated Tamanunt gravely. She is mine, cried Magua, shaking his hand in triumph at Uncas. Mohican, you know that she is mine. My son is silent, said Tamanunt, endeavoring to read the expression of the face that the youth turned from him in sorrow. It is so, was the low answer. A short and impressive pause succeeded, during which it was very apparent with what reluctance the multitude admitted the justice of the Mingo's claim. At length the sage, on whom alone the justice depended, said in a firm voice, Huron, depart. As he came, just Tamanund, demanded the wily Magua, or with hands filled with the faith of the Delawares, the wigwam of Le Renard Soutil is empty, make him strong with his own. The aged man mused with himself for a time, and then bending his head toward one of his venerable companions, he asked, Are my ears open? It is true. Is this Mingo a chief? The first in his nation. Girl, what wouldst thou? A great warrior takes thee to wife. Go, thy race will not end. Better a thousand times that it should, exclaimed the horror-struck Cora, than meet with such a degradation. Huron, her mind is in the tents of her father's. An unwilling maiden makes an unhappy wigwam. She speaks with the tongue of her people, returned Magua, regarding his victim with a look of bitter irony. She is of the race of traitors, and will bargain for a bright look. Let Tamanun speak the words. Take you the wampum and our love. Nothing hence but what Magua brought hither. Then depart with thine own. The great Manitou forbids that a Delaware should be unjust. Magua advanced and seized his captain strongly by the arm. The Delawares fell back in silence, and Cora, as if conscious that remonstrance would be useless, prepared to submit to her fate without resistance. "'Hold! hold!' cried Duncan, springing forward. "'Huron, have mercy! Her ransom shall make thee richer than any of thy people were ever yet known to be. Magua is a redskin. He wants not the beads of the pale faces.' Gold, silver, power, lead, all that a warrior needs shall be in thy wigwam, all that becomes the greatest chief. Le Soutil is very strong, cried Magua, violently shaking the hand which grasped the unresisting arm of Cora. He has his revenge. Mighty ruler of providence, exclaimed Hayward, clasping his hands together in agony. Can this be suffered? To you, just Tamanunt, I appeal for mercy. The words of the Delaware are said, returned the sage closing his eyes, and dropping back into his seat, alike wearied with his mental and his bodily exertion. Men speak not twice. That a chief should not misspend his time in unsaying what has once been spoken is wise and reasonable, said Hawkeye, motioning to Duncan to be silent. But it is also prudent in every warrior to consider well before he strikes his tomahawk into the head of his prisoner. Huron, I love you not, nor can I say that any Mingo has ever received much of favor at my hands. It is fair to conclude that, if this war does not soon end, many more of your warriors will meet me in the woods. Put it to your judgment, then, whether you would prefer taking such a prisoner as that into your encampment, or one like myself, who am a man that it would greatly rejoice your nation to see with naked hands. Will the long rifle give his life for the woman? demanded Magua hesitatingly, for he had already made a motion toward quitting the place with his victim. No, I have not said so much as that, returned Hawkeye drawing back with suitable discretion, when he noted the eagerness with which Magua listened to his proposal, it would be an unequal exchange to give a warrior in the prime of his life and usefulness for the best woman on the frontiers, and might consent to go into winter quarters now, at least six weeks before the leaves will turn, on condition you will release the maiden. Magua shook his head and made an impatient sign for the crowd to open. Well, then, added the scout, with the musing air of a man who had not half made up his mind, I will throw Kildeer into the bargain. Take the word of an experienced hunter. The peace is not its equal between the provinces. Mog was still disdained to reply, continuing his efforts to disperse the crowd. Perhaps, added the scout, losing his dissembled coolness exactly in proportion, as the other manifested an indifference to the exchange, if I should condition to teach your young men the real virtue of the weapon, it would smooth the little differences in our judgments. 
the renard fiercely ordered the delawares who still lingered in an impenetrable belt around him in hopes he would listen to the amicable proposal to open his path threatening by the glance of his eye another appeal to the infallible justice of their prophet what is ordered must sooner or later arrive continued hawkeye turning with a sad and humbled look to uncas the varlet knows his advantage and will keep it god bless you boy you have found friends among your natural kin and i hope they will prove as true as some you have met who had no indian cross as for me sooner or later i must die it is therefore fortunate there are but few to make my death howl after all it is likely the imps would have managed to master my scalp so a day or two will make no great difference in the everlasting reckoning of time god bless you added the rugged woodsman bending his head aside and then instantly changing his direction again with a wistful look toward the youth i loved both you and your father uncas though our skins were not altogether of a color and our gifts are somewhat different tell the sagamore i never lost sight of him in my greatest trouble and as for you think of me sometimes when on a lucky trail and depend on it boy whether there be one heaven or two there is a path in the other world by which honest men may come together again you'll find the rifle in the place we hid it take it and keep it for my sake and hark ye lad as your natural gifts don't deny you the use of vengeance use it a little freely on the mingos it may unburden griefs at my loss and ease your mind hereon i accept your offer release the woman i am your prisoner a suppressed but still distinct murmur of approbation ran through the crowd at this generous proposition even the fiercest among the delaware warriors manifesting pleasure at the manliness of the intended sacrifice magua paused and for an anxious moment it might be said he doubted then casting his eyes on cora with an expression in which ferocity and admiration were strangely mingled his purpose became fixed forever he intimated his contempt of the offer with a backward motion of his head and said in a steady and settled voice the renard soutil is a great chief he has but one mind come he added laying his hand too familiarly on the shoulder of his captive to urge her onward the huron is no tattler we will go the maiden drew back in lofty womanly reserve and her dark eye kindled while the rich blood shot like the passing brightness of the sun into her very temples at the indignity i am your prisoner and at a fitting time shall be ready to follow even to my death but violence is unnecessary she coldly said and immediately turning to hawkeye added generous hunter from my soul i thank you your offer is vain neither could it be accepted but still you may serve me even more than in your own noble intention look at that drooping humble child abandon her not until you leave her in the habitations of civilized men i will not say wringing the hard hand of the scout that her father will reward you for such as you are above the rewards of men but he will thank you and bless you and believe me the blessing of a just and aged man has virtue in the sight of heaven would to god i could hear one word from his lips at this awful moment her voice became choked and for an instant she was silent then advancing a step nigher to duncan who was supporting her unconscious sister she continued in more subdued tones but in which feelings and the habits of her sex maintained a fearful struggle i need not tell you to cherish the treasure you will possess you love her haywood that would conceal a thousand faults though she had them she is kind gentle sweet good as mortal may be there is not a blemish in mind or person at which the proudest of you all would sicken she is fair oh how surpassingly fair laying her own beautiful but less brilliant hand in melancholy affection on the alabaster forehead of alice and parting the golden hair which clustered above her brows and yet her soul is pure and spotless as her skin i would say much more perhaps than cooler reason would approve but i will spare you and myself her voice became inaudible and her face was bent over the form of her sister after a long and burning kiss she arose and with features of the hue of death but without even a tear on her feverish eyes she turned away and added to the savage with all her former elevation of manner now sir if it be your pleasure i will follow ay go cried duncan placing alice in the arms of an indian girl go magua go these delawares have their laws which forbid them to detain you but i i have no such obligation go malignant monster why do you delay it would be difficult to describe the expression with which magua listened to this threat to follow there was at first a fierce and manifest display of joy 
and then it was instantly subdued in a look of cunning coldness. "'The woods are open,' he was content with answering. "'The open hand can come.' "'Hold!' cried Hawkeye, seizing Duncan by the arm and detaining him by violence. "'You know not the craft of the imp. He would lead you to an ambushment in your death.' "'Huron,' interrupted Uncas, who, submissive to the stern customs of his people, had been an attentive and grave listener to all that passed. "'Huron, the justice of the Delawares comes from the Manitou. Look at the sun. He is now in the upper branches of the hemlock. Your path is short and open. When he is seen above the trees, there will be men on your trail.' "'I hear a crow!' exclaimed Magua, with a taunting laugh. "'Go!' he added, shaking his hand at the crowd, which had slowly opened to admit his passage. Where are the petticoats of the Delawares? Let them send their arrows and their guns to the wine knots. They shall have venison to eat and corn to hoe. Dogs, rabbits, thieves, I spit on you. His parting jibes were listened to in a dead and boding silence, and with these biting words in his mouth, the triumphant Magua passed unmolested into the forest, followed by his passive captive and protected by the inviolable laws of Indian hospitality. End of chapter 30
Manitou, 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 thou art great, thou art good, thou art wise. Manitou, Manitou, thou art just. In the heavens and the clouds, oh, I see many spots, many dark, many red. In the heavens, oh, I see many clouds. In the woods, in the air, oh, I hear the whoop, the long yell, and the cry. In the woods, oh, I hear the loud whoop. Manitou, 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 I am weak, thou art strong. I am slow, Manitou, Manitou, give me aid. At the end of what might be called each verse, he made a pause by raising a note louder and longer than common that was peculiarly suited to the sentiment just expressed. The first close was solemn and intended to convey the idea of veneration. The second descriptive, bordering on the alarming, and the third was the well-known and terrific war-whoop, which burst from the lips of the young warrior like a combination of all the frightful sounds of battle. The last was like the first, humble and imploring. Three times did he repeat this song, and as often did he encircle the post in his dance. At the close of the first turn, a grave and highly esteemed chief of the Lenape followed his example, singing words of his own, however, to music of a similar character. Warrior after warrior enlisted in the dance, until all of any renown and authority were numbered in its mazes. The spectacle now became wildly terrific, the fierce-looking and menacing visages of the chiefs receiving additional power from the appalling strains in which they mingled their guttural tones. Just then, Uncas struck his tomahawk deep into the post and raised his voice in a shout, which might be termed his own battle-cry. The act announced that he had assumed the chief authority in the intended expedition. It was a signal that awakened all the slumbering passions of the nation. A hundred youths, who had hitherto been restrained by the diffidence of their years, rushed in a frantic body on the fancied emblem of their enemy, and severed it asunder, splinter by splinter, until nothing remained of the trunk but its roots in the earth. During this moment of tumult, the most ruthless deeds of war were performed on the fragments of the tree, with as much apparent ferocity as if they were the living victims of their cruelty. Some were scalped, some received the keen and trembling axe, and others suffered by thrusts from the fatal knife. In short, the manifestations of zeal and fierce delight were so great and unequivocal that the expedition was declared to be a war of the nation. The instant Uncas had struck the blow, he moved out of the circle and cast his eyes up to the sun, which was just gaining the point when the truce with Magua was to end. The fact was soon announced by a significant gesture, accompanied by a corresponding cry, and the whole of the excited multitude abandoned their mimic warfare with shrill yells of pleasure to prepare for the more hazardous experiment of the reality. The whole face of the encampment was instantly changed. The warriors, who were already armed and painted, became as still as if they were incapable of any uncommon burst of emotion. On the other hand, the women broke out of the lodges with the songs of joy and those of lamentation so strangely mixed that it might have been difficult to have said which passion preponderated. None, however, was idle. Some bore their choicest articles, others their young, and some their aged and infirm into the forest, which spread itself like a verdant carpet of bright green against the side of the mountain. Thither Tamanund also retired with calm composure after a short and touching interview with Uncas, from whom the sage separated with the reluctance that a parent would quit a long-lost and just-recovered child. In the meantime, Duncan saw Alice to a place of safety, and then sought the scout with a countenance that denoted how eagerly he also panted for the approaching contest. But Hawkeye was too much accustomed to the war-song and the enlistments of the natives to betray any interest in the passing scene. He merely cast an occasional look at the number and quality of the warriors, who from time to time signified their readiness to accompany Uncas to the field. In this particular he was soon satisfied, for, as has been already seen, the power of the young chief quickly embraced every fighting man in the nation. 
After this material point was so satisfactorily decided, he dispatched an Indian boy in quest of Kildeer and the rifle of Uncas to the place where they had deposited their weapons on approaching the camp of the Delawares, a measure of double policy, inasmuch as it protected the arms from their own fate, if detained as prisoners, and gave them the advantage of appearing among the strangers rather as sufferers than as men provided with means of defense and subsistence. In selecting another to perform the office of reclaiming his highly prized rifle, the scout had lost sight of none of his habitual caution. He knew that Magua had not come unattended, and he also knew that Huron spies watched the movements of their new enemies along the whole boundary of the woods. It would, therefore, have been fatal to himself to have attempted the experiment. A warrior would have fared no better, but the danger of a boy would not be likely to commence until after his object was discovered. When Hayward joined him, the scout was coolly awaiting the result of this experiment. The boy, who had been well instructed and was sufficiently crafty, proceeded, with a bosom that was swelling with the pride of such a confidence, and all the hopes of young ambition, carelessly across the clearing to the wood, which he entered at a point of some little distance from the place where the guns were secreted. The instant, however, he was concealed by the foliage of the bushes, his dusky form was to be seen gliding, like that of a serpent, toward the desired treasure. He was successful and in another moment he appeared flying across the narrow opening that skirted the base of the terrace on which the village stood, with the velocity of an arrow, and bearing a prize in each hand. He had actually gained the crags and was leaping up their sides with incredible activity, when a shot from the woods showed how accurate had been the judgment of the scout. The boy answered it with a feeble but contemptuous shout, and immediately a second bullet was sent after him from another part of the cover. At the next instant he appeared on the level above, elevating his guns in triumph, while he moved with the air of a conqueror toward the renowned hunter who had honored him by so glorious a commission. Notwithstanding the lively interest Hawkeye had taken in the fate of his messenger, he received Kildeer with a satisfaction that, momentarily, drove all other recollections from his mind. After examining the piece with an intelligent eye, and opening and shutting the pan some ten or fifteen times, and trying sundry other equally important experiments on the lock, he turned to the boy, and demanded with great manifestations of kindness if he was hurt. The urchin looked proudly up in his face, but made no reply. "'Ah, I see, lad, the knaves have barked your arm,' added the scout, taking up the limb of the patient sufferer, across which a deep flesh wound had been made by one of the bullets. But a little bruised alder will act like a charm. In the meantime, I will wrap it in a badge of wampum. You have commenced the business of a warrior early, my brave boy, and are likely to bear a plenty of honorable scars to your grave. I know many young men that have taken scalps who cannot show such a mark as this. Go, having bound up the arm, you will be a chief." The lad departed, prouder of his flowing blood than the vainest courtier could be of his blushing ribbon, and stalked among the fellows of his age, an object of general admiration and envy. But in a moment of so many serious and important duties, this single act of juvenile fortitude did not attract the general notice and commendation it would have received under milder auspices. It had, however, served to apprise the Delawares of the position and intentions of their enemies. Accordingly, a party of adventurers, better suited to the task than the weak though spirited boy, was ordered to dislodge the skulkers. The duty was soon performed, for most of the Hurons retired of themselves when they found they had been discovered. The Delawares followed to a sufficient distance from their own encampment, and then halted for orders apprehensive of being led into an ambush. As both parties secreted themselves, the woods were again as still and quiet as a mild summer morning and deep solitude could render them. The calm but still impatient Uncas now collected his chiefs and divided his power. He presented Hawkeye as a warrior, often tried and always found deserving of confidence. When he found his friend met with a favorable reception, he bestowed on him the command of twenty men, like himself, active, skillful, and resolute. 
he gave the Delawares to understand the rank of Hayward among the troops of the Yengis, and then tendered to him a trust of equal authority. But Duncan declined the charge, professing his readiness to serve as a volunteer by the side of the scout. After this disposition, the young Mohican appointed various native chiefs to fill the different situations of responsibility, and, the time pressing, he gave forth the word to march. He was cheerfully but silently obeyed by more than two hundred men. Their entrance into the forest was perfectly unmolested, nor did they encounter any living objects that could either give the alarm or furnish the intelligence they needed until they came upon the lairs of their own scouts. Here a halt was ordered, and the chiefs were assembled to hold a whispering council. At this meeting diverse plans of operation were suggested, though none of a character to meet the wishes of their ardent leader. Had Uncas followed the promptings of his own inclinations, he would have led his followers to the charge without a moment's delay, and put the conflict to the hazard of an instant issue. But such a course would have been in opposition to all the received practices and opinions of his countrymen. He was, therefore, fain to adopt a caution that in the present temper of his mind he execrated, and to listen to advice at which his fiery spirit chafed under the vivid recollection of Cora's danger and Magua's insolence. After an unsatisfactory conference of many minutes, a solitary individual was seen advancing from the side of the enemy, with such apparent haste as to induce the belief he might be a messenger charged with pacific overtures. When within a hundred yards, however, of the cover behind which the Delaware Council had assembled, the stranger hesitated, appeared uncertain what course to take, and finally halted. All eyes were turned now on Uncas, as if seeking directions how to proceed. Hawkeye, said the young chief in a low voice, he must never speak to the Hurons again. His time has come, said the laconic scout, thrusting the long barrel of his rifle through the leaves and taking his deliberate and fatal aim. But instead of pulling the trigger, he lowered the muzzle again and indulged himself in a fit of his peculiar mirth. I took the imp for a mingo, as I am a miserable sinner, he said. But when my eye ranged along his ribs for a place to get the bullet in, would you think it, Uncas? I saw the musicianer's blower, and so, after all, it is the man they call Gamut, whose death can profit no one, and whose life, if this tongue can do anything but sing, may be made serviceable to our own ends. If sounds have not lost their virtue, I'll soon have a discourse with the honest fellow and that in a voice he'll find more agreeable than the speech of Kildeer. So saying, Hawkeye laid aside his rifle, and, crawling through the bushes until within hearing of David, he attempted to repeat the musical effort which had conducted himself with so much safety and eclat through the Huron encampment. The exquisite organs of Gamut could not readily be deceived and, to say the truth, it would have been difficult for any other than Hawkeye to produce a similar noise, and, consequently, having once before heard the sounds, he now knew whence they proceeded. The poor fellow appeared relieved from a state of great embarrassment, for pursuing the direction of the voice, a task that to him was not much less arduous than it would have been to have gone up in the face of a battery, he soon discovered the hidden songster. I wonder what the Hurons will think of that, said the scout, laughing, as he took his companion by the arm and urged him toward the rear. If the knaves lie within earshot, they will say there are two non-composers instead of one. But here we are safe, he added, pointing to Uncas and his associates. Now give us the history of the Mingo inventions in natural English, and without any ups and downs of voice. David gazed about him at the fierce and wild-looking chiefs, in mute wonder. But assured by the presence of faces that he knew, he soon rallied his faculties so far as to make an intelligent reply. "'The heathen are abroad in goodly numbers,' said David, "'and I fear with evil intent. There has been much howling and ungodly revelry, together with such sounds as it is profanity to utter, in their habitations within the past hour.' so much so in truth that I have fled to the Delawares in search of peace. Your ears might not have profited much by the exchange had you been quicker of foot, returned the scout a little dryly. But let that be as it may. 
Where are the Hurons? They lie hid in the forest, between this spot and their village, in such force that prudence would teach you instantly to return. Uncas cast a glance along the range of trees which concealed his own band, and mentioned the name of Magua, is among them. He brought in the maiden that had sojourned with the Delawares, and, leaving her in the cave, has put himself like a raging wolf at the head of his savages. I know not what has troubled his spirit so greatly. He has left her, you say, in the cave, interrupted Hayward. Tis well that we know its situation. May not something be done for her instant relief? Uncas looked earnestly at the scout before he asked, What says Hawkeye? Give me twenty rifles, and I will turn to the right along the stream, and passing by the huts of the beaver will join the sagamore and the colonel. You shall then hear the whoop from that quarter. With this wind one may easily send it a mile. Then, Uncas, do you drive in the front. When they come within range of our pieces, we will give them a blow that, I pledge the good name of an old frontiersman, shall make their line bend like an ashen bow. After which... We will carry the village, and take the woman from the cave, when the affair may be finished with the tribe, according to a white man's battle, by a blow and a victory, or, in the Indian fashion, with dodge and cover. There may be no great learning, Major, in this plan, but with courage and patience it can all be done. I like it very much, cried Duncan, who saw that the release of Cora was the primary object in the mind of the scout. I like it much. Let it be instantly attempted. After a short conference, the plan was matured, and rendered more intelligible to the several parties. The different signals were appointed, and the chiefs separated, each to his allotted station. End of chapter 31「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. » The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 32 But plagues shall spread, and funeral fires increase, till the great king, without a ransom paid, to her own Chrissa send the black-eyed maid. Pope During the time Uncas was making this disposition of his forces, the woods were as still, and, with the exception of those who had met in council, apparently as much untenanted as when they came fresh from the hands of their almighty creator. The eye could range in every direction through the long and shadowed vistas of the trees, but nowhere was any object to be seen that did not properly belong to the peaceful and slumbering scenery. Here and there a bird was heard fluttering among the branches of the beeches, and occasionally a squirrel dropped a nut, drawing the startled looks of the party for a moment to the place but the instant the casual interruption ceased, the passing air was heard murmuring above their heads, along that verdant and undulating surface of forest, which spread itself unbroken, unless by stream or lake, over such a vast region of country. Across the tract of wilderness, which lay between the Delawares and the village of their enemies, it seemed as if the foot of man had never trodden, so breathing and deep was the silence in which it lay. But Hawkeye, whose duty led him foremost in the adventure, knew the character of those with whom he was about to contend too well to trust the treacherous quiet. When he saw his little band collected, the scout threw Kildeer into the hollow of his arm, and making a silent signal that he would be followed, he led them many rods toward the rear, into the bed of a little brook which they had crossed in advancing. Here he halted, and after waiting for the whole of his grave and attentive warriors to close about him, he spoke in Delaware, demanding, "'Do any of my young men know whither this run will lead us?' A Delaware stretched forth a hand, with the two fingers separated, and indicating the manner in which they were joined at the root, he answered, "'Before the sun could go his own length, the little water will be in the big.' Then he added, pointing in the direction of the place he mentioned, "'The two make enough for the beavers.' "'I thought as much,' returned the scout, glancing his eye upward at the opening in the treetops, "'from the course it takes, in the bearings of the mountains. "'Men, we will keep within the cover of its banks, till we scent the Hurons.' His companions gave the usual brief exclamation of assent, but, perceiving that their leader was about to lead the way in person, one or two made signs that all was not as it should be. Hawkeye, who comprehended their meaning glances, turned and perceived that his party had been followed thus far by the singing master. 
Do you know, friend, asked the scout gravely, and perhaps with a little of the pride of conscious deserving in his manner, that this is a band of rangers chosen for the most desperate service, and put under the command of one who, though another might say it with a better face, will not be apt to leave them idle. It may not be five, it cannot be thirty minutes, before we tread on the body of a Huron, living or dead. Though not admonished of your intentions in words, returned David, whose face was a little flushed, and whose ordinarily quiet and unmeaning eyes glimmered with an expression of unusual fire, your men have reminded me of the children of Jacob going out to battle against the Shechemites, for wickedly aspiring to wedlock with a woman of a race that was favoured of the Lord. Now I have journeyed far, and sojourned much in good and evil with the maiden ye seek, and, though not a man of war, with my loins girded and my sword sharpened, yet would I gladly strike a blow in her behalf. The scout hesitated, as if weighing the chances of such a strange enlistment in his mind before he answered. "'You know not the use of any weapon. You carry no rifle. And believe me, what the Mingos take they will freely give again.' "'Though not a vaunting and bloodily disposed Goliath,' returned David, drawing a sling from beneath his party-coloured and uncouth attire, "'I have not forgotten the example of the Jewish boy. But this ancient instrument of war have I practised much in my youth, and peradventure the skill has not entirely departed from me.' Ay, said Hawkeye, considering the deerskin thong and apron with a cold and discouraging eye, the thing might do its work among arrows or even knives, but these mengue have been furnished by the Frenchers with a good grooved barrel a man. However, it seems to be your gift to go unharmed amid fire, and as you have hitherto been favoured, Major, you have left your rifle at a cock. A single shot before the time would be just twenty scalps lost to no purpose. Singer, you can follow. We may find use for you in the shoutings. "'I thank you, friend,' returned David, supplying himself, like his royal namesake, from among the pebbles of the brook. "'Though not given to the desire to kill, had you sent me away, my spirit would have been troubled.' "'Remember,' added the scout, tapping his own head significantly on that spot where Gamut was yet sore, "'we come to fight, and not to musicate. Until the general whoop is given, nothing speaks but the rifle.' David nodded, as much to signify his acquiescence with the terms, and then Hawkeye, casting another observant glance over his followers, made the signal to proceed. Their route lay, for the distance of a mile, along the bed of the watercourse. Though protected from any great danger of observation by the precipitous banks, and the thick shrubbery which skirted the stream, no precaution known to an Indian attack was neglected. A warrior rather crawled than walked on each flank, so as to catch occasional glimpses into the forest, and every few minutes the band came to a halt, and listened for hostile sounds, with an acuteness of organs that would be scarcely conceivable to a man in a less natural state. Their march was, however, unmolested, and, as they, and they reached the point where the lesser stream was lost in the greater, without the smaller evidence that their progress had been noted. Here the scout again halted, to consult the signs of the forest. "'We are likely to have a good day for a fight,' he said, in English, addressing Hayward, and glancing his eyes upward at the clouds, which began to move in broad sheets across the firmament. A bright sun and a glittering barrel are no friends to true sight. Everything is favorable. They have the wind, which will bring down their noises and their smoke, too, no little matter in itself, whereas with us it will be first a shot, and then a clear view. But here is an end to our cover. The beavers have had the range of this stream for hundreds of years, and what between their food and their dams, there is, as you see, many a girdled stub, but few living trees. Hawkeye had, in truth, in these few words, given no bad description of the prospect that now lay in their front. The brook was irregular in its width, sometimes shooting through narrow fissures in the rocks, and at others spreading over acres of bottom land, forming little areas that might be termed ponds. Everywhere along its bands were the mouldering relics of dead trees, in all the stages of decay, from those that groaned on their tottering trunks to such as had recently been robbed of those rugged coats that so mysteriously contain their principle of life. A few long, low, and moss-covered piles were scattered among them, like the memorials of a former and long-departed generation. All these minute particulars were noted by the scout, with a gravity and interest that they probably had never before attracted. He knew that the Huron encampment lay a short half-mile up the brook, and, with the characteristic anxiety of one who dreaded a hidden danger, he was greatly troubled at not finding the smallest trace of the presence of his enemy. Once or twice he felt induced to give the order for a rush, and to attempt the village by surprise, but his experience quickly admonished him of the danger of so useless an experiment. Then he listened intently, and with painful uncertainty, for the sounds of hostility in the quarter where Uncas was left, but nothing was audible except the sighing of the wind that began to sweep over the bosom of the forest in gusts which threatened a tempest. At length, yielding rather to his unusual impatience than taking counsel from his knowledge, he determined to bring matters to an issue by unmasking his force and proceeding cautiously but steadily up the stream. 
The scout had stood, while making his observations, sheltered by a break, and his companion still lay in the bed of the ravine, through which the smaller stream debouched. But on hearing his low, though intelligible signal, the whole party stole up the bank, like so many dark specters, and silently arranged themselves around him. Pointing in the direction he wished to proceed, Hawkeye advanced, the band breaking off in single files, and following so accurately in his footsteps as to leave it, if we accept Hayward and David, the trail of but a single man. The party was, however, scarcely uncovered before a volley from a dozen rifles was heard in their rear, and a Delaware leaping high into the air like a wounded deer fell at his whole length, dead. "'Ah, I feared some deviltry like this!' exclaimed the scout in English, adding, with the quickness of thought in his adopted tongue, "'To cover men and charge!' The band dispersed at the word, and before Hayward had well recovered from his surprise, he found himself standing alone with David. Luckily the Hurons had already fallen back, and he was safe from their fire. But this state of things was evidently to be of short continuance, for the scout set the example of pressing on their retreat by discharging his rifle and darting from tree to tree as his enemy slowly yielded ground. It would seem that the assault had been made by a very small party of the Hurons, which, however, continued to increase in numbers as it retired on its friends, until the return fire was very nearly, if not quite, equal to that maintained by the advancing Delawares. Hayward threw himself among the combatants, and, imitating the necessary caution of his companions, he made quick discharges with his own rifle. The contest now grew warm and stationary. Few were injured, as both parties kept their bodies as much protected as possible by the trees, never indeed exposing any part of their persons except in the act of taking aim. But the chances were gradually growing unfavorable to Hawkeye and his band. The quick-sighted scout perceived his danger without knowing how to remedy it. He saw it was more dangerous to retreat than to maintain his ground, while he found his enemy throwing out men on his flank, which rendered the task of keeping themselves covered so very difficult to the Delawares as nearly to silence their fire. At this embarrassing moment, when they began to think the whole of the hostile tribe was gradually encircling them, they heard the yell of combatants and the rattling of arms echoing under the arches of the wood at the place where Uncas was posted, a bottom which, in a manner, lay beneath the ground on which Hawkeye and his party were contending. The effects of this attack were instantaneous, and to the scout and his friends greatly relieving. It would seem that, while his own surprise had been anticipated, and had consequently failed, the enemy, in their turn, having been deceived in its object and in his numbers, had left too small a force to resist the impetuous onset of the young Mohican. This fact was doubly apparent by the rapid manner in which the battle in the forest rolled upward toward the village, and by an instant falling off in the number of their assailants, who rushed to assist in maintaining the front, and, as it now proved to be, the principal point of defense. Animating his followers by his voice and his own example, Hawkeye then gave the word to bear down upon their foes. The charge, in that rude species of warfare, consisted merely in pushing from cover to cover nigher to the enemy, and in this maneuver he was instantly and successfully obeyed. The Hurons were compelled to withdraw, and the scene of the contest rapidly changed from the more open ground on which it had commenced to a spot where the assailed found a thicket to rest upon. Here the struggle was protracted, arduous and seemingly of doubtful issue, the Delawares, though none of them fell, beginning to bleed freely in consequence of the disadvantage at which they were held. In this crisis, Hawkeye found means to get behind the same tree as that which served for a cover to Hayward, most of his own combatants being within call, a little on his right, where they maintained rapid, though fruitless, discharges on their sheltered enemies. "'You are a young man, Major,' said the scout, dropping the butt of Kildeer to the earth, and leaning on his barrel, a little fatigued with his previous industry, and it may be your gift to lead armies at some future day again these imps, the Mingos. You may here see the philosophy of an Indian fight. It consists mainly in ready hand, a quick eye, and a good cover.' Now, if you had a company of the Royal Americans here, in what manner would you set them to work in this business? The bayonet would make a road. Aye, there is white reason in what you say, but a man must ask himself, in this wilderness, how many lives he can spare. No, horse, continued the scout, shaking his head like one who mused. Horse, I am ashamed to say, must sooner or later decide these scrimmages. The brutes are better than men, and to horse must we come at last. Put a shot and hoof on the moccasin of a redskin, and if his rifle be once emptied, he will never stop to load it again. Note. The American forest admits of the passage of horses, there being little underbrush and few tangled breaks. The plan of Hawkeye is the one which has always proved the most successful in the battles between the whites and the Indians. Wayne, in his celebrated campaign on the Miami, received the fire of his enemies in line, and then causing his dragoons to wheel round his flanks, the Indians were driven from their covers before they had time to load. One of the most conspicuous of the chiefs who fought in the Battle of Miami assured the writer that the red men could not fight the warriors with long knives and leather stockings, 
meaning the dragoons with their sabers and boots. This is a subject that might better be discussed at another time, returned Hayward. Shall we charge? I see no contradiction to the gifts of any man in passing his breathing spells and useful reflections, the scout replied. As to Rush, I little relish such a measure, for a scalp or two must be thrown away in the attempt. And yet, he added, bending his head aside to catch the sounds of the distant combat, if we are to be of use to Uncas, these knaves in our front must be got rid of. Then, turning with a prompt and decided air, he called aloud to his Indians in their own language. His words were answered by a shout, and, at a given signal, each warrior made a swift movement around his particular tree. The sight of so many dark bodies, glancing before their eyes at the same instant, drew a hasty and consequently an ineffectual fire from the Hurons. Without stopping to breathe, the Delawares leaped in long bounds toward the wood, like so many panthers springing upon their prey. Hawkeye was in front, brandishing his terrible rifle and animating his followers by his example. A few of the older and more cunning Hurons, who had not been deceived by the artifice which had been practiced to draw their fire, now made a close and deadly discharge of their pieces and justified the apprehensions of the scout by felling three of his foremost warriors. But the shock was insufficient to repel the impetus of the charge. The Delawares broke into the cover with the ferocity of their natures and swept away every trace of resistance by the fury of the onset. The combat endured only for an instant, hand to hand, and then the assailed yielded ground rapidly until they reached the opposite margin of the thicket, where they clung to the cover, with the sort of obstinacy that is so often witnessed in hunted brutes. At this critical moment, when the success of the struggle was again becoming doubtful, the crack of a rifle was heard behind the Hurons, and a bullet came whizzing from among some beaver lodges, which were situated in the clearing in their rear, and was followed by the fierce and appalling yell of a war whoop. "'There speaks the Sagamore!' shouted Hawkeye, answering the cry with his own stentorian voice. "'We have them now in face and back!' The effect on the Hurons was instantaneous. Discouraged by an assault from a quarter that left them no opportunity for cover, the warriors uttered a, a common yell of disappointment, and breaking off in a body, they spread themselves across the opening, heedless of every consideration but flight. Many fell in making the experiment under the bullets and the blows of the pursuing Delawares. We shall not pause to detail the meeting between the scout and Chingachgook, or the more touching interview that Duncan held with Monroe. A few brief and hurried words served to explain the state of things to both parties, and then Hawkeye, pointing out the Sagamore to his band, resigned the chief authority into the hands of the Mohican chief. Chingachgook assumed the station to which his birth and experience gave him so distinguished a claim, with the grave dignity that always gives force to the mandates of a native warrior. Following the footsteps of the scout, he led the party back through the thicket, his men scalping the fallen Hurons and secreting the bodies of their own dead as they proceeded, until they gained a point where the former was content to make a halt. The warriors, who had breathed themselves freely in the preceding struggle, were now posted on a bit of level ground, sprinkled with trees in sufficient numbers to conceal them. The land fell away rather precipitately in front, and beneath their eyes stretched for several miles a narrow, dark, and wooded vale. It was through this dense and dark forest that Uncas was still contending with the main body of the Hurons. The Wohican and his friends advanced to the brow of the hill, and listened with practiced ears to the sounds of the combat. A few birds hovered over the leafy bosom of the valley, frightened from their secluded nests, and here and there a light vapory cloud, which seemed already blending with the atmosphere, arose above the trees, and indicated some spot where the struggle had been fierce and stationary. "'The fight is coming up the ascent,' said Duncan, pointing in the direction of a new explosion of firearms. "'We are too much in the center of their line to be effective.' "'They will incline into the hollow, where the cover is thicker,' said the scout. "'That will leave us well on their flank. "'Go, Sagamore. You will hardly be in time to give the whoop and lead on the young men. "'I will fight this scrimmage with warriors of my own color. "'You know me, Mohican. Not a Huron of them all shall cross the swell into your rear without the notice of Kildare.' The Indian chief paused another moment to consider the signs of the contest, which was now rolling rapidly up the ascent, a certain evidence that the Delawares triumphed. Nor did he actually quit the place until admonished of the proximity of his friends, as well as enemies, by the bullets of the former, which began to patter among the dried leaves on the ground, like the bits of falling hail which precede the bursting of the tempest. Hawkeye and his three companions withdrew a few paces to a shelter, and awaited the issue with calmness that nothing but great practice could impart in such a scene. It was not long before the reports of the rifles began to lose the echoes of the woods, and to sound like weapons discharged in the open air. Then a warrior appeared, here and there, driven to the skirts of the forest, and rallying as he entered the clearing, as at the place where the final stand was to be made. These were soon joined by others, until a long line of swarthy figures was to be seen clinging to the cover with the obstinacy of desperation. 
Hayward began to grow impatient, and turned his eyes anxiously in the direction of Chingachgook. The chief was seated on a rock, with nothing visible but his calm visage, considering the spectacle with an eye as deliberate as if he were posted there merely to view the struggle. "'The time has come for the Delaware to strike,' said Duncan. "'Not so, not so,' returned the scout. "'When he sends his friends, he will let them know that he is here. "'See, see, the knaves are getting in that clump of pines, like bees settling after their flight. "'By the Lord, a squaw might pull, put a bullet into the centre of such a knot of dark skins.' At that instant the whoop was given, and a dozen Hurons fell by a discharge from Chingachgook and his band. The shout that followed was answered by a single war cry from the forest, and a yell passed through the air that sounded as if a thousand throats were united in a common effort. The Hurons staggered, deserting the center of their line, and Uncas issued from the forest through the opening they left at the head of a hundred warriors. Waving his hands right and left, the young chief pointed out the enemy to his followers, who separated in pursuit. The war now divided, both wings of the broken Hurons seeking protection in the woods again, hotly pressed by the victorious warriors of the Lenape. A minute might have passed, but the sounds were already receding in different directions, and gradually losing their distinctness beneath the echoing arches of the woods. One little knot of Hurons, however, had disdained to seek a cover, and were retiring, like lions at bay, slowly and sullenly up the acclivity which Chingachgook and his band had just deserted to mingle more closely in the fray. Magua was conspicuous in this party, both by his fierce and savage mien, and by the air of haughty authority he yet maintained. In his eagerness to expedite the pursuit, Uncas had left himself nearly alone, but the moment his eye caught the figure of Le Subtil, every other consideration was forgotten. Raising his cry of battle, which recalled some six or seven warriors, and reckless of the disparity of their numbers, he rushed upon his enemy. Le Renard, who watched the movement, paused to receive him with secret joy, but at the moment when he thought the rashness of his impetuous young assailant had left him at his mercy, another shout was given, and La Longue Carabine was seen rushing to the rescue, attended by all his white associates. The Huron instantly turned, and commenced a rapid retreat up the ascent. There was no time for greetings or congratulations, for Uncas, though unconscious of the presence of his friends, continued the pursuit with the velocity of the wind. In vain Hawkeye called to him to respect the covers, the young Mohican braved the dangerous fire of his enemies, and soon compelled them to a flight as swift as his own headlong speed. It was fortunate that the race was of short continuance, and that the white men were much favored by their position, or the Delaware would soon have outstripped all his companions, and fallen a victim to his own temerity. But, ere such a calamity could happen, the pursuers and pursued entered the Wyandotte village, within striking distance of each other. Excited by the presence of their dwellings, and tired of the chase, the Hurons now made a stand, and fought around their council lodge with the fury of despair. The onset and the issue were like the passage and destruction of a whirlwind. The tomahawk of Uncas, the blows of Hawkeye, and even the still nervous arm of Monroe were all busy for that passing moment, and the ground was quickly strewed with their enemies. Still Magua, though daring and much exposed, escaped from every effort against his life, with that sort of fabled protection that was made to overlook the fortunes of favored heroes in the legends of ancient poetry. Raising a yell that spoke volumes of anger and disappointment, the subtle chief, when he saw his comrades fallen, darted away from the place, attended by his two only surviving friends, leaving the Delawares engaged in stripping the dead of the bloody trophies of their victory. But Uncas, who had vainly sought him in the melee, bounded forward in pursuit, Hawkeye, Hayward, and David still pressing on his footsteps. The utmost that the scout could effect was to keep the muzzle of his rifle a little in advance of his friend, to whom, however, it answered every purpose of a charmed shield. Once Magua appeared disposed to make another and a final effort to revenge his losses, but, abandoning his intention as soon as demonstrated, he leaped into a thicket of bushes, through which he was followed by his enemies, and suddenly entered the mouth of the cave already known to the reader. Hawkeye, who had only forborne to fire in tenderness to Uncas, raised a shout of success, and proclaimed aloud that now they were certain of their game. The pursuers dashed into the long and narrow entrance, in time to catch a glimpse of the retreating forms of the Hurons. Their passage through the natural galleries and subterraneous apartments of the cavern was preceded by the shrieks and cries of hundreds of women and children. The place, seen by its dim and uncertain light, appeared like the shades of the infernal regions, across which unhappy ghosts and savage demons were flitting in multitudes. Still Uncas kept his eye on Magua, as if life to him possessed but a single object. Hayward and the scout still pressed on his rear, actuated, though possibly in a less degree, by a common feeling but their way was becoming intricate in those dark and gloomy passages, and the glimpses of the retiring warriors less distinct and frequent, and for a moment the trace was believed to be lost, 
when a white robe was seen fluttering in the further extremity of a passage that seemed to lead up the mountain. "'Tis Cora!" exclaimed Hayward, in a voice in which horror and delight were wildly mingled. "'Cora! Cora!' echoed Uncas, bounding forward like a deer. "'Tis the maiden!' shouted the scout. "'Courage, lady! We come! We come!' The chase was renewed with a diligence rendered tenfold encouraging by this glimpse of the captive, but the way was rugged, broken, and in spots nearly impassable. Uncas abandoned his rifle and leaped forward with headlong precipitation. Hayward rashly imitated his example, though both were, a moment afterward, admonished of his madness by hearing the bellowing of a piece that the Hurons found time to discharge down the passage in the rocks, the bullet from which even gave the young Mohican a slight wound. "'We must close,' said the scout, passing his friends by a desperate leap. "'The knaves will pick us all off at this distance, and see they hold the maiden so as to shield themselves.' Though his words were unheeded, or rather unheard, his example was followed by his companions, who, by incredible exertions, got near enough to the fugitives to perceive that Cora was borne along between the two warriors, while Magua prescribed the direction and manner of their flight. At this moment the forms of all four were strongly drawn against an opening in the sky, and they disappeared.' Nearly frantic with disappointment, Uncas and Hayward increased efforts that already seemed superhuman, and they issued from the cavern on the side of the mountain, in time to note the route of the pursued. The course lay up the ascent, and still continued hazardous and laborious. Encumbered by his rifle, and perhaps not sustained by so deep an interest in the captive as his companions, the scout suffered the latter to precede him a little, Uncas in his turn taking the lead of Hayward. In this manner, rocks, precipices, and difficulties were surmounted in an incredibly short space that at another time, and under other circumstances, would have been deemed almost insuperable. But the impetuous young men were rewarded by finding that, encumbered with Cora, the Hurons were losing ground in the race. "'Stay, dog of the Wyandots!' exclaimed Uncas, shaking his bright tomahawk at Magua. "'A Delaware girl calls stay!' "'I will go no further!' cried Cora, stopping unexpectedly on a ledge of rock that overhung a deep precipice at no great distance from the summit of the mountain. Kill me if thou wilt, detestable Huron. I will go no further. The supporters of the maiden raised their ready tomahawks with the impious joy that fiends are thought to take in mischief, but Magua stayed the uplifted arms. The Huron chief, after casting the weapons he had wrested from his companions over the rock, drew his knife and turned to his captive, with a look in which conflicting passions fiercely contended. Woman, he said, choose the wigwam or the knife of Le Subtil. Cora regarded him not, but dropping on her knees, she raised her eyes and stretched her arms toward heaven, saying in a meek and yet confiding voice, I am thine, do with me as thou seest best. Woman, repeated Magua, hoarsely, and endeavoring in vain to catch a glance from her serene and beaming eye, choose. But Cora neither heard nor heeded his demand. The form of the Huron trembled in every fibre, and he raised his arm on high, but dropped it again with a bewildered air, like one who doubted. Once more he struggled with himself, and lifted the keen weapon again, but just then a piercing cry was heard above them, and Uncas appeared, leaping frantically from a fearful height upon the ledge. Magua recoiled a step, and one of his assistants, profiting by the chance, sheathed his own knife in the bosom of Cora. The Huron sprang like a tiger on his offending and already retreating countrymen, but the falling form of Uncas separated the unnatural combatants. Diverted from his object by this interruption, and maddened by the murder he had just witnessed, Magua buried his weapon in the back of the prostrate Delaware, uttering an unearthly shout as he committed the dastardly deed. But Uncas arose from the blow, as the wounded panther turns upon his foe, and struck the murderer of Cora to his feet, by an effort in which the last of his failing strength was expended. Then, with a stern and steady look, he turned to Le Subtil, and indicated by the expression of his eye all that he would do had not the power deserted him. The latter seized the nerveless arm of the unresisting Delaware, and passed his knife into his bosom three several times, before his victim, still keeping his gaze riveted on his enemy, with a look of inextinguishable scorn, fell dead at his feet. "'Mercy! Mercy! Huron!' cried Hayward from above, in tones nearly choked by horror. "'Give mercy, and thou shalt receive from it!' Whirling the bloody knife up at the imploring youth, the victorious Magua uttered a cry so fierce, so wild, and yet so joyous, that it conveyed the sounds of savage triumph to the ears of those who fought in the valley a thousand feet below. He was answered by a burst from the lips of the scout, whose tall person was just then seen moving swiftly toward him along those dangerous crags, with steps as bold and reckless as if he possessed the power to move in air. 
but when the hunter reached the scene of the ruthless massacre, the ledge was tenanted only by the dead. His keen eye took a single look at the victims, and then shot its glances over the difficulties of the ascent in his front. A form stood at the brow of the mountain, on the very edge of the giddy height, with uplifted arms, in an awful attitude of menace. Without stopping to consider his person, the rifle of Hawkeye was raised, but a rock, which fell on the head of one of the fugitives below, exposed the indignant and glowing countenance of the honest Gamut. Then Magua issued from a crevice, and, stepping with calm indifference over the body of the last of his associates, he leaped a wide fissure and ascended the rocks at a point where the arm of David could not reach him. A single bound would carry him to the brow of the precipice and assure his safety. Before taking the leap, however, the Huron paused, and shaking his hand at the scout, he shouted, The pale faces are dogs! The Delaware's women! Magua leaves them on the rocks for the crows! Laughing hoarsely, he made a desperate leap and fell short of his mark, though his hands grabbed, sh grabbed a shrub on the verge of the height. The form of Hawkeye had crouched like a beast about to take its spring, and his frame trembled so violently with eagerness that the muzzle of the half-raised rifle played like a leaf fluttering in the wind. Without exhausting himself with fruitless efforts, the cunning Magua suffered his body to drop to the length of his arms and found a fragment for his feet to rest on. Then, summoning all his powers, he renewed the attempt, and so far succeeded as to draw his knees on the edge of the mountain. It was now, when the body of his enemy was most collected together, that the agitated weapon of the scout was drawn to his shoulder. The surrounding rocks themselves were not steadier than the piece became, for the single instant that it poured out its contents. The arms of the Huron relaxed, and his body fell back a little, while his knees still kept their position. Turning a relentless look on his enemy, he shook a hand in grim defiance. But his hold loosened, and his dark person was seen cutting the air with its head downward for a fleeting instant until it glided past the fringe of shrubbery which clung to the mountain in its rapid flight to destruction. End of chapter 32 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric Wisdall, Gainesville, Florida. The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper, Chapter 33. They fought, like brave men, long and well. They piled that ground with Muslim slain. They conquered, but Bazaris fell, bleeding at every vein. His few surviving comrades saw his smile when rang their loud hurrah, and the red field was won. Then saw in death his eyelids close, calmly, as to a night's repose, like flowers at set of sun. Halleck The sun found the Lenape on the succeeding day a nation of mourners. The sounds of the battle were over, and they had fed fat their ancient grudge, and had avenged their recent quarrel with the Mengue by the destruction of a whole community. The black and murky atmosphere that floated around the spot where the Hurons had encamped sufficiently announced of itself the fate of that wandering tribe, while hundreds of ravens that struggled above the summits of the mountains or swept in noisy flocks across the wide ranges of the woods furnished a frightful direction to the scene of the combat. In short, any eye at all practiced in the signs of frontier warfare might easily have traced all those unerring evidences of the ruthless results which attend an Indian vengeance. Still, the sun rose on the Lenape nation of mourners. No shouts of success, no songs of triumph were heard in rejoicings for their victory. The latest straggler had returned from his fell employment only to strip himself of the terrific embalms of his bloody calling, and to join in the lamentations of his countrymen as a stricken people. Pride and exultation were supplanted by humility, and the fiercest of human passions was already succeeded by the most profound and unequivocal demonstrations of grief. The lodges were deserted, but a broad belt of earnest faces encircled a spot in their vicinity, whither everything possessing life had repaired, and where all were now collected in deep and awful silence. Though beings of every rank and age, of both sexes, and of all pursuits, had united to form this breathing wall of bodies, they were influenced by a single emotion. Each eye was riveted on the center of that ring, which contained the objects of so much, 
and of so common an interest. Six Delaware girls, with their long, dark, flowing tresses falling loosely across their bosoms, stood apart, and only gave proof of their existence as they occasionally strewed sweet-scented herbs and forest flowers on a litter of fragrant plants that, under a pall of Indian robes, supported all that now remained of the ardent, high-souled, and generous Cora. Her form was concealed in many wrappers of the same simple manufacture, and her face was shut forever from the gaze of men. At her feet was seated the desolate Monroe. His aged head was bowed nearly to the earth, in compelled submission to the stroke of providence. But a hidden anguish struggled about his furrowed brow that was only partially concealed by the careless locks of gray that had fallen, neglected, on his temples. Gamut stood at his side, his meek head barred to the rays of the sun, while his eyes wandering and concerned, seemed to be equally divided between that little volume which contained so many quaint but holy maxims, and the being in whose behalf his soul yearned to administer consolation. Hayward was also nigh supporting himself against a tree, and endeavoring to keep down those sudden risings of sorrow that it required his utmost manhood to subdue. But sad and melancholy as this group may easily be imagined, it was far less touching than another, that occupied the opposite space of the same area. Seated, as in life, with his form and limbs raged in grave and decent composure, Yunkus appeared, arrayed in the most gorgeous ornaments that the wealth of the tribe could furnish. Rich plumes nodded above his head, wampum, gorgets, bracelets, and medals adorned his person in profusion, though his dull eyes and vacant lineaments too strongly contradicted the idle tale of pride they would convey. Directly in front of the court, Chingachgook was placed, without arms, paint, or adornment of any sort except the bright blue blazonry of his race that was indelibly impressed on his naked bosom. During the long period that the tribe had thus been collected, the Mohican warrior had kept a steady, anxious look on the cold and senseless countenance of his son. So riveted and intense had been that gaze, and so changeless his attitude, that a stranger might not have told the living from the dead but for the occasional gleamings of a troubled spirit that shot athwart the dark visage of one, and the death-like calm that had forever settled on the lineaments of the other. The scout was hard by, leaning in a pensive posture on his own fatal and avenging weapon, while Tamanund, supported by the elders of his nation, occupied a high place at hand, whence he might look down on the mute and sorrowful assemblage of his people. Just within the inner edge of the circle stood a soldier, in the military attire of a strange nation, and without it his war-horse, in the center of a collection of mounted domestics, seemingly in readiness to undertake some distant journey. The vestments of the stranger announced him to be one who held a responsible situation near the person of the captain of the Canadas, and who, as it would now seem, finding his errand of peace frustrated by the fierce impetuosity of his allies was content to become silent and sad spectator of the fruits of a contest that he had arrived too late to anticipate. The day was drawing to the close of its first quarter, and yet had the multitude maintained its breathing stillness since its dawn. No sound louder than a stifled sob had been heard among them, nor had even a limb been moved throughout that long and painful period, except to perform the simple and touching offerings that were made from time to time, in commemoration of the dead. The patience and forbearance of Indian fortitude could alone support such an appearance of abstraction as seemed now to have turned each dark and motionless figure into stone. At length, the sage of the Delawares stretched forth an arm, and leaning on the shoulders of his attendants, he arose with an air as feeble as if another age had already intervened between the man who had met his nation the preceding day and him who now tottered on his elevated stand. "'Men of the Lenape,' he said, in low, hollow tones that sounded like a voice charged with some prophetic mission, "'the face of the Manitou is behind a cloud. His eyes turn from you, his ears are shut, his tongue gives no answer. You see him not, yet his judgments are before you. Let your hearts be open and your spirits tell no lie.' Men of the Lenape, 
the face of the Manitou is behind a cloud. As the simple and yet terrible annunciation stole on the ears of the multitude, a stillness as deep and awful succeeded as if the venerated spirit they worship had uttered the words without the aid of human organs, and even the inanimate Yunkas appeared a being of life compared with the humbled and submissive throng by whom he was surrounded. As the immediate effect, however, gradually passed away, a low murmur of voices commenced a sort of chant in honor of the dead. The sounds were those of females, and were thrillingly soft and wailing. The words were connected by no regular continuation, but as one ceased another took up the eulogy or lamentation, whichever it might be called, and gave vent to her emotions in such language as was suggested by her feelings and the occasion. At intervals the speaker was interrupted by general and loud bursts of sorrow, during which the girls around the byre of Cora plucked the plants and flowers blindly from her body, as if bewildered with grief. But, in the milder moments of their plaint, these emblems of purity and sweetness were cast back to their places, with every sign of tenderness and regret. Though rendered less connected by many and general interruptions and outbreakings, a translation of their language would have contained a regular decant which, in substance, might have proved to possess a train of consecutive ideas. A girl, selected for the task by her rank and qualifications, commenced by modest allusions to the qualities of the deceased warrior, embellishing her expressions with those oriental images that the Indians have probably brought with them from the extremes of the other continent, and which form of themselves linked to connect the ancient histories of the two worlds. She called him the panther of his tribe, and described him as one whose moccasin left no trail on the dews, whose bound was like the leap of a young fawn, whose eyes were brighter than a star in the dark night, and whose voice, in battle, was loud as the thunder of the Manitou. She reminded him of the mother who bore him, and dwelt forcibly on the happiness she must feel in passing such a son. She bade him tell her, when they met in the world of spirits, that the Delaware girls had shed tears above the grave of her child, and had called her blessed. Then they who succeeded, changing their tones to a milder and still more tender strain, alluded with the delicacy and sensitiveness of women to the stranger maiden, who had left the upper earth at a time so near his own departure as to render the will of the great spirit to manifest to be disregarded. They admonished him to be kind to her, and to have consideration for her ignorance of those arts which were so necessary to the comfort of a warrior like himself. They dwelled upon her matchless beauty, and on her noble resolution without the taint of envy, and as angels may be thought to delight in a superior excellence, adding that these endowments should prove more than equivalent for any little imperfection in her education. After which, others again, in due succession, spoke to the maiden herself in the low, soft language of tenderness and love. They exhorted her to be of cheerful mind, and to fear nothing for her future welfare. A hunter would be her companion, who knew how to provide for her smallest wants, and a warrior was at her side who was able to protect her against every danger. They promised that her path should be pleasant and her burden light. They cautioned her against unavailing regrets for the friends of her youth and the scenes where her father had dwelt, assuring her that the blessed hunting grounds of the lake contained vales as pleasant, streams as pure, and flowers as sweet as the heaven of the pale faces. They advised her to be attentive to the wants of her companion, and never to forget the distinction which the Manitou had so wisely established between them. Then, in a wild burst of their chant, they sang with united voices the temper of the Mohican's mind. They pronounced him noble, manly, and generous. All that became a warrior, and all that a maiden might love, Clothing their ideas in the most remote and subtle images, they betrayed that, in the short period of their intercourse, they had discovered with the intuitive perception of their sex the truant disposition of his inclinations. The Delaware girls had found no favor in his eyes. He was of a race that had once been lords of the shores of the Salt Lake, and his wishes had led him back to a people who dwelt above the graves of his fathers. 
why should not such a predilection be encouraged? That she was of a blood purer and richer than the rest of her nation, any eye might have seen. That she was equal to the dangers and daring of a life in the woods, her conduct had proved. And now, they added, the wise one of the earth had transplanted her to a place where she would find congenial spirits and might be forever happy. Then, with another transition in voice and subject, allusions were made to the virgin who wept in the adjacent lodge. They compared her to the flakes of snow, as pure, as white, as brilliant, and as liable to melt in the fierce heats of summer, or congenial in the frosts of winter. They doubted not that she was lovely in the eyes of the young chief, whose skin and whose sorrow seemed so like her own, but though far from expressing such preference, it was evident they deemed her less excellent than the maid they mourned. Still they denied her no need her rare charms might properly claim. Her ringlets were compared to the exuberant tendrils of the vine, her eye to the blue vault of heavens, and the most spotless cloud, with its glowing flush of the sun, was admitted to be less attractive than her bloom. During these and similar songs nothing was audible but the murmurs of the music, relieved, as it was, or rather rendered terrible by those occasional bursts of grief which might be called its choruses. The Delawares themselves listened like charmed men, and it was very apparent, by the variations of their speaking countenances, how deep and true was their sympathy. Even David was not reluctant to lend his ear to the tones of voices so sweet, and long ere the chant was ended, his gaze announced that his soul was enthralled. The scout, to whom alone of all the white men the words were intelligible, suffered himself to be a little aroused from his meditative posture, and bent his face aside to catch their meaning as the girls proceeded. But when they spoke of the future prospects of Cora and Munkus, he shook his head like one who knew the error of their simple creed, and resuming his reclining attitude, he maintained it until the ceremony, if that might be called a ceremony, in which his feeling was so deeply imbued, was finished. Happily for the self-command of both Hayward and Monroe, they knew not the meaning of the wild sounds they heard. Chingachgook was a solitary exception to the interest manifested by the native part of the audience. His look never changed throughout the whole of the scene, nor did a muscle move in his rigid countenance, even at the wildest or the most pathetic parts of the lamentation. The cold and senseless remains of his son was all to him, and every other sense but that of sight seemed frozen, in order that his eyes might take their final gaze at those lineaments he had so long loved, and which were now about to be closed forever from his view. In this stage of the obsequies, a warrior much renowned for deed in arms, and more especially for services in the recent combat, a man of stern and grave demeanor, advanced slowly from the crowd, and placed himself nigh the person of the dead. "'Why hast thou left us, pride of the Wapanachki? he said, addressing himself to the dull ears of Yunkus, as if the empty clay retained the faculties of the animated man. Thy time has been like that of the sun when in the trees, thy glory brighter than his light at noonday. Thou art gone, youthful warrior, but a hundred Wyandots are clearing the briars from thy path to the world of spirits. Who that saw thee in battle would believe that thou couldst die? Who before thee has ever shown Utawa the way into the fight? Thy feet were like the wings of eagles, thine arm heavier than falling branches from the pine, and thy voice like the Manitou when he speaks in the clouds. The tongue of Utawa is weak, he added, looking about him with a melancholy gaze, and his heart exceeding heavy. Pride of the Wapanachki, why hast thou left us? He was succeeded by others, in due order, until most of the high and gifted men of the nation had sung or spoken their tribute of praise over the manes of the deceased chief. When each had ended, another deep and breathing silence reigned in all the place. Then a low, deep sound was heard, like the suppressed accompaniments of distant music rising just high enough on the air to be audible, and yet so indistinctly as to leave its character and the place whence it proceeded alike matters of conjecture. It was, however, succeeded by another, and another strain, each in a higher key, until they grew on the ear, first in long-drawn and often repeated interjection, 
and finally in words. The lips of Chingachgook had so far parted as to announce that it was the monody of the father. Though not an eye was turned toward him, nor the smallest sign of impatience exhibited, it was apparent by the manner in which the multitude elevated their heads to listen, that they drank in the sounds with an intenseness of attention that none but Temenund himself had ever before commanded. But they listened in vain. The strains rose just so loud as to become intelligible, and then grew fainter and more trembling until they finally sank on the air, as if borne away by a passing breath of wind. The lips of the sagamore closed, and he remained silent in his seat, looking with his riveted eye and motionless form, like some creature that had been turned from the almighty hand with the form but without the spirit of a man. The Delawares, who knew by these symptoms that the mind of their friend was not prepared for so mighty an effort of fortitude, relaxed in their attention, and, with an innate delicacy, seemed to bestow all their thoughts on the obsequies of the stranger maiden. A signal was given by one of the elder chiefs to the women who crowded that part of the circle near which the body of Cora lay. Obedient to the sign, the girls raised the bier to the elevation of their heads and advanced with slow and regulated steps, chanting, as they proceeded, another wailing song in praise of the deceased. Gamut, who had been a close observer of rites he deemed so heathenish, now bent his head over the shoulder of the unconscious father, whispering, "'They move with the remains of thy child. Shall we not follow, and see them interned, with Christian burial? Monroe started, as if the last trumpet had sounded in his ear, and bestowing one anxious and hurried glance round him, he arose and followed in the simple train, with the mien of a soldier, but bearing the full burden of apparent suffering. His friends pressed around him with a sorrow that was too strong to be termed sympathy, even the young Frenchman joining in the procession with the air of a man who was sensibly touched at the early and melancholy fate of one so lovely. But when the last and humblest female of the tribe had joined in the wild and yet ordered array, the men of the Lenape contracted their circle, and formed again around the person of Uncas, as silent, as grave, and as motionless as before. The place which had been chosen for the grave of Coral was a little knoll, where a cluster of young and healthful pines had taken root, forming of themselves a melancholy and appropriate shade over the spot. On reaching it, the girls deposited their burden, and continued for many minutes waiting, with characteristic patience and native timidity, for some evidence that they whose feelings were most concerned were content with the arrangement. At length the scout, who alone understood their habits, said in their own language, "'My daughters have done well. The white men thank them.' Satisfied with this testimony in their favor, the girls proceeded to deposit the body in a shell, ingeniously and not inelegantly fabricated of the bark of the birch, after which they lowered it into its dark and final abode. The ceremony of covering the remains and concealing the marks of the fresh earth by leaves and other natural and customary objects was conducted with the same simple and silent forms but when the labors of the kind beings who had performed these sad and friendly offices were so far completed, they hesitated, in a way to show that they knew not how much further they might proceed. It was in this stage of the rites that the scout again addressed them. "'My young women have done enough,' he said. "'The spirit of the pale-face has no need of food of raiment, their gifts being accorded to the heaven of their color. I see.' he added, glancing an eye at David, who was preparing his book in a manner that indicated an intention to lead the way in a sacred song. That one who better knows the Christian fashions is about to speak. The female stood modestly aside, and, from having been the principal actors in the scene, they now became the meek and attentive observers of that which followed. During the time David occupied in pouring out the pious feelings of his spirit in this manner, not a sign of surprise nor a look of impatience escaped them. They listened like those who knew the meaning of the strange words, and appeared as if they felt the mingled emotions of sorrow, hope, and resignation they were intended to convey. Excited by the scene he had just witnessed, and perhaps influenced by his own secret emotions, 
the master of song exceeded his usual efforts. His full, rich voice was not found to suffer by comparison with the soft tones of the girls, and his more modulated strains possessed, at least for the ears of those to whom they were peculiarly addressed, the additional powers of intelligence. He ended the anthem as he had commenced it, in the midst of a grave and solemn stillness. When, however, the closing cadence had fallen on the ears of his auditors, the secret, timorous glances of the eyes and the general yet subdued movement of the assemblage betrayed that something was expected from the father of the deceased. Monroe seemed sensible that the time was come for him to exert what is, perhaps, the gravest effort of which human nature is capable. He bared his gray locks, and looked around the timid and quiet throng by which he was encircled with a firm and collected countenance. Then, motioning with his hand for the scout to listen, he said, uh, Say to these kind and gentle females that a heart-broken and failing man returns them his thanks. Tell them that the being we all worship, under different names, will be mindful of their charity and that the time shall not be distant when we may assemble around his throne without distinction of sex, or rank, or color. The scout listened to the tremulous voice in which the veteran delivered these words, and shook his head slowly when they were ended, as one who doubted their efficacy. To tell them this, he said, would be to tell them that the snows come not in winter, or that the sun shines fiercest when the trees are stripped of their leaves. Then, turning to the women, he made such a communication of the other's gratitude as he deemed most suited to the capacities of his listeners. The head of Monroe had already sunk upon his chest, and he was again fast relapsing into melancholy, when the young Frenchman before named ventured to touch him lightly on the elbow. As soon as he had gained the attention of the mourning old man, he pointed towards a group of young Indians who approached with a light but closely covered litter, and then pointed upward towards the sun. "'I understand you, sir,' returned Monroe, with a voice of forced firmness. "'I understand you. It is the will of heaven, and I submit. Cora, my child! If the prayers of a heart-broken father could avail thee now, how blessed shouldst thou be!' Come, gentlemen, he added, looking about him with an air of lofty composure, though the anguish that quivered in his faded countenance was far too powerful to be concealed. Our duty here is ended. Let us depart. Hayward gladly obeyed a summons that took them from a spot where, each instant, he felt his self-control was about to desert him. While his companions were mounting, however, he found time to press the hand of the scout, and to repeat the terms of an engagement they had made to meet again within the posts of the British army. Then, gladly throwing himself into the saddle, he spurred his charger to the side of the litter, whence low and stifled sobs alone announced the presence of Alice. In this manner, the head of Monroe again drooping on his bosom, with Hayward and David following in sorrowing silence, and attended by the aid of Montcalm with his guard, all the white men, with the exception of Hawkeye, passed from before the eyes of the Delawares, and were buried in the vast forests of that region. But the tie which, through common calamity, had united the feelings of these simple dwellers in the woods with the strangers who had thus transiently visited them, was not so easily broken. Years passed away before the traditionary tale of the white maiden, and of the young warrior of the Mohicans ceased to beguile the long nights and tedious marches, or to animate their youthful and brave with a desire for vengeance. Neither were the secondary actors in these momentous incidents forgotten. Through the medium of the scout, who served for years afterward as a link between them and civilized life, they learned in answers to their inquiries that the gray head was speedily gathered to his father's, borne down, as was erroneously believed by his military misfortunes, and that the open hand had conveyed his surviving daughter far into the settlements of the Pale Faces, where her tears had at least ceased to flow, and had been succeeded by the bright smiles 
which were better suited to her joyous nature. But these were events of a time later than that which concerns our tale. Deserted by all of his color, Hawkeye returned to the spot where his sympathies led him, with a force that no ideal bond of union could destroy. He was just in time to catch a parting look of the features of Uncas, whom the Delawares were already enclosing in his last vestment of skins. They paused to permit the longing and lingering gaze of the sturdy woodsman, and when it was ended, the body was enveloped, never to be unclosed again. Then came a procession like the other, and the whole nation was collected about the temporary grave of the chief. Temporary, because it was proper that, at some future day, his bones should rest among those of his own people. The movement, like the feeling, had been simultaneous in general. The same grave expression of grief, the same rigid silence, and the same deference to the principal mourner were observed around the place of interment as have been already described. The body was deposited in an attitude of repose, facing the rising sun with the implements of war and of the chase at hand, in readiness for the final journey. An opening was left in the shell by which it was protected from the soil for the spirit to communicate with its earthly tenement, when necessary, and the hole was concealed from the instinct and protected by the ravages of the beast of prey with an ingenuity peculiar to the natives. The manual rites then ceased, and all present reverted to the more spiritual part of the ceremonies. Chingachgook became once more the object of the common attention. He had not yet spoken, and something solitary and instructive was expected from so renowned a chief on an occasion of such interest. Conscious of the wishes of the people, the stern and self-restrained warrior raised his face, which had latterly been buried in his robe, and looked about him with a steady eye. His firmly compressed and expressive lifts then severed, and for the first time during the long ceremonies his voice was distinctly audible. "'Why do my brothers mourn?' he said, regarding the dark race of dejected warriors by whom he was environed. "'Why do my daughters weep? "'That a young man has gone to the happy hunting grounds? Uh, "'That a chief has filled his time with honor? "'He was good. He was dutiful. He was brave. "'Who can deny it? "'The Manitou had need of such a warrior.' and he has called him away. As for me, the son and the father of Uncas, I am a blazed pine and a clearing of the pale faces. My race has gone from the shores of the salt lake and the hills of the Delawares, but who can say that the serpent of his tribe has forgotten his wisdom? I am alone. No, no, cried Hawkeye, who had been gazing with a yearning look at the rigid features of his friend with something like his own self-command, but whose philosophy could endure no longer. No, Sagamore, not alone. The gifts of our colors may be different, but God has so placed us as to journey in the same path. I have no kin, and I may also say, like you, no people. He was your son, and a redskin by nature, and it may be that your blood was near, but, if I ever I forget the lad who has so often fought at my side in war, and slept at my side in peace, may he who made us all, whatever may be our color or our gifts, forget me. The boy has left us for a time, but, Sagamore, you are not alone. Chingachgook grasped the hand that, in the warmth of feeling the scout had stretched across the fresh earth, and in an attitude of friendship these two sturdy and intrepid woodsmen bowed their heads together, while scalding tears fell to their feet, watering the grave of Uncas like drops of falling rain. In the midst of the awful stillness with which such a burst of feeling, coming as it did from the two most renowned warriors of that region, was received, Temenon lifted his voice to disperse the multitude. It is enough, he said. Go, children of the Lenape. The anger of the Manitou is not done. Why should Tamanun stay? The pale faces are masters of the earth, and the time of the red men has not yet come again. My day has been too long. In the morning I saw the sons of Unimus happy and strong, 
and yet, before the night has come, have I lived to see the last warrior of the wise race of the Mohicans. End of The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper